Hello, and welcome to the BISC CPA Review Course and our coverage of the Auditing and Attestation section of the CPA exam. My name is Bob Manette, and I'll be your instructor for these classes. And in this class, we're going to be talking about a very heavily tested part of the auditing exam, and that is reporting issues. Before we get into reporting issues, I just want to say a word about the auditing course and the auditing exam itself. I think you know that the auditing exam itself is a four-hour monster. It's a tough exam. And I think that we should start with what I think is the hardest part of the exam. Why not? Let's get right to it. You know what the hardest part of the exam is? Make sure you don't fall behind. That's the hardest part. That's the hardest part of the whole thing. I think when you look back on your studying for the CPA exam, I think you'll agree with me. That's the hardest thing. Make sure you don't fall behind. What I'm getting at is it's important, it's essential that you set up a regular study schedule. When I was studying for the exam, I was auditing during the day, and what I did was lunch hours. All the time I studied for the exam, I brown bagged it to work. And when it got to be lunch hour, I'd find an empty office, close myself off, and I did an hour of questions every day. It's very powerful. It doesn't sound it. But that's, a, in my mind, a relatively painless way of putting in about five hours a week, five lunch hours a week. And then a, a few hours maybe on Saturday, make sure you're all caught up. And if you're all caught up, you reward yourself by taking Sunday off. I really believe that because you need a break. You have to get away from it. So that's the, sort of the deal you make with yourself. If you're all caught up as of Saturday, you're allowed to take Sunday off. If you're not caught up, you have to actually study on Sunday too. Let that be an incentive to you to get caught up by Saturday so you can get that day off. So to me, that's, that's our game plan. You have to watch all these classes, but you have to get the problems done on the software. And the way the, you're going to get the problems done on the software, an hour a day. Try lunch hours. It doesn't have to be lunch hours. I've had students set their alarm clock an hour early in the morning. Get up an hour early, do an hour of problems, and then have their normal day. That's great. I know I couldn't do that. I'd throw the alarm clock across the room. I just know I would. You've got to be honest with yourself. What are you really going to do? But choose an hour. Try to do an hour a day, and you'll find that the cumulative effect from that effort really starts to pay off. You'll really get this work done, and you have to get this work done. Now, as I said, in this class, we're going to be talking about reporting issues, always a very heavily tested part of the auditing and attestation exam. But I want to start with the basic steps in the audit process, just to warm us up, get us in the mood. Let's go over the basic steps in the audit process. There are six essential steps in the audit process. Step one, we have to establish an understanding with our client. That's step one. You must establish an understanding with the client about the objectives of the engagement, any limitations on the engagement, the services that are going to be performed, space requirements, staffing requirements, audit fees, always very important, what are the fees, and lay out clearly the auditor's responsibility, the client's responsibility, and always remember that we are required, we are required under generally accepted auditing standards, we are required to document our understanding with the client in what is called the engagement letter. Then step two. In step two, we're into the planning phase. And in the planning phase, we have to obtain an understanding of the entity, the client, and its environment, including internal control. In the planning phase, we use risk assessment procedures to obtain an understanding of the client, its environment, internal control. And, of course, the risk assessment procedures that we perform depend on the size of the client, the size of the entity, its complexity, our previous experience with the entity. We're there every year. And, of course, in the planning phase, we discuss with the audit team how susceptible the financial statements are to material misstatements, how susceptible the financial statements are to errors and fraud. Then step three. In step three, we evaluate the risk of material misstatement related to specific assertions, cash, investments, liabilities. Now we're going to, in step three, evaluate the risk of material misstatement in relation to particular assertions, 
and we evaluate the probability of material misstatement related to particular assertions, always considering materiality. In step four, we design and perform our audit procedures. That's step four. We design and we perform our audit procedures. Remember, we're going to have tests of controls, compliance testing. We're going to have substantive tests, tests of details. But in step four, we design and perform our audit procedures to address the risk of material misstatement in particular assertions. In step five, we evaluate all the audit evidence that we obtained. That's step five. We simply evaluate all the audit evidence we've obtained. And in step six, we form an opinion and issue our audit report. That's the sixth and final step in the audit process, where we form our opinion and issue the audit report. In this class, we're really going to be talking about step six, where we form our opinion and issue our audit report. And you know what the client wants. You know that. What the client wants out of any audit is a clean opinion an unmodified opinion. That's what the client wants, a clean opinion, an unmodified opinion. So I think that's a good place for us to start. How does your client deserve an unmodified opinion? How does your client earn an unmodified opinion? How is it earned? Well, to get an unmodified opinion, it's really very simple. The client has to meet six requirements to get an unmodified opinion. Six requirements. Number one, there can't be any significant departures from U.S. GAAP. No significant departures from U.S. generally accepted accounting principles or whatever financial framework we're testing. It could be IFRS. But in this class, we'll assume it's U.S. generally accepted accounting principles. But that is the first requirement. There can't be any significant departures from U.S. GAAP. Number two, U.S. GAAP must have been consistently applied, consistently applied between accounting periods. Step three, there must be adequate and, dis and complete disclosures. Adequate and complete disclosures. And I want you to notice something. If you bracket those first three requirements together, why don't you write this in your notes, next to those three requirements, what are we saying in a nutshell? There can't be any problem with the financial statements. When we say, there can't be any significant departures from U.S. GAAP. U.S. GAAP must have been consistently applied between accounting periods, adequate and complete disclosures. What we're saying, bottom line, there can't be any problem with the financial statements. Now, four, five, and six. Number four, there can't be any significant uncertainties. Number five, no significant scope limitations. And number six, no significant going concern problems. Now, bracket four, five, and six together. What are we saying in four, five, and six? When we say there can't be any significant uncertainties, no significant scope limitations, no significant going, no, no significant going concern problems, aren't we saying in those last three, no problems with the audit? Isn't that really the bottom line? What we're saying to our client is, if you want to deserve an unmodified opinion, if you think you've earned an unmodified opinion, then there can't be any problem with the financial statements, the first three, and there can't be any problem with the audit, the last three. Now, if you look in the viewer's guide, you'll see an example of the standard unmodified opinion. And this is really the foundation of all you're studying in the area of reporting. You must memorize, I mean this, memorize, word for word, the standard unmodified opinion. You'll find if you do that, you're much stronger in reporting in, in reporting in the reporting area because if you memorize the standard unmodified opinion and you really know it cold, now later you just have to make sure you know what modifications are made to the standard unmodified opinion in certain situations. Then you can focus on modifications. But let's look at the standard unmodified opinion. Notice the heading, independent auditor's report. Notice right in the heading, independent auditor's report. Remember, if an accountant, if an auditor is going to provide any type of assurance on financial information, any kind of assurance on financial information, the auditor must be independent, independent in fact, independent in appearance. If the auditor is going to provide any type of assurance on financial information, and remember, the goal of an audit is to provide what? Reasonably positive assurance that the financial statements 
are free of any material misstatement. We're providing reasonably positive assurance that the financial statements are free of any material errors and fraud. But we are providing reasonable assurance. So the auditor must be independent. So that's right, that's right up front. Independent auditor's report. Now it's addressed to the company, the board of directors, the shareholders, but never management. Not management. Now this report starts with the introductory paragraph. Introductory paragraph says, we have audited. Notice, we make, we make our level of service obvious. We state our level of service immediately. We're not doing a review. We're not doing a compilation. The level of service is laid out. We have audited the accompanying financial statements of XYZ Company, which comprise the balance sheet as of December 31, year one, and the related statements of income, changes in stockholders' equity, and cash flows for the year then ended and the related notes to the financial statements. That's the introductory paragraph. Now what the standard unmodified opinion does is lay out very clearly management's responsibility and the auditor's responsibility. So notice the next paragraph has a title, management's responsibility for the financial statements. What we're going to call in these classes the management responsibility paragraph. But the actual title is management's responsibility for the financial statements. Let's take a look at it. Management is responsible for the preparation and fair presentation of these financial statements in accordance with accounting principles generally accepted in the United States of America. This includes the design, implementation, and maintenance of internal control relevant to the preparation and fair presentation of financial statements that are free from material misstatement, whether due to fraud or error. That is the management responsibility paragraph. And now, the most involved paragraph, the auditor's responsibility paragraph. It says, our responsibility is to express an opinion on these financial statements based on our audit. Very clear. We conducted our audit in accordance with auditing standards generally accepted in the United States of America. Now, there might be more than one set of standards. You could say, we conducted our audit in accordance with auditing standards generally accepted in the United States of America and in accordance with standards of the Public Company Accounting Oversight Board, if it's an issuer. Or we could say, we conducted our audit in accordance with auditing standards generally accepted in the United States of America and in accordance with international standards of auditing. So just keep in mind that there might be more than one set of standards that we follow. Those standards require that we plan and perform the audit to obtain reasonable assurance about whether the financial statements are free from material misstatement. An audit involves performing procedures to obtain audit evidence about the amounts and disclosures in the financial statements. The procedures selected depend on the auditor's judgment, including the assessment of the risks of material misstatement of the financial statements, whether due to fraud or error. In making those risk assessments, the auditor considers internal control relevant to the entity's preparation and fair presentation of the financial statements in order to design audit procedures that are appropriate in the circumstances, but not for the purpose of expressing an opinion on the effectiveness of the entity's internal control. Accordingly, we express no such opinion. An audit also includes evaluating the appropriateness of accounting policies used and the reasonableness of significant accounting estimates made by management as well as evaluating the overall presentation of the financial statements. And now the bottom line, the last sentence. We believe that the audit evidence we have obtained is sufficient and appropriate to provide a basis for our audit opinion. And then finally, of course, the opinion paragraph. In our opinion, the financial statements referred to above present fairly. This is a clean opinion. This is an unmodified opinion what the client wanted, what the client hoped for. Present fairly in all material respects the financial position of XYZ Company as of December 31, year one, and the results of its operations, and its cash flows for the year that ended, in accordance with accounting principles generally accepted in the United States of America. It is signed either manually or by the printed signature of the firm. When is it dated? It's dated no earlier. Remember, the audit report is dated no earlier than the date on which the auditor obtained sufficient, appropriate audit evidence 
on which to base the opinion. Remember, the audit report is always dated no earlier than the date on which the auditor has obtained sufficient appropriate audit evidence on which to base the opinion. That is a standard unmodified opinion. Now, I said memorize it, and I meant memorize it word for word. You want to get to the point where you could sit down at your laptop and just print that out, just type it out, know it word for word. Believe me, they test it word for word. Multiple choice can get very picky about the wording. They could have a simulation where they give you a version of the report with all kinds of mistakes in it and ask you to sort out what's wrong with it. You can only do that if you know the report cold. Now, I also want to mention international standards. There are a couple of major differences when you do an, a standard unmodified opinion under international standards of auditing. For example, in international standards of auditing, in the introductory paragraph, they also refer to the summary of significant accounting policies and other explanatory information. So remember that. If it's international standards of auditing, in the introductory paragraph, they would also refer to a summary of significant accounting policies and other explanatory information. In the auditor's responsibility paragraph, they would also state that auditing standards require that the auditor must comply with ethical requirements. They include that, too. And in international standards, you can refer to the fair presentation of the financial statements or you can refer to financial statements that give a true and fair view. Welcome back. In our last class, we went over the standard unmodified opinion, word for word. And as I said, it's essential that you memorize the unmodified opinion, word for word. That is really how you begin your study of reporting issues, because you'll find you come back to it time and again because when you study what modifications have to be made to the un unmodified opinion, it is so helpful if you know it cold and you can just zero in on the modifications. You'll find it helps you time and again. Now, what we want to get into in this class is something that we might add to the unmodified opinion. For example, we might add to the unmodified opinion an emphasis of matter paragraph. An emphasis of matter paragraph would come in after the opinion paragraph. It's not modifying the opinion. Let me say that again. When there's an emphasis of matter paragraph, it comes after the opinion paragraph because we're not modifying the opinion. It's an unmodified opinion. Now, an emphasis of matter paragraph could be required or at the auditor's discretion. Now, when is it used? An emphasis of matter paragraph is used for information that is recorded in the financial statement. It's properly recorded. It's fully disclosed, but emphasis is going to be added because it's essential to the user's understanding of the financial statements. That's when you need an emphasis of matter paragraph. It's for information that's recorded properly in the financial statements. It's fully disclosed, but emphasis is added because it's fundamental. It's essential to the user's understanding of the financial statements. Now, if you look in your viewer's guide, you'll see the four situations where an emphasis of matter paragraph is required. Number one, an emphasis of matter paragraph is required when there's a substantial doubt about the entity's ability to continue as a going concern. And we'll talk about going concern issues later in these classes. But when there's a substantial doubt about the entity's ability to continue as a going concern, that is a required emphasis of matter paragraph. Number two, an emphasis of matter paragraph is required when there's a justified change in accounting principle that has a material effect on the financial statements. I think you know what we're talking about. Let's say a company changes from an old generally accepted accounting principle to a new generally accepted accounting principle for the same transactions, for the same set of circumstances. They change their inventory costing method from FIFO to LIFO, LIFO to FIFO, FIFO to weighted average, something like that. They change their method of accounting for long-term contracts from percentage of completion to completed contract or from completed contract to percentage of completion. These situations come up. Well, if there's a justified, notice it's justified, change in principle 
that has a material effect on the statements, that is a required emphasis of matter paragraph. Notice this includes a change in entity. That would be included in this, in this emphasis of matter paragraph. A change in entity. A parent and sub have always issued separate statements. This year they want to consolidate their statements. That's a change in the reporting entity. A change in entity. That would be included in this section. This would also include correcting an error. Correcting an error that involves a principle. In other words, you misapplied a principle, or you go from an unacceptable principle to an acceptable principle. If it involves an accounting principle, correcting an error, not mathematical mistakes, but if you correct an error that involves an accounting principle, that would be in this section. Also, a change in estimate inseparable from a change in principle. And you know the, the classic example of that, a change in depreciation methods. A change in depreciation methods is a change in estimate that's affected by a change in principle. That would be included in this emphasis of matter paragraph. By the way, not a change in estimate. We used to estimate the machine would last for six years. Now we think it'll last for eight. Just a simple change in estimate is not in this section. But a justified change in principle that has a material effect on the statements, that's a required emphasis of matter paragraph. Number three, if the financial statements are prepared with an applicable special purpose framework other than regulatory basis that's intended for general use. That's an emphasis of matter paragraph. An emphasis of matter paragraph is required, number four, when subsequently discovered facts lead to a change in opinion, and we'll talk about that later in these classes. But any time subsequently discovered facts have led to a change in audit opinion, that's going to be a required emphasis of matter paragraph. Now, an emphasis of, of matter paragraph may be used, may be used for an uncertainty. It may be used if there's a major catastrophe. It may be used if there are significant related party transactions. And it may be used if there are significant subsequent events. Now, after the emphasis of matter paragraphs, then there are other matter paragraphs. So remember, it's the opinion paragraph followed by emphasis of matter paragraphs. And then after the emphasis of matter paragraphs, there would be other matter paragraphs. Now, when do we use an other matter paragraph? We use an other matter paragraph. And again, it could be required or at the auditor's discretion. We're going to use another matter paragraph to describe a matter that is relevant to the user's understanding of the audit report or the auditor's responsibility. When do we use an emphasis of matter paragraph? When do we use that? When we want to emphasize a matter that's essential to the user's understanding of the financial statements. But we're going to use an other matter paragraph to, for a matter that's relevant to the user's understanding of the audit opinion or the auditor's responsibility. Now again, if you look in your viewer's guide, you'll see the nine situations where an other matter paragraph is required. Number one, if the auditor has to restrict use of the audit report, that's a required other matter paragraph. Number two, if there are subsequently discovered facts that lead to a change in audit opinion. Now notice, that was one of our required emphasis of matter paragraphs. See, here the auditor has a choice. If there are subsequently, and we will talk about this later in the class, in the classes, but if there are subsequently discovered facts that lead to a change in audit opinion, that will either be a required emphasis of matter paragraph or an other matter paragraph based on the auditor's judgment of its importance. Obviously, if the auditor thinks it's extremely important, it's auditor judgment, it would be more likely to be an emphasis of matter paragraph. If the auditor thinks it has less importance, it would be an other matter paragraph. But it has to be one or the other. It's required to be one or the other, but it could be one or the other. Number three, if the financial statements of prior periods are audited by a predecessor auditor and the predecessor auditor's report is not going to be reissued, not going to be reissued. And again, we'll talk about that later in these classes, but that would be a required other matter paragraph. Number four, if the current period financial statements are audited and presented in comparison with compiled statements or reviewed statements, 
for prior periods or, or presented in comparison with prior periods that were not compiled, not reviewed. That's required on a matter paragraph. Number five, if there's a material inconsistency in other information and management refuses to revise the other information presented alongside audited financial statements. Then number six, there'd be a required other matter paragraph if the auditor chooses to report on supplemental, supplementary information in the audit report rather than a separate report. Number seven, there'll be another matter paragraph required if the auditor wants to refer to supplementary information. That's required. It's required supplementary information. And we'll talk about other information and supplementary information later in these classes. Number eight, there'll be another matter paragraph required if the auditor has to restrict use of the report when a special purpose uh, financial statement, special purpose financial statements are presented in accordance with contractual or a regulatory basis. But again, I'm not talking about a regulatory basis intended for general use. And then finally, number nine, another matter paragraph would be required to, if a report on compliance is included with the audit report. Those are the nine situations where an other matter paragraph is required. Now, an other matter paragraph may be necessary, notice first, to explain why the auditor cannot withdraw when there's a management imposed scope limitation. And we will be talking about that. But if the auditor is unable to withdraw from, from an engagement when there's an, a management imposed scope limitation, that may require, it's up to the auditor's judgment, may require an other matter paragraph. Another matter paragraph may be necessary when the auditor is either required or permitted to provide further explanation of their audit responsibility. And then finally, an other matter paragraph may be necessary if the auditor is engaged to report on more than one set of financial statements with a different general purpose framework. Now, it's important that you study when an emphasis of matter paragraph is required and when it may be used, when an other matter paragraph is required or may be used. It is the sort of thing the exam is likely to ask questions time and again uh, you know, about these issues. Emphasis of matter paragraphs, other matter paragraphs, when are they used, why are they used. Make sure you focus in. Now, before I see you in the next class, you'll see at the beginning of the next class, there are six multiple choice questions that have to be done. And it is essential that you answer those six questions before you start that class. And we talk about the questions together. It's very important that you're an active participant in these classes. Don't just watch the classes passively. You know, take good notes. When th there are questions assigned, you get your answers. And then we'll discuss them together. You'll find you get much more out of the classes if you do those simple things. And this is what we both want. We both want you to get a lot out of these classes. So before I see you ne in that next class, I want you to do those six multiple choice questions and get your answers, and then we'll discuss them together. And in the next class, we'll continue our discussion on reporting issues. Keep studying. Don't fall behind. And I look to see you in the next class. Welcome back to our discussion on reporting issues. Now you know that I've assigned six multiple choice questions that I wanted you to complete before starting this class. If you haven't done that, then shut the class down now. Get your answers before we begin. That's such an important part of this process. Always get your answers first. Then we discuss the questions. So let's look at number one. Number one says, which of the following representations does an auditor make explicitly and which implicitly when issuing an unmodified opinion. How about conformity with GAAP? Well, that's explicit, right, in the opinion paragraph. Don't we say, in our opinion, the financial statements referred to above present fairly in accordance with accounting principles generally accepted in the United States of America. Can't be more explicit than that. How about adequacy of disclosures? That's never said explicitly. That's implied. The answer is D. That's implicitly because when we say that the financial statements are presented fairly in accordance with U.S. GAAP, well, U.S. GAAP requires 
that all disclosures be adequate and complete. We don't mention disclosures, but GAAP requires it. So if the statements are in conformity with U.S. GAAP, then it is implied that all disclosures are adequate and complete. Number two, when subsequently discovered facts lead to a change in the auditor's opinion, which of the following must be added to the auditor's unmodified opinion? Well, I hope you went right down to D, the basis for an unmodified opinion paragraph. There's no such thing. No such thing as a basis for unmodified opinion paragraph. It doesn't exist. So hopefully, right away, you looked at D and said, can't be. And you were right. Now we're left with A, B, and C. Either an emphasis of matter paragraph, A, B, an other matter paragraph, or C, either an emphasis of matter paragraph or an other matter paragraph. And you may remember it is C. This is that case. Yes, you, you are required to have a paragraph about this. Anytime that subsequently discovered facts have led to a change in opinion, you are required to have an added paragraph to the unmodified opinion. It's true. But they leave it to the auditor's judgment, depending on the level of importance that the auditor places on this item. They can either add an emphasis of matter paragraph or an other matter paragraph. It's up to the auditor's judgment. Answer C. Number three, how does an auditor make the following representations when issuing the standard auditor's report, the standard unmodified opinion on comparative financial statements? How about consistent application of accounting principles? Is that explicit or implicit? No, it's implicit when we say that the financial statements are presented fairly in accordance with U.S. generally accepted accounting principles. U.S. generally accepted accounting principle. U.S. generally accepted accounting principles requires that U.S. GAAP be consistently implied. We don't we don't say that GAAP was consistently applied. We say that the financial statements were presented fairly in accordance with U.S. GAAP, which requires consistency. So that's implicit. How about the, other, the, the second column? Auditor considers internal control. Well, that's explicit, isn't it? In the auditor's responsibility paragraph, don't we say in the auditor's responsibility paragraph that the auditor considers internal control relevant to the entity's preparation and fair presentation of the financial statements in order to, des to design audit procedures? That's explicit in the auditor's responsibility paragraph. Number four, if a client makes a change in accounting principle that is inseparable from a change in estimate, this material event should be handled in the accounting records as a change in, well, you may remember that when there's a change in estimate affected by a change in principle or inseparable from a change in principle, in the accounting records, it's handled as a change in estimate. We don't touch prior periods. Just going forward, we make the change. Prospective only. That's handled in the accounting records as a change in estimate, as I'm sure you know. But is it A or B? Is it in the, is it in the accounting records as a change in estimate and the auditor would add an other matter paragraph? Or is it B, a change in estimate, and the auditor would add an emphasis of matter paragraph? It's B. It's a required emphasis of matter paragraph. Number five, the following emphasis of matter paragraph was included in an auditor's report to indicate a justified, a justified lack of consistency. As discussed in note T to the financial statements, the company changed their method of accounting for long-term contracts. It's a change in principle. How does, how should the auditor report on this matter if the auditor concurred with the change? Well, what type of opinion? If the, if the auditor concurs with the change, it, if it's a justified change and the auditor concurs with the change, it's an unmodified opinion. And where would the explanatory paragraph be? 
Well, of course, if it's an unmodified opinion, the explanatory paragraph, the emphasis of matter paragraph, would be after the opinion paragraph. And the answer is B, because we're not modifying the opinion. So these explanatory paragraphs, emphasis of matter paragraph, other matter paragraphs, come after the audit opinion paragraph. We're not modifying the opinion. So answer B. Number six, for which of the following events would an auditor issue a report that omits any reference to consistency? When would we omit any reference to consistency? Well, answer A, a change in the method of accounting for inventory. Well, that's a change in principle. We would change the audit report and add an emphasis of matter paragraph. It would be required. So that's not it. They want to know when we would admit any reference to consistency. How about B, a change from an accounting principle that is not generally accepted to one that is generally accepted. Well, that's correcting an error. And if it's correcting an error that involves a principle, it's a required emphasis of matter paragraph. So that, that can't be the answer. It would not be omitted. D says management's lack of reasonable justification for a change in principle. Well, if there's a lack of justification, that's a consistency problem. If it's not justified, then it's a gap problem. It's a gap problem, so of course it's going to have to be referred to, and we'll get to that later in the class. But answer C, a change in the useful life to calculate the provision for depreciation, that's just a simple change in estimate. A simple change in estimate is not mentioned in the audit report. So if you estimate, you used to estimate that a machine would have a useful life of four years, and now you've gain more information, you think it's going to have a useful life of six years, that's a simple change in estimate is not referred to in the audit report at all. So that's why the answer is C. I wanted to mention, mention one more thing about the unmodified opinion, just in case this comes up in the exam. If the auditor wants to address other reporting responsibilities in the audit report, other than generally accepted auditing standards. Again, if the auditor wants to address other auditing responsibilities in the audit report, other than generally accepted auditing standards, well, before the introductory paragraph, you would now have a heading, report on the financial statements. That would be before the introductory paragraph, report on the financial statements. And then after the opinion paragraph, you would have an, another paragraph with a heading, report on other legal and regulatory requirements. You might see that. Now, so far, what we've basically said in these classes is that if there's no problem with the financial statements, no problem with the financials, and no problem with the audit, the client deserves a clean opinion, an unmodified opinion. Well. What if there is a problem with the financial statement? Let's get into this. What if there's a problem with the financials? What if there's a problem with the audit? Well, of course, now an unmodified opinion is not going to be possible. Let's start with a problem with the financial statements. What if U.S. GAAP is not consistently applied? What if there is a significant departure from U.S. GAAP? Or whatever applicable financial reporting framework you're testing. Again, it could be IFRS, but we'll stay with U.S. GAAP. So if U.S. GAAP is not consistently applied, if there has been a significant departure from U.S. GAAP, what if disclosures are not adequate and complete? If there's a problem with the financial statements, as I say, it's a different world because if there's a material GAAP problem, if there's a material GAAP or disclosure problem, the auditor has to issue a qualified opinion. That results in a qualified opinion. If it's a very material, a pervasive, an all-encompassing, a pervasive gap problem, the auditor has to issue an adverse opinion. So remember that. If there's a material gap problem, qualified opinion. Very material, pervasive, adverse opinion. If you look in your viewer's guide, 
you'll see an example of a qualified opinion. Notice when you write a qualified opinion, the introductory paragraph, exactly the same. Management responsibility paragraph, exactly the same. Isn't it good that everything is memorized? You've got that unmodified opinion memorized, so you can just focus in now on the changes. Look at the auditor's responsibility paragraph. It is different. Now the auditor's responsibility paragraph concludes by saying, we believe that the audit evidence we have obtained is sufficient and appropriate to provide a basis for our qualified opinion. So now we add an explanatory paragraph before the opinion paragraph because we're modifying the opinion and it has a heading basis for qualified opinion so you, you see the difference in approach we're now adding an explanatory paragraph before the opinion paragraph because we're modifying the opinion and as i say it has a heading basis for qualified opinion it says the company's financial statements do not disclose significant related party transactions in our opinion disclosure of this information is required by accounting principles generally accepted in the united states of america and now we modify our opinion paragraph. In our opinion, except for, this is a, an except for qualified opinion. In our opinion, except for the omission of the information disclosed in the basis of qualified opinion paragraph, the financial statements referred to above present fairly. And it's an except for qualified opinion. When you go in that exam, make sure you know cold the changes that have to be made. Well, what if it is a very material, a pervasive, you know, all-encompassing gap or disclosure problem. Well, now the auditor has, has to issue an adverse opinion. And in your viewer's guide, you'll see an example of the adverse opinion. Notice introductory paragraph, exactly the same. Management responsibility paragraph, exactly the same. But the auditor's responsibility now concludes by saying, we believe that the audit evidence we have obtained is sufficient and appropriate to provide a basis for our adverse opinion. Now you know what's coming. Now we have to add an explanatory paragraph before the opinion paragraph because we're modifying the opinion. This example says, as described in note X to the financial statements, the company carries its property, plant, and equipment at appraised values. And of course now the opinion paragraph is very different. In our opinion, because of the significance of the matter discussed in the basis for adverse opinion paragraph. The financial statements referred to above do not present fairly. This is the opposite of a clean opinion. It's an adverse opinion. It is the last thing the client wants, but apparently in this case has earned it. Why aren't they disclosing that information? They won't disclose it, then we have to slap them down with an adverse opinion. So you see how you handle problems with the financial statements. If there's a material gap problem, an except for qualified opinion. Very material gap problem, adverse. In our next class, we'll continue our discussion of reporting issues. Keep studying. Don't fall behind. I'll see you in the next class. Welcome back. In this class, we're going to continue our discussion on reporting issues. And you'll remember that in our last class, we talked about what we do in terms of the audit report if there is a problem with the financial statements, if there's a gap or disclosure problem. We know if there's a material gap or disclosure problem, the auditor has to issue an except for qualified opinion. If there's a very material, a pervasive gap or disclosure problem, the auditor has to issue an adverse opinion. Well, in this class, what I want to talk about is what we do in terms of the audit report if there's a problem with the audit. Let's start with a scope problem. What if the auditor is unable to obtain evidence? That's what a scope problem is. It's unavailability of data. The auditor is not able to obtain evidence. In, there's inadequate records. 
The auditor is not able to obtain minutes of meetings. The auditor is not able to observe the inventory count at the end of the year, something like that. Well, if there's a material scope problem, the auditor issues an except for qualified opinion. If there's a very material, a pervasive scope problem, the auditor has to disclaim an opinion. So remember that. If there's a material scope problem, an except for qualified opinion. Very material, disclaim. Now, what if there's a client imposed scope limitation? The client will not let you confirm their accounts receivable. It's client imposed. Well, of course, you ask management to remove the, the limitation, of course. If they won't, you communicate this problem with those in charge of governance. You do that, of course. But what if you're stuck with the fact that management will not let you confirm accounts receivable? Well, if it's material and pervasive, the auditor disclaims an opinion. It's that simple. There's a client-imposed scope limitation, and you've communicated this with those in charge of governance, and nothing is done about it. Well, then you have to decide. If it's material and pervasive, it's all-encompassing, the auditor would disclaim an opinion. Now, in international standards, in that situation, in international standards, the auditor would be required to withdraw. Now, if you look in your viewer's guide, you'll see an example of an except for qualified opinion when there's a scope limitation. Remember, if there's a material scope limitation, it's an except for qualified opinion. And here's the example in the viewer's guide. And you'll notice right away, introductory paragraph, exactly the same. Management responsibility paragraph, exactly the same. But now, of course, the auditor's re responsibility paragraph has to conclude, we believe that the audit evidence we have obtained is sufficient and appropriate to provide a basis for our qualified opinion. And now we're going to add an explanatory paragraph before the opinion paragraph because it does modify the opinion and it'll have a heading, basis for qualified opinion. In this example, we were not engaged as auditors of the company until after December 31, year one, and therefore were unable to observe the counting of the physical inventory at the beginning or end of the year. As a result, we were unable to determine whether any adjustment might have been necessary in respect to recorded inventories and the elements making up the statements of income, changes in stockholders' equity, and cash flows. And now the opinion paragraph. It's an except for qualified opinion. So it, the opinion paragraph is going to say, in our, in our opinion, except for the possible effects of the matter described in the basis for qualified opinion paragraph, the financial statements referred to above present fairly. So you can see. If it's a material scope problem, you issue an except for qualified opinion. Now, if there's a very material, a pervasive scope problem, the auditor is going to have to disclaim an opinion. And in your viewer's guide, you'll see an example of a disclaimer of opinion when there's a very material scope limitation. Notice the introductory paragraph has changed. Now the introductory paragraph says we were engaged to audit. the accompanying financial statements of XYZ company. Management responsibility paragraph is unchanged. Now the auditor's responsibility paragraph is changed. Our responsibility is to express an opinion on these financial statements based on conducting the audit in accordance with auditing standards generally accepted in the United States of America. Because of the matters described in the basis for for disclaimer of opinion paragraph, however, we were not able to obtain sufficient appropriate audit evidence to provide a basis for an audit opinion. And now, of course, we're going to add an explanatory paragraph before the opinion paragraph because we've modified the opinion. And it'll have a heading, basis for disclaimer. It says, due to the introduction of a new computerized accounts receivable system, there were a number of misstatements in accounts receivable we were unable to confirm by alternative means. 
accounts receivable which total X in the balance sheet at December 31, year one. And of course, now the opinion paragraph has a different heading. It's now called disclaimer of opinion as a heading. Because of the significant of the because of the significance of the matters described in the basis for disclaimer of opinion paragraph, we have not been able to obtain sufficient appropriate audit evidence to provide a basis for an audit opinion. Accordingly, we do not express an opinion on these financial statements. So that's how you handle scope problems. You have a material scope problem, an except for qualified opinion. Very material, disclaim. How about an uncertainty? How do we handle an uncertainty? Well, let me say, first of all, if there's an uncertainty, like a lawsuit, and assuming that the auditor was able to obtain sufficient appropriate evidence about the lawsuit, about the uncertainty, and assuming it's fully disclosed in the financial statements, then the auditor would issue a standard unmodified opinion and may add, it's not required, but may add, based on the auditor's judgment, an emphasis of matter paragraph. That's your typical uncertainty. The auditor has been able to obtain sufficient appropriate audit evidence about that lawsuit, about that uncertainty. It's fully disclosed in the financial statements, no problem. Standard unmodified opinion, and the auditor, depending on their judgment, may add an emphasis of matter paragraph. Let me address this possibility. Let's say there's an uncertainty that's causing a material misstatement in the financial statements. Now, you know how to handle that, right? If there's an uncertainty that's causing a material misstatement in the financial statements, well, it's a gap problem. So if it's material, and except for qualified opinion. Very material, adverse. You know that like you know your name. That's no problem. Here's the one that's a little tricky. What if there's an uncertainty caused by the fact that the auditor is not able to obtain sufficient appropriate audit evidence? That's what's causing the uncertainty. You have an uncertainty caused by the fact that the auditor is not able to obtain sufficient and appropriate audit evidence about the situation. Well, then it's, look at it as a type of scope limitation. That's really what it amounts to. If there's an uncertainty that's being caused by the fact that the auditor is not able, not able to obtain sufficient appropriate audit evidence, well, that's a scope problem, so you know how to handle it. If it's a material uncertainty caused by the auditor's inability to obtain evidence, and except for qualified opinion. If it's very material, if it's pervasive, you disclaim. Now, I want to mention that international standards are a little different. International standards of auditing say that there could be an interaction of several uncertainties. And the interaction of several uncertainties could mean that the auditor is not able to form an opinion, even though they were able to obtain sufficient appropriate audit evidence. Let me say that again. In international standards, they concede that it's possible there could be an interaction of several uncertainties. And the result is the, aud the auditor is not able to form an opinion, even though they, the auditor was able to obtain sufficient appropriate audit evidence. Well, in that case, the auditor would disclaim, even though they were able to obtain sufficient appropriate audit evidence. But it's important to remember that in U.S. generally accepted auditing standards with an uncertainty, the auditor only disclaims if they're not able to obtain sufficient appropriate audit evidence. So remember that. In U.S. generally accepted auditing standards, the auditor would only disclaim with an uncertainty if they are not able to obtain sufficient appropriate audit evidence. How about a going concern problem? How do we handle that? Remember, on every audit, the auditor is responsible to evaluate the audit evidence that they gather during the audit to determine whether the company, whether the entity, will or will not you know, continue as a going concern. The auditor has that responsibility. They have the responsibility on any audit to evaluate the audit evidence to determine is there a substantial doubt about the company's ability to continue as a going concern for a reasonable period of time. What's a reasonable period of time? Not to exceed one year. In other words, the auditor's not required to look 10 years out, 20 years out, no. Not to exceed one year. Now, what kind of evidence would the auditor consider? 
to try to determine if there's a going concern problem. Well, they would read minutes of meetings, legal letters, very important. And in your viewer's guide, you'll see a list of negative trends you know, that might indicate a going concern problem, recurring losses, negative cash flows, adverse financial ratios, they're defaulting on, on loans, they're unable to get usual trade credit terms, there are arrearages of dividends, there's pending legal proceedings, they've lost the legal right to a patent. There's a whole list of negative trends. And then in your viewer's guide, you'll see some mitigating factors. Uh, disposal of assets. That actually might be a good sign where they're trying to dispose of unproductive assets and concentrate on their more profitable parts of the business. They're restructuring debt. They're reducing or delaying expenditures. They've increased stockholders' equity. They've acquired more capital. They've somehow reduced their dividend requirements. Those would be mitigating factors. But on every audit, the auditor has to look at all the evidence to determine is there a substantial doubt about the company's ability to continue as a going concern. All right, so let's get to it. How do we handle a going concern problem? It's a problem with the audit. Well, if there is a material going concern problem, material, not pervasive, if there's a material going concern problem, the auditor issues a standard unmodified opinion, just a standard unmodified opinion with a required emphasis of matter paragraph, right? We know that's a required emphasis of matter paragraph. If there is a very material going concern problem, the auditor disclaims an opinion. And of course, I should add that the auditor always communicates this concern to those who are in charge of governance as well. But that's the bottom line with going concern problem. If there's a material going concern problem, standard unmodified opinion, but the auditor would be required to add an emphasis of matter paragraph, you know, using that language, raising substantial doubt about the entity's ability to continue as a going concern, using that very particular language. But if it's a very material going concern problem, it's pervasive, disclaim. All right, so let me summarize. Here's the way I want you to think in the audit. Here's the way I want you to think in the exam. When you're in the exam and you can tell from a question, it's not going to be a clean opinion. You break it up in your mind this way. Is it a problem with the financial statements or is it a problem with the audit? If it's a problem with the financial statements, a gap or disclosure problem, you know what to do. If it's a material gap problem, an except for a qualified opinion. If it's very material, adverse. That's how you handle prob all problems with the financial statements. But what if it's a problem with the audit? What if there's a scope limitation? If there's a material scope limitation, a material, not pervasive, an except for a qualified opinion. If it's very material, disclaim. How about an uncertainty? Well, the, one you, the, only, the only uncertainty you're worried about is an uncertainty caused by the auditor's inability to obtain sufficient appropriate audit evidence. So it's really a scope limitation. So if it's a very, if it's a material uncertainty caused by the fact that the auditor is not able to obtain sufficient appropriate audit evidence, you issue an except for qualified opinion. But if it's very material, it's pervasive, it's all encompassing, disclaim. And then finally, going concern. If there's a material going concern problem, what do you do? Material, not pervasive. You issue a standard unmodified opinion, but you are required to add an emphasis of matter paragraph. But if there's a very material going concern problem, disclaim. Now, you will notice that before you start the next class, I want you to do 14 questions. There are 14 questions I want you to answer. And as always, it's important that you do those questions first. Get all of your 14 answers before you start the next class. And I'll look to see you then. Welcome back. In this class, we're going to continue our discussion on reporting issues. And I want to begin 
with the 14 questions that I assigned for you to finish before starting this class. So let's look at these questions. In the first question, they say, an auditor most likely would express an unmodified opinion and would not add an emphasis of matter or other matter paragraph to the report if the auditor, A, says wishes to emphasize that the entity had significant transactions with related parties. Remember, that is an optional emphasis of matter paragraph. So they may add an emphasis of matter paragraph. It's not required, but they may for significant related party transactions. B says they concur with the entity's change in its method of accounting for inventory. You know, FIFO to LIFO. That's a required emphasis of matter paragraph when there's been a change in accounting principle that has a material effect on the statements. C discovers that supplementary information required by the FASB has been omitted. We haven't talked about that yet, but as you would probably guess, if you omit required supplementary information, that would require an other matter paragraph, as we did discuss in a prior, a prior class anyway. It is required. Required other matter paragraph. It is answer D. If the auditor believes there's a remote likelihood of a material loss from an uncertainty. Well, if it's a remote uncertainty, it wouldn't necessarily even have to be disclosed in the financial statements. So it's highly unlikely that there would be an emphasis of matter or other matter paragraph, not for a remote uncertainty. Next question an emphasis of matter paragraph following the opinion paragraph of an auditor's report describes an uncertainty as follows. As discussed in Note X to the financial statements, the company is a defendant in a lawsuit. So they're describing an uncertainty. They've added an emphasis of matter paragraph. Notice following the opinion paragraph. So they're asking what type of opinion would this be? Well, you know it's not adverse or qualified, A, B, or C, because any kind of explanatory paragraph, you know, basis for adverse opinion, basis for qualified opinion, would be before the opinion paragraph, when you're modifying the opinion. No, this would be part of an unmodified opinion. Answer D. Next, an auditor concludes that there's a substantial doubt about the entity's ability to continue as a going concern for a reasonable period of time. If the entity's financial statements adequately disclose its financial difficulties, the auditor's report would require an emphasis of matter paragraph. That's true. That specifically uses the phrase reasonable period of time, not to exceed one year. No. That, remember, the, the, the key phrase in the, in the required emphasis of matter paragraph would be raising substantial doubt about the entity's ability to continue as a going concern. So there's nothing about to exceed one year. There's no in that column. But yes, the phrase going concern is specifically mentioned. And the answer is C. Which of the following conditions or events most likely would cause an auditor to have a substantial doubt about the entity's ability to continue as a going concern. A, significant related party transactions. Well, significant related party transactions certainly have to be a disclosure, but wouldn't necessarily indicate a going concern problem. Arrearages in preferred stock dividends. Well, would be a negative trend. Same thing with D, restrictions on disposal of assets is present, that, that could be a negative trend, not being able to dispose of unproductive assets, perhaps. But C or D wouldn't raise a substantial doubt about the company's ab ability to continue as a going concern. But answer B would. If you can't get usual trade terms, it's a very, very bad sign. Next, which of the following phrases should be included in the opinion paragraph 
when an auditor expresses a qualified opinion. How about the first column? Are we going to see the phrase when in when read in conjunction with note X? No. Are we going to, so no in the first column. Second column, how about with the following, with the foregoing explanation? No. The answer is D, double no. No, what, what we say in the opinion paragraph is, in our opinion, except for the possible effect of the matter described in the basis for qualified opinion paragraph, the financial statements referred to above are presented fairly. That's what you see in the opinion paragraph. These phrases aren't there. When qualifying an opinion because of an insufficiency in audit evidence, a scope problem, an auditor would refer to the situation in the introductory paragraph? No. Introductory paragraph is unchanged when there's a material scope problem. Remember, when there's a, a material scope problem, it isn't except for qualified opinion. Very material, pervasive, we disclaim. But introductory paragraph is unchanged. So no in the first column. How about management's responsibility paragraph? Is that changed? No. Unchanged. How about the second column? How about the auditor's responsibility paragraph? Yes, that's changed. Because now we have to conclude the auditor's responsibility paragraph by saying, we believe that the audit evidence we have obtained is sufficient and appropriate to provide a basis for our qualified opinion. So it is changed. Answer D. No, yes. Next, an auditor may reasonably issue an except for qualified opinion for a scope limitation? Yes. Right? A material scope limitation. Is it except for qualified opinion? How about an unjustified accounting change? Well, if it's an unjustified accounting change, that's a gap problem. And if it's material, it would be an except for qualified opinion. Very material, adverse. But yes, you could issue a qualified opinion for either, either of these situations. Answer C, double yes. Next, due to a scope limitation, an auditor disclaimed an opinion on the financial statements taken as a whole, but the auditor's report included a statement that the current asset portion of the balance sheet was fairly stated. I think you know what this is. It's a piecemeal opinion. It's not allowed. It's not allowed. The auditor can't give an adverse opinion or a disclaimer of opinion on the financial statements taken as a whole, but say, but revenues were fairly stated. That's a piecemeal opinion. It's not allowed. Why? Because of answer A. It would overshadow the disclaimer. It would overshadow the adverse opinion. It would just overshadow the, the result. That's why piecemeal opinions are not allowed. Compare that to the next question. Harris, CPA, has been asked to audit and report on the balance sheet of Fox Company, but not on the statement of income, retained earnings, or cash flows. Harris will have access to all information. That's important. No scope limitation. They have access to all information underlying the basic financial statements. Under these circumstances, Harris may see. Answer C, accept the engagement. It's limited reporting objectives. That's not a piecemeal opinion. You can express an opinion just on the balance sheet as long as there are no restrictions on the scope of the audit. No limitations. You can examine anything you want to examine and then have limited reporting objectives. That's perfectly okay. That is not what is meant by a piecemeal opinion. Again, what's a piecemeal opinion? The auditor has expressed a disclaimer of opinion on the financial statement, financial statements taken as a whole, or an adverse opinion on the financial statements taken as a whole, and then wants to add, yeah, but the liability section is fairly stated. No. It overshadows the auditor's report overshadows the real conclusion of it, which is a disclaimer or adverse. Next, when an auditor qualifies an opinion because of inadequate disclosure. What's an adequate disclosure? A gap problem, not gap disclosure problem. The auditor should describe the nature of the omission in a basis for qualified opinion paragraph and also modify introductory paragraph. No, it's unchanged. The auditor's responsibility paragraph, yes, because now that has to conclude 
that we believe that the audit evidence we have obtained is sufficient, appropriate to provide a basis for our qualified opinion. So, yes, in the second column. How about the third column? How about the opinion paragraph? Of course that would be. It would be referred to in the opinion paragraph because now the opinion paragraph has to say, in our opinion, except for the possible effect of the matter described in the basis for qualified opinion paragraph, the financial statements referred to above present fairly. So the answer is C. No, yes, yes. You see how important it is time and again that you know the unmodified opinion cold and then what modifications are made to that opinion in certain situations. They are very picky. Next, in which of the following circumstances would an auditor most likely express an adverse opinion? So these four choices, what would most likely lead to an adverse opinion? How about A, the chief executive officer refuses the auditor access to minutes of meetings? Well, you know what that is. That's a scope limitation. So if it's material, and except for qualified opinion, but if it's very material, if it's pervasive, you disclaim, not an adverse opinion. B says, tests of controls show that the entity's internal control structure is so poor it can't be relied upon. Well, that wouldn't necessarily result in an adverse opinion. What it would result in is extensive substantive testing because you can't rely on the, the client system. It, extensive substantive tests, but it may not result in even a qualified opinion. It's just you're going to have to do a lot more testing. D says information comes to the auditor's attention that raises substantial doubt about the entity's ability to continue as a going concern. Well, if it's material, except for a qualified opinion. Very material, pervasive, disclaim. No adverse opinion possibility there. Of course, the answer is C. The financial statements are not in conformity with GAAP regarding the capitalization of leases. That's a GAAP problem. And if it's very material, if it's pervasive, if it's all-encompassing, it would be an adverse opinion. It would be. Next, in a, if a company issues financial statements that purport to present its financial position and results of operations, but they omit the statement of cash flows, the auditor ordinarily would express what? Well, isn't that a gap problem? Gap requires the presentation of a statement of cash flows. So if, a, if your client wants to omit the statement of cash flows, that's a gap problem. And generally speaking, that's material, not pervasive, not all-encompassing. So it would be a qualified opinion. Answer B. Next. In the first audit of a client, an auditor was not able to gather sufficient evidence about the consistent application of accounting principles between periods, between the current and the prior year, as well as the amount of assets or liabilities at the beginning of the current year. This was due to the client's record retention policy. They have a terrible accounting system. They're not retaining information. They're not retaining records. If the amounts in question could materially, affect, could materially affect current operating results, the auditor would, of course, disclaim. This is a very material, pervasive, all-encompassing scope limitation. So the answer is A. Auditor would be unable to express an opinion. And then finally, an auditor would express an unmodified opinion with an emphasis of matter paragraph added to the auditor's report for an unjustified accounting change? No. An unjustified accounting change is a gap problem. If it's material, qualified opinion. Very material, adverse. So we're talking about a gap problem in that situation. It's not simply adding an emphasis of matter paragraph. How about a going concern problem? Yes, if it's a material going concern problem, it's an unmodified opinion with a required emphasis of matter paragraph. The answer is C. No, yes. I hope you did very well on that group of questions. 
Now, I want to talk for a minute about subsequent events. As you probably know, a subsequent event is an event that occurs after the balance sheet date, after the balance sheet date, but before you issue the statements. Now, the important thing to remember is that there are two types of subsequent events. Type 1. With a type 1 subsequent event, the conditions did exist on the balance sheet date. Again, with a type 1 subsequent event, the conditions did exist on the balance sheet date. So I'll give you an example. Let's say the balance sheet date is December 31, year 1. And at December 31, year 1, the date of the balance sheet, the company was involved in a lawsuit. They thought it was reasonably possible that they would lose the lawsuit and settle for 100000 So because it was a reasonably possible contingency, they put a footnote on the year one statements. Now let's say that suit is settled February 9th of the year two, after the balance sheet date, but before they issue the statements. They settle it February 9th, year two, for $500,000. This is a type one subsequent event. The conditions did exist on the balance sheet date. You see why I say that? Why do I say the conditions did exist on the balance sheet date? Because wasn't this lawsuit pending on December 31, year one? This law lawsuit was pending. It was active December 31, year one. So here's the point. Because the conditions did exist on the balance sheet date, the company would have to go back and adjust the year one statements, put a $500,000 loss on the year one income statement and a $500,000 liability on the year one balance sheet. And of course, a footnote as well. Why? Why do they have to do that? Because the conditions did exist on the balance sheet date. Now, I know you're ahead of me with a type two subsequent event. Type two, the conditions did not exist on the balance sheet date. Once again, let's say the balance sheet date is December 31, year one. And on February 9th, year two, there's a fire. There's tremendous fire damage in your office building. You see the difference. That is a subsequent event where the conditions did not exist on the balance sheet date. That fire was not raging on December 31, year one. So because the conditions did not exist on the balance sheet date, you would not go back and adjust the year one statements. That would be a footnote, footnote only. Now here's the question. How would you now date your audit report? Let's say the original date of the audit report, before you found out about the subsequent event, was January 26th. All right, so the original date of your audit report was January 26th, but now this subsequent event has come to your attention, February 9th. Here's the problem. If now you just date your report, February 9th, the auditor is now taking responsibility for all subsequent events up to February 9th. So the way to get around that is you dual date your report. You're going to date your report January 26th, year two, except as to note X, which is as of February 9th. You dual date it. That's, that's the way around that problem. That's why, you dual date, that's why you dual date a report. So now the auditor's responsibility is limited to that one event if they dual date. That's the date of your audit report, January 26th, except as to note X, which is as of February 9th. Now the auditor's responsibility is just for that subsequent event. What if the auditor subsequently discovers facts that have a material effect on the financial statement after they re release their audit report? Now the auditor discovers facts. They subsequently discover facts that have a material effect on the year one statements you know, after they've issued their audit report. I mean, not that the, the auditor has no obligation to continue making inquiries. You know, after they, after they release their audit report, they don't have an obligation to do that. But what if information comes to their attention that has a material effect on the year one statements and you've already issued your audit report? Well, it, and if it has a material effect on the statements, you advise your client to issue revised financial statements and a new audit report. That's what you do. You have to, you have to advise your client to issue revised financial statements and a new audit report. What if the client refuses? If the client refuses, then you have to notify the client that the audit report must no longer be associated with those statements. You notify the client that, that your audit report can no longer be associated with those statements. You also notify regulatory agencies, and you also notify persons that are known to be relying on the statements.
I want to talk about a group audit for a moment. When you audit a group of financial statements, no, parent and sub is what I'm talking about. When you audit a group of financial statements, a parent and sub, it's possible that one of the components of the group, one of the subsidiaries, maybe the subsidiary is being audited by their own auditor. They're being audited by what we, refer, we, what we refer to as the component auditor. All right, so you're auditing a group of financial statements. It's parent and sub. The sub is being audited by a component auditor. So that component auditor is not part of the group engagement team. It, that group auditor, that component auditor, is not part of the group engagement team. Now, assuming that the component auditor, the subsidiary's auditor, you know, is independent, you know, you've determined they're independent, they're competent. Now, here's what the principal auditor, you know, for the group engagement team has to decide. The principal auditor, you know, with the group engagement team has to decide whether to assume responsibility for the work of the component auditor or divide responsibility. And if you look in your viewer's guide, you'll see what it means to the audit report if the principal auditor with the group engagement team decides to divide responsibility. If they decide to revide, revise responsibility, notice introductory paragraph is exactly the same. Management responsibility paragraph, exactly the same. But notice the auditor's responsibility paragraph. We did not audit the financial statements of XY company, a wholly owned subsidiary whose assets constitute X. You show the magnitude. These statements were audited by other auditors whose report has been furnished to us. You're clearly dividing responsibility. And then notice the opinion paragraph. In our opinion, based on our audit and the report of the other auditors, it's a clear division of responsibility. Now, if the principal auditor with the group engagement team decides to assume responsibility for the work of the component auditor. They just decide to assume the, the assumption of responsibility of the work of that component auditor. Then they just issue their, their standard opinion with no mention made of the component auditor. No reference to the component auditor's report because, because if they, you did start referencing the component auditor's report, that could be misinterpreted. You just issue your normal audit report without any reference whatsoever to the component auditor. Now, before I see you in the next class, make sure you do the four questions that I've assigned and get your answers. And as always, keep studying and don't fall behind. And I'll look to see you in the next class. Welcome back to our discussion on reporting issues. And I want to begin this class by going over the four questions that I assigned. First question says, on August 13th, the CPA obtained sufficient appropriate audit evidence to support an opinion on a client's financial statements for the year ended June 30th. So that would be the date of the audit report. Then on August 27th, an event came to the CPA's attention that should properly be disclosed by the entity, but the CPA decided not to dual date, not to dual date the audit report, and dated the report just August 27th. Under these circumstances, the CPA was taking responsibility for A, all subsequent events up to August 27th. If you don't dual date, if you now just date your report August 27th, then you are taking responsibility for all subsequent events up until that date. Next, zero corporations suffered a loss that would have a material effect on its financial statements on an uncollectible trade account receivable due to a customer's bankruptcy. This occurred suddenly because of a natural disaster. You know what this is. It's a type two subsequent event where the conditions did not exist on the balance sheet date. It's a natural disaster 10 days after zero's balance sheet date, but one month before the issuance of the statements in the auditor's report. Under these circumstances, how about the first column? The financial statements should be adjusted? No. It's not a type one, it's a type two subsequent event. Would be just disclosed 
in the current year financial statements. But no adjustment would be made. Next column, the event requires financial statement disclosure, disclosure, but no adjustment. Yes, we agree with that. Third column, the auditor's report should be modified because of a lack of consistency. This is not a consistency problem. It has nothing to do with consistency. Next, the auditor's responsibility paragraph of an auditor's report contains the following sentence. Sentence says, we did not audit the financial statements of EZ Inc., a wholly owned sub, which statements reflect total assets and revenues constituting 27% and 29% respectively of the related consolidated totals. Those statements were audited by other auditors. You know what this is? It's a division of responsibility. Answer A. That's really, that's really the choice that has to be made when there's a component auditor. Does the principal auditor, the group engagement team, assume responsibility for the work of the other auditors or divide responsibility? That paragraph indicates a division of responsibility. Pell CPA decides to serve as the principal auditor in the audit of the financial statements of Tech Consolidated Inc. Smith CPA audits one of the subsidiaries. In which situation would Pell make reference to Smith's audit? Now, just as a general matter, when are you going to make reference to the work of the other auditor? When you divide responsibility. So the first statement says, Pell reviews Smith's work papers and assumes responsibility. Well, if Pell assumes responsibility for Smith's work, no mention will be made. There'll be no reference to Smith's work at all. Pell is assuming responsibility for the work of Smith. How about number two? Pell is unable to review Smith's work papers, so you doubt very strongly they'd assume responsibility without being able to look at the work papers. However, Pell's inquiries indicate that Smith has an excellent reputation, professional competence, and integrity. Here is where you would divide responsibility, and there would be a, re a reference to Smith's audit. Answer B number two only. What do we do if, you want to, if we want to update an opinion? Let's say we're auditing year two. Now, we also audited year one, and in year one, we gave a qualified opinion. And now the client has restated the year one statements, and a qualified opinion is no longer appropriate. We really should change that opinion for year one from qualified to unmodified. Well, the way this is this is handled when, just remember, anytime there's a change in opinion, remember that's the case that's either an emphasis of matter paragraph or an other matter paragraph. It's up to the judgment of the auditor. And again, anytime there's a, you want to change an opinion like this. And in that case, depending on the importance that the auditor places on, on this, it can either be an emphasis of matter paragraph or other matter, but it has to be one or the other. So whatever paragraph it is, you will disclose the date of the, the previous report, the type of previous report was qualified, the reason why it was qualified, the change that has occurred, and a statement that the opinion is now different than the one expressed in the previous audit report. What if the prior period was audited by what, what we call a predecessor auditor. You're auditing year two, and year one was audited by a predecessor auditor. Well, the predecessor auditor can simply reissue their audit report. If you're auditing year two, and year one was audited by what is called a predecessor auditor, and the client wants to show comparative financial statements, they want to show the year two statements in comparison to year one statements, the predecessor auditor can reissue their audit report, assuming it's still appropriate. Now, the predecessor auditor, you know, the year one auditor, would have some obligations. The predecessor auditor has the obligation to read the current financial statements, compare the current financial statements with the prior year, and, you know, see if there's been any major changes. The predecessor auditor has to obtain a letter of representation 
from us. We're called the successor auditor. So the year one audit, excuse me, yeah, the, the year one auditor, the predecessor auditor, has to obtain a letter of representation from the year two auditor, the successor auditor. And the success, the, that letter of representation, in that letter of representation, the successor auditor has to state whether, you know, the current audit revealed any matters that in the successor auditor's opinion would have a material effect on the year one statements or should be disclosed in the year one statements. Also, the predecessor auditor has to obtain a management representation letter, a letter of representation from management stating if any previous representations back in year one would have to be modified, whether there's been any subsequent events that require adjusting the year one statements or should have been disclosed in year one. Now, if there are no changes to that original report, no changes to the year one audit report, then, you know, if it's unrevised, then that audit report would be issued with its original report date. If it is revised, you would dual date. That's simply how it's handled. If the original audit report, the year one audit report, the predecessor's report is issued as is, it's not revised in any way, it would just be dated using the original date of the report. If it is revised, you would dual date. Now, what if the predecessor auditor's report is not going to be reissued? If the predecessor auditor's report is not going to be reissued, then it's a required other matter paragraph. There would be a required other matter paragraph in the year two audit report saying that the financial statements of the prior period were audited by a predecessor auditor, not named. The type of opinion that was issued, if there were any modifications, why there were modifications, the nature of any emphasis of matter paragraph, and also the date of the predecessor auditor's report. What if the prior period, you know, we're the year two auditors. What if year one was not audited? What if year one was reviewed or compiled? It's a different level of service. So again, we're auditing year two. Turns out year one was not audited. It was reviewed or compiled, a very different level of service. And let's say that the prior year report is not going to be reissued. Well, that would be a required other matter paragraph you'd have to disclose in the other matter paragraph, which is required, the service that was performed in the prior period, the date of the prior period report, describe any material modifications in that report, state that this service, whether it's a review or a compilation, is less in scope than an audit and not, and does not provide a, a basis for an opinion. You state that that it's a different level of service, and it does not provide a basis for an opinion. What if the year one statements were not reviewed, compiled, or audited? Well, if the year one statements, if the prior year statements were not reviewed, compiled, or audited, then that would be a required other matter paragraph, and you'd have to state that the prior year was not audited, reviewed, or compiled. The financial statements of that prior year would have to be clearly marked, you know, not audited, reviewed, or compiled. And you would state in that other matter paragraph that the auditor is not assuming any responsibility for those statements. You state that in your other matter paragraph, that you as a CPA are not assuming any responsibility for that prior period. Let's talk about other information. Other information in a, in a document that contains the audited financial statements. You know, for example, sometimes, or almost always, audited financial statements would be included in the annual report to shareholders. That's what happens. That the audited financial statements would simply be included in the annual report to shareholders. So there's other information. Now, the auditor is not required to determine if the other information is properly stated. That's not a requirement for the auditor. The auditor does have some obligations, though. The auditor is obligated to read the other information, determine if there's any material inconsistency 
By the way, I'm not talking about the website or press releases. It's not what we're talking about. This is, again, other information presented alongside the audited financial statements. What if the auditor does identify a material inconsistency in the other information? Well, if the financial statements need revision, you know, the auditor has identified a material inconsistency you know, with the financial statements in that other information. And if the financial statements need revision and management will not do it, well, then the auditor would have to modify their opinion. What if the other information needs revision and management refuses? Well, you would communicate with those in charge of governance and you would have to add a required other matter paragraph you know, describing the inconsistency. You could also withhold the audit report. You could withdraw, you know, if there was fraud involved, the statements were misleading. And in the other matter paragraph, the auditor can disclaim an opinion on the other information. Let's talk about supplementary information. Supplementary information is information outside the basic financial statements that would be presented in a document that includes the audited financial statements. And it is possible that the auditor could be engaged to report on the supplementary information in relation to the financial statements as a whole. That's possible, where you as an auditor can be engaged to report on supplementary information in relation to the financial statements taken as a whole. Here would be the objectives. If the auditor is engaged to report on supplementary information, they have two objectives. Number one, evaluate the presentation of the supplementary information in relation to the financial statements, and number two, report whether or not the supplementary information is fairly stated you know, in, in relation to the financial statements. And by the way, the, in order to do this report on supplementary information, the financial statements must have been audited by the auditor, and there can't have been an adverse opinion or a disclaimer of opinion. Also, the auditor would require a letter of a uh, 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 management representation letter regarding supplementary information. And management must include the audit report on supplementary information in any document that contains the supplementary information and the audited financial statements. That, that has to be a requirement, that management will include the audit report on supplementary information Anytime they have a document that contains supplementary information. All right, so what are the audit procedures? If you're going to do a report on supplementary information, what are your basic audit steps? Well, you would first inquire of management the purpose of the supplementary information and any significant assumptions that they made. You would, you'd you would obtain that management representation letter about supplementary information. You would evaluate the form and the content of supplementary information with the established criteria. You would reconcile the supplementary information to the audited financial statements, and then finally, evaluate the supplementary information for completeness and appropriateness. Those are your basic five steps. Again, inquire of management, the purpose of the supplementary information, and any assumptions that were made. Two, obtain a management representation letter regarding supplementary information. Three, evaluate the form and the content of supplementary information with established criteria. Four, reconcile the supplementary information to the audited financial statements, and five, evaluate the supplementary information for completeness and appropriateness. Now, this report on supplementary information can either be a separate report, can be a separate report, or an other matter paragraph. What if there's a material misstatement in the supplementary information and management refuses to revise it? Well, then you would... As, a, as the auditor, you would modify your opinion on the supplementary information. And if it is a separate report, you could withhold the report. Now, there could be required supplementary information. If supplementary information is required, the auditor is required to perform limited, limited audit procedures. They have to inquire of management about supplementary information and determine if it was prepared 
in, in prepared using established criteria or guidelines consistent with the financial statements and obtain a management representation letter about the required supplementary information. Now remember, the auditor is not required to audit supplementary information. Auditor is not required to audit required supplementary information. But they have to perform limited procedures. And there would be a required other matter paragraph. The other matter paragraph would state that required supplementary information has been included or omitted if it were omitted. That the auditor did apply the required procedures. You would disclose any material departures from the established criteria. You would state any unresolved problems or doubts. And the auditor may disclaim on the required supplementary information. Now, if the auditor is engaged to report on required supplementary information, that's possible. If the auditor actually has an engagement to report on required supplementary information, you follow the same steps we just went over, those same five steps, inquire of management, the purpose of the supplementary information and the assumptions that are made, obtain a written man management representation letter regarding the supplementary information, evaluate the form and the content of supplementary, supplementary information in relation to the established criteria, reconcile the sup supplementary information to the financial statements, and evaluate the supplementary information for completeness and appropriateness. And once again, this can be reported as either a separate report or an other matter paragraph. And if there are material misstatements in the supplementary information and management refuses to revise the supplementary information, then the auditor would modify the report. It was an engagement. They could modify the report on supplementary information and even withhold the report if it's a separate report. They say after issuing an auditor's report, an auditor has no obligation to make continuing inquiry, continuing inquiry concerning audited financial statements. That's true. The audit report is issued. The auditor has no obligation to continue making inquiries unless, how about A, information about a material transaction that occurred just after the auditor's report was issued is deemed to be reliable. Well, that's... That's next year's transaction. Remember, the, this, this question started out after issuing the audit, auditor's report. This is not a subsequent event. Remember, a subsequent event is an event that occurs after the balance sheet date, but before we issue the statements. Here, we've issued the statements. We don't have any obligation for that material transaction. It's next year's transaction. B, a final resolution is made of a contingent liability that had been fully disclosed in the financial statements. Fine. No, that's next year's activity. We've issued the statements. We've issued the audit report. D, an event occurs just after the auditor's report was issued that affects the ability to continue as a going concern. Well, that will have to be disclosed in next year's audit report. Now, the answer is C. If information that existed at the report date, now there's information that existed at the report date, comes to the auditor's attention and could affect the auditor's report, that's very, very different. You, have to, you may have to notify the client that this audit, re audit report can no longer be associated with those financial statements and tell the client they have to issue revised financial statements with a, re with a revised audit report. Then there is an obligation. Answer C. Next, the predecessor auditor who is satisfied after properly communicating with the successor auditor has reissued their audit report because the audit client desires comparative statements. The predecessor's auditor's report should make, notice A, B, and C, reference to the work of the successor auditor. That's never going to happen. The predecessor auditor's report is never going to make a reference to the successor auditor, ever. The answer, D, makes, the answer is D, makes no reference to the report of the work of the successor auditor. It's that simple. Next, a former client requests a predecessor auditor to reissue an audit report on a prior period's financial statements. The financial statements are not restated and the report is not revised. Then what date should the predecessor auditor use in the reissued report? Answer A, the original date of the report. 
the date that the prior the date of the prior period report. It's that simple. If 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 it was revised, you would dual date. If that prior report is going to be revised for any reason, you would dual date. But this was not revised. Next, an auditor concludes that there is a material inconsistency in the other information in an annual report to shareholders that also contains audited financial statements. The auditor believes that the financial statements do not require revision, but the client is unwilling to revise or eliminate the material inconsistency in the other information. Under these circumstances, what action would the auditor most likely take? A says, consider the matter closed. You know, that's not it. B says, issue an except for qualified opinion. No, the financial statements, as far as we know, are fairly stated here. C says, disclaim an opinion on the financial statements. It's not going to affect your opinion on the financial statements. The answer is D. You'd revise the auditor's report to include a required other matter paragraph describing the material inconsistency. That's what would happen. You'd simply have that required other matter paragraph that would describe, describe the inconsistency. Next, what is an auditor's responsibility for supplementary information, such as the disclosure of pension information, which is outside the basic financial statements, but is required by the GASB? So we're talking about required supplementary information. What is the auditor's responsibility? A says the auditor should apply substantive tests. No, limited audit procedures, not substantive tests. B says the auditor should apply certain limited procedures to the supplementary information and include an other matter paragraph in the audit report to refer to the required supplementary information. Yes. Answer B. And then finally, one more. Under which of the following circumstances would the expression of a disclaimer of opinion be appropriate? Be, excuse me, inappropriate. So when is a disclaimer inappropriate? A, the auditor is unable to obtain audited financial statements of a sub, of an investee. Well, that's a scope limitation. And if it were very material, if it were pervasive, then a disclaimer would be appropriate, not inappropriate. C says the company failed to make account of their physical inventory during the year. Auditor was unable to apply alternative procedures to verify inventory quantity. That's a scope limitation. If it's very material, if it's pervasive, a disclaimer would be appropriate. D says management refuses to allow the auditor to have access to the company's canceled checks and bank statements. It's a scope limitation. If it were very material, if it were pervasive, it, a disclaimer would be appropriate. But answer B, management does not provide reasonable justification for a change in principle. That's a gap violation. And a gap violation is either going to be a qualified opinion for a material gap problem, or if it's very material, if it's pervasive, adverse. No, a disclaimer would be inappropriate for answer B. Keep studying. Don't fall behind. And I look to see you in the next class. Welcome back. In this class, we're going to discuss fraud committed by clients and non-compliance with laws and regulations committed by clients. Let's begin with fraud. You know that the objective of an audit is to provide reasonable assurance, reasonable assurance, that the financial statements are free of material misstatement. Reasonable assurance that the financial statements are free of errors and fraud. That's our objective in an audit. But of course, there's an enormous difference between errors and fraud because fraud is intentional. Fraud, by definition, is intentional deception of the users of financial information. Intentional deception of the users of financial information. We know that management is responsible for the detection and the prevention of fraud. The auditor is responsible to provide reasonable assurance that the financial statements are free of errors and fraud. And the auditor has to be aware of the risk of fraud throughout the audit, starting with the planning phase. When you start an audit, there should be no preconceived notions 
about management's integrity. In other words, the auditor at the beginning of an audit should have a high degree of skepticism. The audit team should discuss how and where fraud could occur at every client on every audit. You should be aware of the risk factors that might indicate possible fraud. And of course, the basic rule of thumb is change equals risk. Anytime there's a change, risk goes up. So you look for a high turnover in the company or in a department. You know, when there's a lot of new employees coming and going, you know, are employees really aware about what's, what's going on? It's easier to commit fraud. So look for a high turnover in the company or in a department. That's a risk factor. That's a red flag. New technology, a downturn in the economy. So employees are tempted to, to take shortcuts. Aggressive earnings projections, same thing. Same thing. If there are aggressive earnings projections, employees might be tempted to take shortcuts. Look, look out for negative cash flows. Offshore holding companies, you know, increased competition. Again, the, the general rule is change equals risk. When something changes, the risk of errors and fraud rises. Now, when we do an audit, we have to assess control risk. And the auditor should assess control risk in light of the risk of fraud. The auditor should include unpredictable audit tests in the audit. In other words, don't do the same audit tests every year. And the auditor should test situations where management can override controls. In other words, the auditor should examine journal entries, adjustments where management has overridden the controls. And of course, remember, the auditor is required to document the consideration of risk, of fraud, in the work papers. Now, generally, there are two types of fraud. First, there's fraudulent financial reporting. What do we mean by fraudulent financial reporting? This is intentional deception of the users of financial information. In other words, material mistakes or omissions in the financial statements to deceive the users. That's called fraudulent financial reporting. Material mistakes or omissions in the financial statements to meant to deceive the users. Now, if the auditor suspects fraudulent financial reporting, the auditor should do extensive substantive testing, extensive substantive testing. The other category of fraud is asset misappropriation, in other words, theft. And if the auditor suspects asset misappropriation or theft, the auditor should do more tests of controls, especially on assets that have a high degree of inherent risk. You know what inherent risk is? The risk that a given account by its very nature could be subject to fraud. So if the auditor suspects asset misappropriation, the auditor should do much more testing of controls especially on assets with a high degree of inherent risk. And also, the auditor should do targeted analytical procedures. Also, it's important to remember that an audit done under U.S. generally accepted auditing standards may not detect fraud. You know that. That's, that's why we have detection risk. You know what detection risk is. It's the risk that the auditor will fail to detect errors and fraud that do in fact exist. That's why we have audit risk, ultimately. The risk that we give an unmodified opinion, a clean opinion, and yet the financial statements are materially misstated. So an audit done under generally accepted auditing standards may not detect fraud. We have to accept that. Now, if fraud does exist, if fraud does exist, the auditor has to inform the appropriate level of management, and those in charge of governance. Even if it's insignificant. Remember, fraud is always a, a, a big deal, always. So 
even if it's it's immaterial, insignificant. If there's fraud, the auditor has to inform the appropriate level of management and those in charge of governance. If senior management is involved with the fraud or the financial statements are materially misstated, well, of course, the auditor should immediately inform those in charge with governance and consult legal counsel about any obligations to inform third parties. Let's talk about illegal acts. When I say illegal acts, I'm talking about non-compliance with laws and regulations by the client. Non-compliance with laws and regulations by an act of omission or commission by the entity. Could be intentional or unintentional. Committed in the name of the entity or on behalf of the entity by those in charge of governance, by management, by employees. And of course, the problem with non-compliance with laws and regulations is that it can result in fines or significant litigation. The, the, the client is responsible, management is responsible for ensuring that the entity complies with all laws and regulations. The auditor is responsible to provide reasonable assurance that there has been no non-compliance with laws and regu regulations that have a direct material effect on the financial statements. Now, non-compliance with laws and regulations that have an indirect effect on the financial statements, like some obscure environmental regulation. It's beyond the scope of the audit. Now, if the auditor does discover non-compliance with laws and regulations that have a material effect on the financial statements. The auditor has to consider the effect on the internal control environment, management integrity. The auditor has to consider whether disclosures have been complete, whether the audit report should be modified as a qualified opinion, an adverse opinion. And of course, if the client won't take corrective action, the auditor should withdraw. Keep studying. I'll look to see you in the next class. Now, as you probably know, you really begin your study of reporting issues by studying and memorizing the standard unmodified opinion. And hopefully, you already had our class on the unmodified opinion, but just to start us off, to get us in the mood, to get us in the right frame of mind, I want to go over the standard unmodified opinion. And in fact, I want to start with this question. How does a client earn an unmodified opinion? How does a client deserve an unmodified opinion? Well, basically, there are six requirements. If your client meets six requirements, your client gets an unmodified opinion, a clean opinion. Number one, there can't be any significant departures from U.S. GAAP or whatever the appropriate, whatever the applicable financial reporting framework is that you're testing, IFRS, whatever it might be. But that's number one. There can't be any significant departures from U.S. GAAP. In this class, we'll assume that the framework is U.S. GAAP. Number two. U.S. GAAP, or the framework, must have been consistently applied between accounting periods. Number three, there must be adequate and complete disclosures. Number four, there can't be any significant uncertainties. No significant uncertainties. Number five, no significant scope limitations. And number six, no significant going concern problems. If your client meets those six requirements, the client gets a clean opinion, an unmodified opinion. Now, when you break those down, if you look at those six requirements, if you look at the first three, no significant departures from U.S. GAAP, or whatever the framework is. Number two, U.S. GAAP, or the framework, must have been consistently applied. Number three, adequate and complete disclosures. Aren't we really saying in the first three, that there can't be any problem with the financial statements. It's really that simple. 
There can't be any problem with the financial statements. And if you look at the last three, no significant uncertainties, no significant scope limitations, no significant going concern problems. Aren't we saying in the last three, no problems with the audit? That's really what it boils down to. If there are no problems with the financial statements, no problems with the audit, the client gets a clean opinion, an unmodified opinion. So let's take a quick look at a standard unmodified opinion. In the viewer guide, you'll see an example of the standard unmodified opinion. Notice the heading, independent auditor's report. You know this. If an auditor, if a CPA is going to provide any kind of assurance on financial information of any kind, the CPA has to be independent. Independent in fact, independent in appearance. So right in the title, independent auditor's report. And remember, our goal in an audit is to provide reasonably positive assurance, reasonably positive assurance that the financial statements are free of material misstatement, reasonably positive assurance that the financial statements are free of errors and fraud. That's what it comes down to. And as I say, if the CPA is going to provide any type of assurance on financial information, the CPA has to be independent. So there it is, right in the title, independent auditor's report. It's addressed to the company, it's addressed to the board of directors, the shareholders, but never management, of course. We start with the introductory paragraph. We have audited. We make it very clear what we've done. This is not a review. This is not a compilation. We have audited the accompanying financial statements of XYZ Company, which comprise the balance sheet as of December 31, year one, and the related statements of income, changes in stockholders' equity, and cash flows for the years that ended, and the related notes to the financial statements. That's the introductory paragraph. Then there's the management responsibility paragraph. We're going to make it very clear what management is responsible for, what the CPA, what the auditor is responsible for. So the next paragraph is the management responsibility paragraph. Management is responsible for the preparation and fair presentation of these financial statements in accordance with accounting principles generally accepted in the United States of America. This includes the design, implementation, and maintenance of internal control relevant to the preparation and fair presentation of financial statements that are free from material misstatement, whether due to fraud or error. Then next, of course, is the auditor's responsibility paragraph. Our responsibility is to express an opinion on these financial statements based on our audit. We conducted our audit in accordance with auditing standards generally accepted in the United States of America. Those standards require that we plan and perform the audit to obtain reasonable assurance about whether the financial statements are free from material misstatement. An audit in involves performing procedures to obtain audit evidence about the amounts and disclosures in the financial statements. The procedures selected depend on the auditor's judgment, including the assessment of the risks of material misstatement of the financial statements, whether due to fraud or error. In making those risk assessments, the auditor considers internal control relevant to the entity's preparation and fair presentation of the financial statements in order to design audit procedures that are appropriate in the circumstances, but not for the purpose of expressing an opinion on the effectiveness of the entity's internal control. Accordingly, we express no such opinion. An audit also includes evaluating the appropriateness of accounting policies used and the reasonableness of significant accounting estimates made by management, as well as evaluating the overall presentation of the financial statements. We believe that the audit evidence we have obtained is sufficient and appropriate to provide a basis for our audit opinion. And then finally, the opinion paragraph itself. In our opinion, the financial statements referred to above present fairly. Remember, this is a clean opinion. This is an unmodified opinion. Present fairly in all material respects the financial position of XYZ Company as of December 31, year one, and the results of its operations and its cash flows for the year then ended in accordance with accounting principles generally accepted in the United States of America. The report is dated no earlier than the date on which the auditor has obtained sufficient appropriate evidence on which to base the audit opinion. Now, after the opinion paragraph, the auditor may add an emphasis of matter paragraph to emphasize information 
that's fundamental to the user's understanding of the financial statements. That's what the auditor is doing. When the auditor adds an emphasis of matter paragraph, this is information that's properly presented and disclosed in the financial statements, but the auditor wants to emphasize the information to aid the user's understanding of the financial statements. Now, after the opinion paragraph and any emphasis of matter paragraph, the auditor may add an other matter paragraph. An other matter paragraph is to aid the user's understanding of the audit report or the auditor's responsibility. Now, as we said, if the client meets six requirements, the client gets a clean opinion. The client gets an unmodified opinion. And as we broke it down, the first three requirements, we're saying there's no problem with the financial statements. The last three requirements, we're saying there's no problem with the audit. That's what it comes down to. When there's no problem with the financial statements, when there's no problem with the audit, client gets a clean opinion. Client gets an unmodified opinion. But what if there is a problem with the financial statements? Well, I think you know. If there is a significant departure from U.S. GAAP, if U.S. GAAP has not been consistently applied, if disclosures are not adequate and complete, if there is a GAAP disclosure problem, you know what to do. If there's a material GAAP or disclosure problem, the client gets an except for qualified opinion. If it's very material, if there's a very material GAAP or disclosure problem, it's, per it's pervasive, client gets an adverse opinion. Really very simple. If there's a material gap or disclosure problem, client gets an except for qualified opinion. Very material, pervasive, adverse. Now what if there's a problem with the audit? You know, what if there is a, a scope problem? What if there is a going concern problem? What if, the, what if there is a problem with the audit? Well, let's start with a scope problem. You know, the auditor is not able to gather evidence. There's unavailability of data. If there's a material scope problem, the client gets an except for qualified opinion. If it's very material, a very material scope problem, pervasive, the auditor has to disclaim an opinion. How about a going concern problem? Well, if there's a material going concern problem, the client does get an unmodified opinion. Again, a material going concern problem means that the client would get an unmodified opinion, but there would be a required emphasis of matter paragraph with that language we know so well, raising substantial doubt about the entity's ability to continue as a going concern. Now, let's talk about uncertainties. If there's an uncertainty that causes the financial statements to be materially misstated, that's possible. If there's an uncertainty that would cause the financial statements to be materially, un materially misstated, well, then that's a, that's a gap disclosure problem. So if it's material, and except for qualified opinion. If it's very material, if it's pervasive, adverse opinion. But what if there's an uncertainty because the auditor is not able to gather enough evidence? If there's an uncertainty because the auditor is not able to gather enough evidence, well, then that's a scope problem, isn't it? You're right back to basically a scope problem. So if it's material, except for qualified opinion. If it's very material, if it's pervasive, the auditor would have to disclaim an opinion. Now, once you're comfortable with the unmodified opinion, you have the unmodified opinion firmly in your mind, you're ready to move on to other reporting issues, and we'll get into other reporting issues in our next segment. We'll see you then. Welcome back. In this section, we're going to begin our discussion about engagements other than an audit of a complete set of financial statements under U.S. GAAP or IFRS or another general purpose framework. We're going to begin our discussion on reports on special purpose financial statements. Now, when you're talking about special purpose financial statements, there are four main areas. Number one, there would be an audit of financial statements prepared in accordance with a special purpose framework. That's number one, an audit of financial statements prepared in accordance with a special purpose framework. Number two, 
There would be audits of a single financial statement and specified elements, accounts, or items of a financial statement. Number three would be reports on compliance with aspects of contractual agreements or regulatory requirements in connection with audited financial statements. And then number four would be reports on summary financial statements. Now we're going to begin with number one because it is the most heavily tested of those four areas. Remember, number one would be audits of financial statements prepared in accordance with a special purpose framework. There are five special purpose frameworks. Number one would be the cash basis of accounting. Number two would be the tax basis. Number three would be regulatory basis. Number four would be any other basis of accounting with a definite set of logical criteria applicable to all material items in the financial statements, like price level. Now those first four, cash basis, tax basis, regulatory basis, and any other basis, like price level, with a definite set of criteria, we normally refer to those first four as OCBOAs, O-C-B-O-A, other, comprehens other comprehensive bases of accounting, other than U.S. GAAP. Think of those first four as OCBOAs, other comprehensive bases of accounting, other than U.S. GAAP. And number five would be contractual basis. Now, if you look in your viewer's guide, you'll see an example of a report on financial statements prepared in accordance with the cash basis of accounting. Now, because you have studied and memorized the standard unmodified opinion, you're in a very good place now. Because once you have that down, now when you study an area like this, you can just focus in on the differences. And if you look in the, in the viewer guide, you'll see an example of this report, and the differences are underlined. Notice in the introductory paragraph, you can't use gap terms because this is not U.S. GAAP. This is a special purpose framework. This is the cash basis. So you don't say balance sheet. Notice we say a statement of assets and liabilities arising from cash transactions. You can't say balance sheet. That's a gap term. You can't say statement of income, changes in stockholders' equity, statement of cash flows. No, it's the related statement of revenues collected and expenses paid. Notice the management responsibility paragraph. Management is responsible for the preparation and fair presentation of these financial statements in accordance with the cash basis of accounting described in Note X. This involves determining that the cash basis of accounting is an acceptable basis for the preparation of the financial statements in the circumstances. Management is also responsible for the design, implementation, and maintenance. But then it's the same after that point. Notice the auditor's responsibility paragraph, unchanged. And then finally, the opinion paragraph. In our opinion, the financial statements referred to above present fairly. This is a clean opinion, an unmodified opinion. In all material respects, the assets and liabilities arising from cash transactions and its revenues collected and expenses paid in accordance with the cash basis of accounting described in note X. Notice once again, there can't be any gap terms. Now, after the opinion paragraph, now there would be a required emphasis of matter paragraph stating that the financial statements have been, have been prepared in accordance with a special purpose framework. It would refer to the note in the financial statements that describes the framework and states that the special purpose framework, the cash basis, is a basis of accounting other than U.S. GAAP. It's an OCBOA. Now, there would be a required other matter paragraph. Listen carefully now. There would be a required other matter paragraph that restricts use if the special purpose framework is regulatory basis, not intended for general use. Let me say that again. You would have a required other matter paragraph that restricts use of the report. If 
the special purpose, purpose, purpose framework is regulatory basis, not intended for general use because in that case it's restricted to the parties within the entity and the regulatory agency. If it's not intended for general use and it's regulatory basis, this report's going to be restricted to parties within you know, the client, within the entity, and also regulatory agencies. Also, if it's contractual basis, if the special pur purpose framework is contractual basis, the report's going to be limited to the parties in the contract. Now, keep in mind that even though a special purpose framework is being used here, we've done an audit. So, you know, what if there's a problem with the financial statements? You know, what if instead of a, a gap problem, what if there's an ACBOA problem? Well, you know what to do. If there's a problem with the financial statements, if it's material, a qualified opinion. If it's very material, if it's pervasive, adverse opinion. What if there's a problem with the audit? You know, all these issues arise again. What if there's a scope problem? Well, you know what to do. A material scope problem, a qualified opinion. If it's very material, if it's pervasive, disclaim. What if there's a going concern problem? If it's a material going concern problem, the client gets an unmodified opinion with a required emphasis of matter paragraph. If it's very material, if it's pervasive, Disclaim. And then one more. Time. How about uncertainties? Well, if there's an uncertainty that's causing the financial statements to be materially misstated, well, that's an OCPOA problem. So if it's material, qualified opinion. Very material, adverse. But if there's an uncertainty caused by the fact that the auditor is not able to obtain sufficient evidence, it's a scope problem. So if it's material, qualified opinion. If it's very material, disclaim. My only point is not to forget that we've done an audit here. Even though these are special purpose financial statements, they're using a special purpose framework. We have done an audit. Now, if you look in your viewer's guide, you'll see an example of an audit report done for financial statements that were prepared in accordance with the tax basis of accounting the basis of accounting they're using for tax purposes. And once again, the differences from the standard unmodified opinion are underlined. So you can focus right in on the differences. Once again, notice in the introductory paragraph, you can't use gap terms. In the management responsibility paragraph, we say that management is responsible for the preparation and fair presentation of these financial statements in accordance with the basis of accounting used for income tax purposes. The auditor's responsibility paragraph, unchanged. So you know that anyway. And then in the opinion paragraph, you can't use gap terms. And we're going to say that the statements are presented fairly in accordance with the basis of accounting used for income tax purposes described in note X. And notice the required emphasis of matter paragraph, stating that the financial statements have been prepared in accordance with a special purpose framework refers to the note in the financial statements that describe the framework and states that the special purpose framework is a basis of accounting other than U.S. GAAP. And then finally, you'll notice in your viewer's guide an example of an audit report done for financial statements that were prepared using a regulatory basis. And again, the, the differences are underlined. You know, introductory paragraph, notice you can't use GAAP terms, that makes sense. In the management responsibility paragraph, management is responsible for the preparation and fair presentation of these financial statements in accordance with the basis of accounting to comply with the requirements of the regulatory agency. The auditor's responsibility paragraph, again, is unchanged. And in the opinion paragraph, we're going to say the financial statements are presented fairly. This is a clean opinion, an unmodified opinion presented fairly in accordance with the financial reporting provisions of Section Y of Regulatory Z, whatever it is. Notice the required emphasis of matter paragraph because this is regulatory basis, not intended for general use. The required, the required other matter paragraph that restricts use because, again, it's regulatory basis. 
not intended for general use. And then finally, in your viewer's guide, you'll see an example of an audit report done on financial statements that were prepared under contractual basis. And you'll notice again the required, um, the, the required other matter paragraph that restricts use because this is going to be restricted to parties within the entity and parties to the contract. Welcome back. Let's look at these questions together. In the first question, it says, an auditor's report on financial statements prepared on the cash receipts and disbursements basis of accounting would include all of the following except. So they want to know what's not in this report. A says, a reference to the note in the financial statements that describes the cash receipts and disbursements basis. No, that is in the report. That's not the answer. C says, an opinion as to whether the financial statements are presented fairly in conformity, in conformity with the cash receipts and disbursements basis. Now, that, of course, is in the report. We've done an audit. We're expressing an opinion. D says a statement that the audit was conducted in accordance with generally accepted auditing standards. We know the auditor's responsibility paragraph is unchanged. That would be there. But answer B is not there. A statement that the cash receipts and disbursements basis of accounting is not a comprehensive basis of accounting. No, there's a statement that it is. Right? There's a required emphasis of matter paragraph that is required to say that it is an other comprehensive basis of accounting other than U.S. GAAP. So answer B would not be in the report. Next question. When an auditor reports on financial statements prepared in an, on an entity's income tax basis, the auditor's report should, A says, disclaim an opinion on whether the statements were examined in accordance with generally accepted auditing standards. You know, that's not true. We've done an audit. The auditor's responsibility paragraph is unchanged. B says, not express an opinion on whether the statements are presented in conformity with the comprehensive basis of accounting. No, of course, we will express an opinion. We've done an audit. Our objective is to express an opinion. C says, include an explanation of how the results of operations differ from the cash receipts and disbursements basis of accounting. There's nothing like that in the report. Explaining how the re results of operations would differ. But answer D would be in the report. State that the basis of presentation is a comprehensive basis of accounting other than GAAP. Remember, that is the answer is D. What's going to be in that report is a required emphasis of matter paragraph that states that the financial statements were prepared in accordance with a special purpose framework and referring to the note in the financial statements that describes the framework and states specifically, answer D, that this special purpose framework is a comprehensive basis of accounting other than U.S. GAAP. No, that's there. Answer D. Next, which of the following titles would be considered suitable for financial statements that are presented or prepared on the cash basis? Well, you know, if you prepare the financial statements on the cash basis, you can't use gap terms. So that knocks out A, income statement, B, statement of operations, D, statement of cash flows. No, the answer is going to be C. We're going to refer to a statement of Revenues collected and expenses paid. Can't use any kind of gap terms. And then finally, an accountant who is not independent of a client is precluded from issuing. A says a report on consulting services. You don't need independence for that because you're not providing any assurance on financial information. B and C, compilations, which we'll be talking about later in this class, you're just compiling. You're not giving any kind of assurance on information, just compiling numbers that management gives you into financial statements. But you are precluded from answer D, issuing a special report on compliance with contractual agreements because you are providing assurance on financial information. So you are required to be independent. All right, let's continue on our discussion 
of special purpose financial statements. And the second special area in this topic would be an audit of a single financial statement or specified elements, accounts, or items within a financial statement. Now, of course, if you're auditing a single financial statement, that could be that you're auditing a balance sheet, you're auditing an income statement, you're auditing a statement of cash flows. If you're auditing a specified element, you could be auditing a schedule of pension expenses, a schedule of royalty income, profit sharing. Now, these engagements can be done as a separate engagement or in conjunction with an audit. Now, if you're doing one of these reports on a far-reaching element, you know, if you're doing a report on net income, if that's the specified element, that's a far-reaching element because it has such far-reaching implications to the entire financial statements. So anytime you're doing a report on a far-reaching element like net income, then it has to be done in conjunction with an audit. Has to be. Also, if you're auditing a specified element, you must also audit any interrelated items. So if you're auditing sales, you must also audit receivables. If you're auditing inventory, you must also audit payables. If you're auditing fixed assets, you must also audit depreciation. So anytime you're auditing a specified element, you must also audit any interrelated items. Interestingly, in international standards, in international auditing standards, you are not required to audit the interrelated items. But in generally accepted auditing standards, U.S. generally accepted auditing standards, you are required to audit any interrelated items. Now, this is important. Whether you are, whether you are auditing a single financial statement or a specified element, the auditor is required, required to obtain an understanding of the purpose for which the report is being prepared. The auditor is required to obtain an understanding of the intended users and required to understand the steps that were taken by management to determine the appropriate financial reporting framework in the, in the circumstances. Also, materiality is an issue. If you're auditing a single financial statement, you determine materiality in relation to that single financial statement. Not in, re not in relation to the complete set of financial statements. Let me say that again. In terms of materiality, if you're auditing a single financial statement, you're going to determine materiality in relation to that single financial statement, not in relation to the entire set of financial statements. If you're auditing a specified element, you determine materiality separately for each element. And of course, usually, an audit of a specified element is much more extensive then the audit would be for that element as part of a, an audit of a complete set of financial statements. Now, when you're auditing a complete set of financial statements and also auditing a single financial statement, and you're also auditing a specified element, so understand the circumstances. We're auditing the complete set of financial statements. We're also auditing a single financial statement. We're also auditing perhaps a specified element. You are required, you are required to issue a separate report. Now, you, have, you are required to issue a separate audit report with a separate opinion for each engagement. That's required, that you are required to issue a separate audit report with a separate opinion for each engagement. Now, can they be published together? They can be published together if you're issuing an unmodified opinion on the complete set of financial statements and the reports are differentiated. Again, the reports can be published together. If you're issuing an unmodified opinion on the complete set of financial statements and the reports are differentiated. Now, the report on a specified element, 
In that report on a specified element, you are required to have an other matter paragraph. I'm talking about the report on a specified element. You are required to have an other matter paragraph with the date of the audit opinion on the complete set of financial statements, the date of the auditor's report, and the type of the opinion. If you modify the opinion on the complete set of financial statements and it's relevant to the specified element, Again, if you're modifying the opinion on the complete set of financial statements and it's related, relevant to the specified element, then the auditor has to express an adverse opinion on the specified element, assuming the element would have a material effect on the financial statements. Let me say that again. If the auditor is going to express a modified opinion on the complete set of financial statements and it's relevant to the specified element, then the auditor has to express an adverse opinion on the specified element assuming it would have a material effect on the financial statements. If the auditor expresses a disclaimer of opinion on, I'm sorry, the auditor must express a disclaimer of opinion on the specified element when the auditor modifies the opinion on the complete set of financial statements due to a scope limitation. Again, the auditor is required to express a disclaimer of opinion on the specified element if the auditor is modifying the opinion on the complete set of financial statements due to a scope limitation. Now let's talk about a piecemeal opinion. This is very important. If the auditor expresses an adverse opinion or a disclaimer of opinion on the complete set of financial statements, understand the situation now. If the auditor has expressed an adverse opinion or a disclaimer of opinion on the complete set of financial statements, that precludes an unmodified opinion on a single financial statement because that would, that would contradict the adverse opinion. That would contradict the disclaimer. That's a piecemeal opinion. That's not allowed. So again, remember, if the auditor expresses an adverse opinion or a disclaimer of opinion on the complete set of financial statements, then that precludes the auditor expressing an unmodified opinion on a single financial statement. That would be a piecemeal opinion because that unmodified opinion on the single financial statement would contradict the adverse opinion or disclaimer. Stay with me. If the auditor expresses an adverse opinion or a disclaimer of opinion on the complete set of financial statements and the specified element is a far-reaching element, the auditor cannot express an unmodified opinion on the specified element if it's a far-reaching element like net income because that would contradict the adverse opinion, the disclaimer of opinion on the complete set of financial statements. Again, the, that would be a piecemeal opinion, would not be allowed. Now, if the specified element is not far-reaching, if it's not far-reaching and the auditor consider, considers it appropriate to express an unmodified opinion on the specified element, it's not far-reaching, that's okay. If the opinion on the specified element is not published with the opinion on the complete set of financial statements. Does not accompany the opinion on the complete set of financial statements. They'll let you do that. So again, if the specified element is not far-reaching, not far-reaching, and the auditor wants to express an unmodified opinion on the specified element, it's not far-reaching, that's okay. But that report cannot be published with the report on the complete set of financial statements and cannot accompany the report on the complete set of financial statements, but it is allowed. One more point. If there's an emphasis of matter paragraph or an other matter paragraph in the audit report on the complete set of financial statements and it's relevant to the single financial statement or the specified element, then you must also include the emphasis of matter paragraph or other matter paragraph in the report on the single financial statement or the specified element. One more time. If there's an emphasis of matter paragraph or an other matter paragraph in the audit report on the complete set of financial statements and it's relevant to the single financial statement or the specified element, then your report on the single financial statement or the specified element must also include that emphasis of matter or other matter paragraph. If you look in your viewer's guide, you'll see a report on a single financial statement. And it's, it's an unmodified opinion. And notice, look at the, again, once again, you, you know the 
standard unmodified opinion, like the back of your hand. So you want to focus in on the differences, which are underlined. If you notice in the introductory paragraph, we have audited the schedule of accounts receivable. In the management responsibility paragraph, management is responsible for the preparation and fair presentation of the schedule. So you do have to make little changes here. In the auditor's responsibility paragraph, our responsibility is to express an opinion on the schedule. And, of course, in the opinion paragraph, the schedule referred to above presents fairly. It's an unmodified opinion. And notice the required other matter paragraph, disclosing that we audited the complete set of financial statements, the date of the, the auditor's report, and the type of the opinion that was expressed. Now, the third special area in reports on special purpose financial statements would be a report on compliance with aspects of a contractual agreement or regulatory requirements in connection with audited financial statements. Now, the auditor's goal in this area is to express what is called negative assurance. Negative assurance, which means nothing came to the auditor's attention that would cause the auditor to believe that the entity failed to comply with the specific aspects of a contract of a contractual agreement or a regulatory requirement. So that's the goal of this engagement to express negative assurance. Negative assurance is okay if the auditor has not identified any instances of non-compliance, of course. So during the audit, the auditor can't have noted any instances of non-compliance. The auditor must have expressed either an unmodified or a qualified opinion on the financial statements. Notice not adverse or a disclaimer. So the auditor must have expressed either an unmodified or a qualified opinion on the financial statements. And the, the other requirement is that the, the covenants in the contract or the regulatory requirements have been subjected to audit procedures as part of the financial statement audit. So you do have to apply procedures to the aspects of the, of the contractual agreement or to the regulatory requirements as part of the audit. Now, what if the auditor expresses an adverse opinion or a disclaimer of opinion on the financial statements? Well, if the auditor expresses an adverse opinion or a disclaimer of opinion on the financial statements, a report on compliance can only be issued if, they've, if, if the auditor has identified instances of non-compliance. Notice that. So if the auditor expresses an adverse opinion or a disclaimer of opinion on the complete set of financial statements, now there'll only be a report on compliance when the auditor has identified instances of non-compliance. Now, if the auditor does identify instances of non-compliance, the report has to I identify and describe those instances of non-compliance. Now, this report on compliance with contractual agreements or regulatory requirements can either be done as a separate report. If it's done as a separate report, you know, there'll be an other matter paragraph that restricts use. You know, why are you restricting use? Well, you're restricting use to, if it's regulatory requirements, you're restricting use to the entity and, you know, regulatory agencies. If it's contractual requirements, then you're restricting use to the entity and parties to the contract. So this report on compliance can either be a separate report or it can just be included in the auditor's report on the complete set of financial statements with a, re with a required other matter paragraph. The other matter paragraph would, you know, give the negative assurance and restrict use. And then the final area in special purpose financial statements would be a report on summary financial statements. Now, a report on summary financial statements must be done in conjunction with an audit. It's required to have been done in conjunction with an audit. And 
the auditor, in this case, is either going to issue an unmodified opinion or an adverse opinion. Those are the only two choices. It's either going to be unmodified or adverse. Unmodified means that the summary is consistent in all material respects with the audited financial statements. That's what an unmodified opinion would mean in this context, that the summary is consistent in all material respects with the audited financial statements. So that's, that would be unmodified. The other choice would be adverse, saying that the summary is not consistent. The summary is not consistent with the audited financial statements and management has, has refused to make any necessary changes, basically, is what that means. Now, one more point. If the auditor is going to express an adverse opinion or a dis disclaimer of opinion on the financial statements, the complete set of financial statements, well, then they, they withdraw from this engagement. You don't express an opinion on the summary. One more time. If the auditor is going to express an adverse opinion or a disclaimer of opinion on the complete set of financial statements, well, then you withdraw from this engagement. You do not do a report on the summary of the financial statements. You do not. Welcome back. In this session, we're going to talk about reporting on prospective financial statements. And of course, when we say prospective financial statements, we're talking about forecasts or projections. Let's start with some definitions. A forecast is what? A forecast is, to the best of our client's knowledge and belief, what will be our client's expected financial position in the future. That's a forecast. To the best of our client's knowledge and belief, what will be our client's expected financial position in the future. That's a forecast. It's a general use statement. And it could take the form of actual financial statements or simply a report. A projection is what? Given one or more hypothetical assumptions, what will be our client's financial position in the future? That's a projection. Given one or more hypothetical assumptions, what will be our client's financial position in the future? A projection is a limited use report. Now, a CPA has three possible associations with forecasts and projections. Number one, the CPA could do an examination. Now, an examination is very similar to an audit, but you're not examining historical data. You're examining prospective information, but it's very similar to an audit. And the objective of an examination is for the auditor to express an opinion. And if the auditor expresses an unmodified opinion with an examination, what does that mean? An unmodified opinion would mean the financial statements, the forecast, the projection conforms with guidelines established by the AICPA for forecasts and projections. That's what an unmodified opinion would mean in this, would mean in this context. So if a CPA issues an unmodified opinion on a forecast or a projection, it's saying that the financial statements do conform with the guidelines established by the AICPA for forecasts and projections. Or it could be a qualified opinion. Or it could be an adverse opinion. But the objective of an examination, like an audit, is to express an opinion. A second possibility with forecasts and projections is for the CPA to do a compilation. And of course, you know what a compilation means. In this particular, in, in, in the case of a compilation, the CPA is just compiling, not giving any assurance whatsoever. Just compiling, presenting information supplied by the management into the form of, for, of a forecast or a projection. So of course, for a compilation, independence would not be required because no assurance is going to be given and the compilation report has to state an examination was not done. The compilation report would state a compilation was not done. They're disclaiming any opinion. And then the third possibility with forecast and projection would be agreed upon procedures. 
the goal of agreed upon procedures is for the CPA to apply the procedures and present the findings. That's what happens with agreed upon procedures. The CPA applies the procedures and presents the findings. Now, in all three cases, whether it's an examination or a compilation or agreed upon procedures, the, re the report has to state that the results may not be achieved. Again, whether it's a, an examination, a compilation, or agreed upon, or agreed upon procedure report. The report has to state that the results may not be achieved and that the CPA has no updating responsibility. And I want you to be aware that reporting on prospective financial statements is an example of an attestation engagement. This is an attestation engagement. And let's be more precise. What is an attestation engagement? Anytime. The CPA is providing a written conclusion about an assertion that is the responsibility of another party. Let me say that again. An attestation engagement is an engagement where the CPA is providing a written conclusion on an assertion that is res the responsibility of another party. We always call that the responsible party. And for attestation engagements, the CPA has to follow the attestation standards. And we'll get into the attestation standards in more detail in our next session. I'll see you then. Welcome back. As we said in our last session, an attestation engagement is an engagement where a CPA is asked to provide a written conclusion about an assertion that is the responsibility of another party, called the responsible party. And an attestation engagement could be an examination. We know an examination is very similar to an audit. The objective of an examination is to express an opinion. It could be unmodified, could be qualified, could be adverse. And it, an examination can be on prospective financial information like a projection, a forecast. It could be on management's written assertion about the effectiveness of internal control. It could be on management discussion and analysis. Another possibility for an attestation engagement would be a review. Now, when a review is done as an attestation engagement, the objective is for the CPA to express what is called negative assurance. Notice, not limited assurance, negative assurance. Negative assurance means nothing came, to our, nothing came to our attention that would cause us to believe that the subject matter is not presented in all material respects in conformity with the criteria. That's the objective of, of a review done as an attestation engagement to express negative assurance. Again, not limited assurance, negative assurance. Nothing came to our attention which would cause us to believe that the subject matter is not presented in all material respects in conformity with the criteria. And then one final possibility would be agreed upon procedures. When the CPA does an agreed upon procedures engagement, the CPA is not expressing an opinion, not expressing negative assurance, basically in an agreed upon procedures engagement, the CPA is listing the procedures that were performed and presenting the CPA's findings. Now, when a CPA takes on an attestation engagement, the CPA has to follow the attestation standards. I just want to go through the standards with you very quickly. If you go through the attestation standards, they're listed in your viewer guide you'll see there are five general standards. Let's go over them quickly. First, training. The practitioner must have adequate technical training and proficiency in the attestation function. So the first is training. Second is knowledge. The practitioner must have adequate knowledge of the subject matter. And of course, they, they could conduct a special, they, they, they could consult a specialist as well. But 
the practitioner has to have adequate knowledge of the subject matter. Three is criteria. The practitioner can only perform an attestation engagement on an assertion capable of being evaluated against suitable criteria that's available to users, as, as we saw in forecasts and projections having to conform to criteria established by the AICPA for forecasts and projections. Four is independence. You know it has to be there. Independence is required for an examination. Independence is required for a review. And independence is required for agreed-upon procedures because you're providing assurance, even for prospective information. Number five is due professional care. The practitioner must exercise due professional care in planning and performing any attestation engagement. So those are your five general standards. Then there are two standards of field work. The first standard of field work is planning and supervision. All engagements must be adequately planned and all staff assistance must be adequately supervised. And then the second standard of field work, sufficient evidence. Sufficient evidence must be obtained to form a basis for the practitioner's conclusion. You'll notice that in the standards of field work, the practitioner is not required to obtain an understanding of the client's internal control. I want you to notice that. Then there are four standards of reporting. First, you have to identify the assertion or the subject matter that is being examined or reviewed. Second, you have to state your conclusion. If it's an examination, you're expressing an opinion. If it's a review, the objective is to express negative assurance. If it's agreed upon procedures, you're listing your findings. You have to state whether the assertion conforms to the criteria. Number three, you have to list any reservations, if any, and of course, number four, restrictions, if any. I want to say more about an agreed upon procedures report and what is required in an agreed upon procedures engagement. I think you know what an agreed upon procedures engagement is. It's an engagement where the CPA is engaged to issue a report on findings based on specific procedures performed on subject matter. On subject matter. That's what an agreed upon procedures engagement is. It's an engagement where the CPA is engaged to issue a report on findings based on specific procedures performed on subject matter. What is required for an agreed upon procedures engagement? Well, the CPA has to be independent. The responsible party has to take responsibility for the adequacy of the procedures. The responsible party and the CPA have to agree on the procedures that are to be performed and the criteria that will be used to determine the findings. The subject matter has to be capable of reasonably consistent measurement. The CPA and the responsible party have to agree on any materiality limits. And the use of the report has to be restricted to specific parties. And if it's agreed upon procedures on prospective information, that's possible. If it's agreed upon procedures on prospective information, the report must include a summary of any significant assumptions. In your viewer's guide, you'll see an example of, agreed, uh, of an agreed upon proce procedures report on specified elements, accounts, or items within a financial statement. And I just want to point out some highlights. If you look at the report, notice independence is in the title. You have to be independent to do an agreed upon procedures engagement. Notice the report identifies the subject matter, the, you know, the written assertion, the character of the engagement. And the report has to state 
Notice the report states that the responsible party is responsible for the subject matter. It states that the, the procedures performed were the responsibility of the responsible party and the procedures performed are those that were agreed to. It states that the engagement was conducted in accordance with attestation standards established by the AICPA. It states that the sufficiency of the procedures, solely the responsibility of the responsible party. The CPA disclaims, notice the CPA disclaims any responsibility for the sufficiency of the procedures. The report has to list any materiality limits, and the report has to state that an audit was not done, an examination was not done, a review was not done, and the report has to disclaim an opinion on the element and state that there's no negative assurance being given. And finally, notice you, the, the CPA lists any reservations and restricts use. And if this, were, if this is prospective information, you have to state that results may not be achieved. Welcome back. Let's do these questions together. In the first question, it says, when an accountant compiles doing a compilation, a financial forecast. So we're dealing with prospective financial information. It's a forecast. The accountant report should include, A says, an explanation of the differences between a financial forecast and a financial proje projection. There's nothing. That's never a part of any report explaining the difference. How about B, a caveat that the prospective results of the financial forecast may not be achieved. No, that's true. The answer is B. That when you're, you're dealing with prospective financial information, whether it's an examination, a compilation, agreed upon procedures, the report's going to state that results may not be achieved. The answer is B. C says a statement that the accountant's responsibility to update the report is limited to one year. No, there's no responsibility to update. Remember, whether it's, if it's prospective financial information, whether it's an examination, a compilation, agreed upon procedures, the report is going to state that the CPA has no updating responsibility. And D says a disclaimer of opinion on the suitability of the internal control. Well, remember, in the attestation standards, in the standards of field work, the practitioner, the CPA, is not required even to, to obtain an understanding of the, the client's internal control. So that's not required. Now, the answer is B. Whether it is an examination, whether it is a compilation, whether it's agreed upon procedures, when you're dealing with prospective financial information, the report has to state that the results may not be achieved. Next. When an accountant examines projected financial information, so we're dealing with a projection, it's an examination, the, account, the accountant's report should include a separate paragraph that I think it, you'd stop right today, it restricts use. Remember that a projection is a limited use report. A forecast is a general use report. But a projection is limited use. So you didn't have to go, you didn't have to go beyond A. The next question. When an accountant compiles projected financial statements, so it's a projection, and we're doing a compilation. The, the accountant's report should include a separate paragraph that A says explains the difference between a compilation and a review, of course, not. B says documents the assessment of risk of material misstatement due to fraud. All we're doing is compiling. C, expresses limited assurance. We're not providing any assurance at all. You know it's D. Describes the limitations on a projection's usefulness. 
the next question, accepting an engagement to compile an entity's financial projection most likely would be inappropriate if the projection is to be included in, well, you know right off the bat that a projection is a limited use report, so it has to be B. You can't include it in an offering statement to the public. It's a limited use report, so you know it's B. That would be very inappropriate. And then finally, the last question says a practitioner has been engaged to apply agreed upon procedures in accordance with statements on standards for attestation engagements to prospective financial information. Which of the following conditions must be met for a practitioner to perform the engagement? A says the prospective financial statement must include a summary of significant, significant accounting policies. That's not a requirement. B says the practitioner takes responsibility for the sufficiency of the procedures. No, that's the responsibility of the responsible party. D says the practitioner reports the criteria to be used in the determination of the findings. No, the, the criteria has to be agreed upon between the practitioner and the responsible party. And of course, it's C. The practitioner and the specified parties must ag agree upon the procedures to be performed by the practitioner. There are more questions I want you to have done before you look at the next session. Welcome back. Let's do these questions together. First question says, a CPA is engaged to examine an entity's financial forecast. So we're doing an examination. It's a forecast. The CPA believes that several significant assumptions do not provide, do not provide a reasonable basis for the forecast. Under these circumstances, the CPA should issue an adverse opinion. Answer A. If these assumptions do not provide a reasonable basis for the forecast, that's an adverse opinion. That's pervasive. Next, Mill CPA was engaged by a group of royalty recipients to apply agreed upon procedures to the financial data supplied by Modern Company regarding Modern's written assertion about, the, about its compliance with contractual requirements to pay royalties. Mill's report on these agreed upon procedures would contain, well, you know, the basic format of the report is you list your procedures, procedures that were performed, and your findings, and the answer is B. You're going to list the procedures that were performed and Mill's findings. That's the basic structure of the report, an agreed upon procedures report. Next, a practitioner's report on agreed upon procedures that is in the form of procedures and findings should contain, I think you went right to it, see, it's a limited use report that have to be a restriction on the use of the report. Remember, an agreed upon procedures report is limited use. Next, which of the following professional services would be considered an attestation engagement? Well, we know what, we know what attestation engagements are. The CPA is asked to provide a written conclusion about an assertion that's the responsibility of another party. So it's not A, advocating on behalf of a client about trust tax matters under review by the IRS. It's not B, providing financial analysis, planning, and capital acquisition services as a part-time in-house controller. It's not C, advising management in the selection of a computer system. No, it's D, preparing the income statement and balance sheet for one year in the future based on client expectations and predictions. That's a forecast. That's what an attestation engagement is. We're going to provide a written conclusion on an assertion. That's the responsibility of somebody else. The next question, a CPA is engaged to examine management's assertion that the entity's schedule of investment returns is presented in accordance with specific criteria. In performing this engagement, a CPA would comply with the provisions of what? Well, you know, it's an attestation engagement, so the answer is D. Welcome back. In this class, 
we're going to continue our discussion of attestation engagements. And one possibility we want to look at is the fact that our client could provide an assertion about the effectiveness of their internal control in a report. And that report would accompany our audit report. And as an attestation engagement, the CPA could do an examination and express an opinion on management's assertion about the effectiveness of their internal control. Now, you know that the objective of any examination is to express an opinion. In this case, express an opinion based on some objective control criteria on whether or not this assertion is fairly stated. In other words, we're going to express an opinion on the effectiveness of internal control in all material respects, again, based on some objective control criteria. Bottom line, we're going to express an opinion on whether this assertion is fairly stated. Let's go over the basic steps of an examination. Of course, step one, there would have to be a planning phase. In step two, the CPA would have to obtain an understanding of all the internal control policies and procedures that are in place. So in step two, you're just trying to understand what's there. You're obtaining an understanding of all the internal control policies and procedures that have been put into place. In step three, you'd evaluate the design of internal control policies and procedures. So in step three, you're evaluating. Now you start evaluating the design of all the internal control policies and procedures. In step four, you would test and evaluate the effectiveness. Now, how effective are they? All right, I understand the controls now. I know what they are. Now, step four, I test and I evaluate how effective they are, the effectiveness of internal control policies and procedures. And then, of course, the final step, step five, we form an opinion about management's assertion about the effectiveness of their internal control. If you look in your viewer's guide, there is an example of this report, and I just want to look at some highlights. You look at the heading, independent. It's right in the heading. You know we have to be independent to do an examination because the basic rule is if we're going to provide any type of assurance on any type of financial information, the CPA has to be independent. Independent in fact, independent in appearance, so that's right up front in the heading. Notice the introductory paragraph. We have examined. It's very clear what we did. This was not agreed upon procedures. We have examined. Look at the scope paragraph. Our examination was in accordance with attestation standards established by the AICPA. We obtained an understanding of internal control over financial reporting. We tested. We evaluated the design and operating effectiveness of internal controls. We performed other procedures we deemed necessary under the circumstances. And then we say, our examination provides a reasonable basis for our opinion. Now notice right after the scope paragraph, there is the inherent limitations paragraph, very important. So right after that scope paragraph, we have our inherent limitations paragraph. Misstatements due to errors and fraud may still occur and not be detected or corrected. This is an inherent limitations paragraph. Misstatements due to errors and fraud may still occur and not be detected and corrected. Another inherent limitation, this cannot be projected into the future. You can't project our opinion into the future because the effectiveness of internal control is at an, a point in time, at an instant in time. And then, of course, finally, the opinion paragraph. And this is an examination. Our objective is to give an opinion. We could give an unqualified opinion. This assertion is fairly stated based on the control criteria. Unqualified opinion. This assertion by management is fairly stated based on the control criteria. Or we may have to give an adverse opinion. We may have to disclaim an opinion. Let's do some questions. Number one, which of the following representations does an accountant make implicitly not explicitly, implicitly, when issuing a standard report for the compilation of a non-public entity's, a non-issuer's financial statements. So what is implicit when we do a compilation report? B, the financial statements have not been audited. No, that's explicit. That's stated. C, a compilation consists principally of inquiries and analytical procedures. No, that's a review. This is a compilation. D, the accountant does not express 
any assurance on the financial statements. Of course, the fact that we disclaim, that's explicit. But answer A, that the accountant is independent, that is implicit. Do you have to be independent to do a compilation? No, you don't have to be because you're not providing any assurance on the financial information. You're just compiling numbers given to you by management. So it's not that independence is required to do a compilation. It's not. But if you're not independent, it has to be stated. If you're not independent, it has to be stated. So if you say nothing, independence is presumed. So that is implicit. Number two, when an account is engaged to compile, so again, it's a compilation, to compile a non-public entities, a non-issuer's financial statements that omit substantially all disclosures required under GAAP, the account would indicate in the compilation report that the financial statements are what? A, not designed for those who are uninformed about these matters. Don't forget that buyer beware paragraph. You have to include that if there are omitted disclosures. Number three, which of the following procedures is usually performed by an account in a review engagement of a non-public entity, a non-issuer? Sending a letter of inquiry to the entity's lawyer? Do we do a legal letter, answer A, in a review? No, a review is analytical procedures and inquiries. That's what it is. And a legal letter, answer A, that's an audit procedure. How about C? Confirming receivables. That's an audit procedure. We're not doing an audit. D, communicating significant deficiencies, you know, material weaknesses. Well, significant deficiencies, material weaknesses are what you noted during an audit, not a review. Answer B, comparing the financial statements with statements for comparable prior periods. That is an analytical procedure. And that's what a review is. Inquiries, analytical procedures. So the answer is B. Number four, which of the following procedures should an accountant perform during an engagement to review the financial statements of a non-public entity, a non-issuer? Again, it's a review. A says communicate significant deficiencies. Significant deficiencies are noted during an audit. We're doing a review. Sending out bank confirmation letters. That's an audit procedure. D, Examining cash disbursements, that's an audit procedure. But answer B, a management representation letter is required at the end of a review. So it's not, it's not only inquiries and analytical procedures. In a review, you have to get a management representation letter, so the answer is B. Number five, Gold CPA is engaged to review. It's a review. To review the year four financial statements of North. So we're doing, we're doing a review of the year four financial statements, a non-public, non-issuer. Previously, Goal audited the year three financial statements. All right, so notice we're doing a lower level of service here. So back in year three, we did an audit. Now year four, we're doing a review. So we're doing a lower level of service this year. Goal decides to include a separate paragraph in the year four review report because North plans to present comparative statements for years three and four. The separate paragraph would indicate what? A says that the year four review report is intended solely for the board of directors, management. No, you don't restrict the use of a, re a review report. A review report is a general use statement. B, there are justifiable reasons for changing the level of service. You don't have to justify the reasons. If you have to have a statement that the Year three auditor's report may, not, may, may, may no longer be relied upon. No, that, that statement doesn't have to be there. Answer is C. You do have to have a statement that no auditing procedures have been performed since the date of the year three report. Remember, when there's a lower level of service, you know, when you did an audit last year and you're doing a review this year, when you're doing a lower level of service, you have a couple of, you have a couple of choices. You can just reissue the prior year's report or you can do what they've decided to do, have a separate paragraph stating the responsibility you're assuming for the prior period. And you also have to have in that paragraph the date of the prior year report, the type of opinion that was given, if it was a qualified opinion, the reasons why it was qualified, and you have to state, as it says, no auditing procedures have been done since. Number six, in performing an attestation engagement, 
a CPA typically, A, supplies litigation support services? No. Assesses control risk at a low level? Remember, gaining an understanding of the entity and its environment, and including internal control, is not one of the fieldwork standards for an attestation engagement. So we don't, we're not assessing control risk. Provides management consulting services, that's not it. But answer C, in any attestation engagement, you have to express un- some kind of conclusion about the assertion. Number seven, which of the following is a conceptual difference between the attestation standards and the generally accepted auditing standards? Well, B says the requirement that the practitioner be independent in mental attitude is omitted from the attestation standards. No, that's not true. That is our fourth general standard in the attestation standards. You still have to be independent because you're providing some assurance on financial information. C, the attestation standards do not permit an attest engagement to be part of a business acquisition study or feasibility study. No, normally. An attestation engagement is part of a larger engagement. That's no problem. That's not a true statement. Answer D, none of the standards of field work in generally accepted auditing standards are included in the attestation standards. That's not true. Two of the three are the same. Right? Planning and supervision, evidence, those two are in the fieldwork standards for generally accepted auditing standards and for the attestation standards. So two of the three are the same. Of course, the answer is A. The attestation standards provide a framework for the attest function beyond historical statements because they apply to any other written conclusion about the reliability of an assertion that's the responsibility of somebody else. The answer is A. Number eight. A CPA's report on agreed-upon procedures related to management's assertion about the entity's compliance with specified requirements should contain a restriction. Answer A. That's restricted. Number nine. Which of the following is not an attestation standard? A. The practitioner must obtain a sufficient, must obtain sufficient evidence to provide a reasonable basis for their conclusion. Well, that's the second standard of field work. So that is in the attestation standards. How about B? The practitioner must identify the subject matter or the assertion being reported on. Well, that's the first reporting standard in the attestation standard. So that's there. C. The practitioner must plan the work and properly supervise the assistance. That's the first field work standard in the attestation standard. So those are all there. But a sufficient understanding of internal control, that is not one of the field work standards in the attestation standards because, again, an attestation engagement is part of a larger engagement. Number 10, negative assurance may be expressed when an accountant is requested to report on what? Well, before we read any of the choices here, we know in an attestation engagement, you're not allowed to give negative assurance. We know that. So, but how about the first one? Results of applying agreed upon procedures to an account within unaudited financial statements. Can you give negative assurance? No, you present your findings. Two, a compilation. We're not providing any type of assurance at all. So the answer is D, neither one or two. Don't fall behind. Keep up with your work. And I'll look to see you in the next class. Welcome back. In this class, we're going to begin our discussion of internal control, a very heavily tested topic in the auditing exam. And just to get us started, get us warmed up, get us in the mood, let's quickly go over the basic steps in the audit process. The first step of the audit process, as you know, is to establish an understanding with the client. We're going to lay out as clearly as we can the objectives of the engagement, the services we're going to perform, any limitations on the services we're going to perform. We're going to spell out as clear as we can the auditor's responsibility, the client's responsibility, and as you know, 
we're going to document our understanding with the client in the engagement letter. Then we will move on to the second step of the audit process, which is the planning phase. In the planning phase, we have to obtain an understanding of the entity and its environment, including internal control. In the planning phase, we're going to begin our risk assessment. We're going to, we're going to use risk assessment procedures through observation, inquiry, inspection, and analytical procedures. So we begin our risk assessment in the planning phase. And, of course, the risk assessment procedures we use will depend on the size of the client, you know, its complexity, our previous experience with the client. And in the planning phase, we have to discuss with the audit team how susceptible the financial statements are to material misstatement, how susceptible these financial statements are to errors and fraud. Then in the third step of the audit process, now we start to get more targeted. In the third step of the audit process, we start to evaluate the risk of material misstatement. Let's get right down to it. We have to evaluate the risk of material misstatement related to particular assertions. As you know, a set of financial statements is nothing more than a list of assertions. Management is asserting, this is our cash balance. Management is asserting, this is our inventory. Management is asserting, these are our disclosures. That's all a set of financial statements amounts to, is a set of assertions. So in the third step, we evaluate the risk of material misstatement, the risk of errors and fraud related to particular assertions. You know, what's the probability of errors and fraud related to particular assertions? We're getting more targeted now. And our evaluation of the risk of material misstatement in particular assertions will determine the nature and the extent and the timing of our further audit procedures. That's what, that's what it amounts to, that our evaluation of the risk of errors and fraud will ultimately determine the nature, the extent, and the timing of all our subsequent audit procedures. Notice N-E-T, nature, extent, timing, N-E-T, net. Always think of auditors on a sea of transactions, and they have to throw out their net, the nature, the extent, the timing of their audit procedures. Let's just think about this for a minute. Why would our evaluation of the risk of material misstatement related to particular assertions, why would it affect the nature of the evidence that we gather? Well, because if we think the risk of material misstatement is low, if it's a low probability of material misstatement in a particular assertion, we're going to use the client's records. We'll rely on the, cli the client's records. We think the client system of go is good. But if the risk of material misstatement is high, we're going to need more outside corroboration, aren't we? So notice our evaluation of the risk of material misstatement does affect the nature of the evidence we gather on the audit. Same thing with the extent of the evidence we're going to need to form an opinion. If our evaluation of the risk of material misstatement is low, we're not going to need as much evidence to be able to form an opinion. We'll need less. But if our estimate, our evaluation of the risk of material misstatement is high, then we're going to need a lot more evidence, much more evidence, to form an opinion. So notice our evaluation of the risk of material misstatement affects the extent of the evidence that we gather on the audit, and it also affects timing. Why? Because if we evaluate the risk of material misstatement to be low, we're going to do more interim testing. If we evaluate the risk of material misstatement to be high, we're going to do our testing after year end. Our evaluation of the risk of material misstatement affects the net we throw out, N-E-T, the nature of the evidence, the extent of the evidence, and the timing of the evidence of our audit procedures. Now, in the fourth step of the audit process, we get right down to it. We design and perform all of our audit procedures. We're going to use tests of controls, substantive testing, we're going to design and perform our audit procedures to address the risk of material misstatement in particular assertions. So now we perform our audit procedures in step four. In step five, we evaluate all the audit evidence that we gathered on the audit. And in step six, we form an opinion and we issue our audit report. 
Now we know those are the basic six steps in the audit process. And when I say that we're now going to discuss internal control, what it means is we're going to zero in on steps two, three, and four, aren't we? In these classes on internal control, we're really going to zero in on steps two, three, and four. Because why do we need to have an understanding of internal control? Well, in step two, we need an understanding of internal control to do our initial risk assessment. In step three, we need an understanding of internal control to evaluate the risk of material misstatement, in particular assertions. And in step four, we need an understanding of internal control in order to design our audit procedures to address the risk of material misstatement, in particular assertions. You have to have an understanding of a client's internal control to do an audit. And again, in particular, steps two, three, and four. Now, why don't we get down to it? What are the objectives of internal control? There are three major objectives to internal control. Number one, the first objective may be the most important, arguably. The first objective of internal control is to provide reasonable assurance that material misstatements are being prevented, detected, corrected on a timely basis. Reasonable assurance that there is reliability in financial reporting. I think you'd have to argue that may be the most important objective of internal control, to provide reasonable assurance that material misstatements, errors and fraud, are being prevented, detected, corrected on a timely basis. Reasonable assurance on the reliability of financial reporting. Second objective of, of internal control, provide reasonable assurance of compliance with laws and regulations. Pretty important. Reasonable assurance, reasonable assurance that the entity is complying with laws and regulations. And then the third objective of internal control is to provide reasonable assurance on the effectiveness and efficiency of operations. Now, I have to say, when we say reasonable assurance on the effectiveness and efficiency of operations, the auditor is not all that concerned with efficiency, but it is one of the objectives of internal control. Now, as I say, we, we always think or try to think very clearly and delineate between management's responsibilities and the auditor's responsibility. And when in this particular context, you know, management's responsibility is the establishment and the maintenance of the internal control structure. That's the client's responsibility. That's management's responsibility. The establishment and the maintenance of the internal control structure. What's the auditor's responsibility in this context? Well, the auditor's responsibility is to see if the controls are working. The auditor's responsibility is to determine, is the internal control structure preventing, detecting, correcting material misstatements, errors and fraud on a timely basis? In other words, the auditor's responsibility is to determine the effect that the internal control structure is having on the financial statements. That's the auditor's responsibility. That's us. That's our responsibility. Is the internal control structure functioning well? Is it effective? Is it preventing, detecting, correcting errors and fraud on a timely basis? What effect does the internal control structure have on financial statement assertions? And as always, we as auditors, we as accountants, all we care about is the substance of something. We don't care about its form. You know, don't show me a pretty flow chart. Give me a nice little narrative on your controls. That's the form. What we always care about is the substance. Are the controls effective? That's what we as auditors have to determine. And I should mention that there are always inherent limitations. There are always inherent limitations. No matter what controls you place into, into service, into effect. You could, you could create the most perfect internal control structure ever devised by man, and there are inherent limitations. There are inherent problems. In other words, unavoidable, inherent, baked in the cake. Humans are fallible. That's, that's an inherent limitation. 
in the most perfect system ever devised by man. People make mistakes. People are fallible. They're not perfect. That's an inherent limitation. We're stuck with it. It's baked in the cake in any system. You could have the most beautiful internal control structure ever devised by man and have perfect separation of duties. But what if there's collusion? That's unavoidable. That's inherent. The, in it's the possibility of collusion between employees is inherent. It's unavoidable in any system. And also management override. The fact that no matter what controls are, are put into place, Management could always circumvent the controls. That could happen in any system. So there are inherent limitations in any system, unavoidable, just baked in the cake. And we have to accept that. Now, getting more detailed now, let's talk about the components that make up internal control. There are five components that make up internal control. And the memory tool I want you to use to remember the five, because you've got to remember the five, is C-R-I-M-E, crime. Just remember, strong internal controls help to prevent crime. C-R-I-M-E, that little memory tool will help you remember the five components of internal control. The C stands for control activities. When we say control activities, we're talking about the specific policies and procedures that are in place to assure that all transactions, all transactions, are properly initiated, authorized, approved, executed, and recorded. One more time, control activities refer to the specific policies and procedures the client has in place to assure that all transactions, without exception, are properly initiated, authorized, approved, executed, and recorded. Control activities includes a proper segregation of duties. It is essential in any internal control structure that we separate authorization, record keeping, and custody of assets. Remember that those functions must be separated. That's a proper segregation, segregation of duties when you separate authorization, record keeping, and custody of assets, ARC. I always tell my students that's the R that protects us from a sea of troubles when we separate authorization, record keeping, and custody of assets. Control activities also includes things like physical controls, you know, locks on doors, employee ID badges, all the policies and procedures in place to assure that all transactions are properly initiated, authorized, approved, executed, and recorded. Now, the R in crime is risk assessment. Now, what we're talking about here is not the auditor's assessment of risk. Oh, no. Risk assessment in this context is how your client manages the concept of risk, the risk of material misstatement. And how does your client, how does management handle the risk of material misstatement, the risk of errors, errors and fraud? And remember that from a client's point of view, there are external risks and there are internal risks. You know, there are internal risks like new employees, a high turnover of employees, you know, rapid expansion, new technology, new products. Remember this basic formula, change equals risk. Just remember that basic formula. That's, without question, a true statement. Anytime there's a change, there's a risk. It's true in your life as well. If you change jobs, there's a risk. There's a risk that you may not like the new job, that you would prefer your old job. Change equals risk. Anytime something changes, there's some risk involved. But there are not only internal risks, there are external, tr external risks. A downturn in the economy, a downturn in the industry. You know, would, if there's a downturn in the economy or a downturn in the industry, there's increased competition, would your employees be tempted to cut corners? That kind of thing. How does your client manage the concept of risk? What's your client's risk assessment? How does your client handle internal risks, ex external, external risks? So the R in crime is risk assessment. I in crime is information and communication. Information re refers to the quality of the accounting records, bottom line. Information really refers to the quality of the accounting records, whether 
they are electronic or manual. What's the quality of the accounting records? Communication means a lot of things. Communication between management and those in charge of governance, particularly the audit committee. Communication between management and regulatory agencies. And also communicating individual responsibilities to employees. You know, communication is very important part of, of internal control. M is monitoring. How, what's management's ability to evaluate internal control over an extended period of time? So again, monitoring, monitoring refers to management's ability to evaluate internal control over an extended period. How does management handle breakdowns? There are inevitable breakdowns. Can management handle breakdowns and take corrective action? And of course, monitoring includes an internal audit function. It's a huge part of monitoring. Does the client have an internal audit function? And then finally, the E on crime is environment, the control environment. What's the overall attitude, the overall actions of management, the board of directors? Do they set a tone that emphasizes internal control? Is there a written code of conduct? Does the board of directors, does management, do they communicate ethical values? Is there an active board of directors, an active audit committee? Is there an internal audit function? You know, what's management's philosophy? Is it hands-on or is it absentee? And it's important to remember that if there's a weakness in control environment, anytime there's a weakness in the control environment, that will have a pervasive effect on the internal control structure. Anytime there's a weakness in the control environment, that's very disturbing. That will tend to have a pervasive effect on the entire internal control structure. Now, very important, the auditor is required to document their understanding of the internal control structure in the work papers. That's required. The auditor is required to document their understanding of each of the components of crime. This is required. You're either required to do something or you're not required. This is required. The auditor has to document in the work papers their understanding of each component of C-R-I-M-E. So remember that requirement as well. Now in our next class, we'll continue our discussion of internal control, and I will look to see you then. Keep studying. Welcome back to our discussion on internal control. In our last class, we said that ultimately, an auditor uses their understanding of a client's internal control to assess the risk of material misstatement, the risk of errors and fraud in particular assertions. That's how we're going to use, ultimately, our understanding of internal control to assess the risk of errors and fraud, material misstatements in, a, in particular assertions. And what I want to get into in this class is the concept of risk. As you know, risk is unavoidable in auditing. It's unavoidable. Why? Because ultimately, we're going to issue an opinion on financial statements, and we have not examined, we have not examined, 100% of the documentary evidence that supports the financial statements. Isn't that the situation we're in as auditors? Ultimately, we're going to have to express an opinion on financial statements, and we have not examined 100% of the documentary evidence that supports the statements. It's not possible. It's not practical. The client wouldn't pay for it. Oh, no, we have to examine 100%. No, of course not. Oh, no, 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 we have to examine 100% of the documentary evidence that aud audits would take no, years, you know, thousands and thousands of man hours that the client wouldn't pay for. And on top of that, even if we did examine 100% of the documentary evidence that supports the financial statements, we could misinterpret something. We could still miss something. We could still fail to detect errors and fraud that are in the records. It's possible. There's always a risk in auditing. It's unavoidable. And 
the risks that you take in auditing have names. And you've got to be comfortable with the names of these risks because this is tested a lot. The ultimate risk you take in auditing is called audit risk. All right, what's audit risk? Audit risk is really very simple. Audit risk, this is the ultimate risk you take in auditing. It's the risk that the financial statements are materially misstated. It is the risk that the financial statements have material errors and fraud. The financial statements are materially misstated, but we issue a clean opinion. We miss it, and we issue an unmodified opinion. That is called audit risk. It is the ultimate risk we always take in auditing, that the financial statements are misleading. The financial statements are materially misstated, and somehow we miss it, and issue a clean opinion. We issue an unmodified opinion. Now, audit risk is actually made up of other risks. Control risk. Control risk is the risk that the internal control structure is not functioning well. Control risk. It's the risk that internal controls are not preventing, not detecting, not correcting material misstatements on a timely basis. It's the basic risk that the internal control structure is not functioning well. And remember, every internal control structure has control risk, whether there's an audit or not. Whether there's an audit or not, every internal control structure has a certain amount of control risk. Now, in an audit, the auditor comes in and tries to evaluate what's the control risk in this particular internal control structure. But every internal control structure has, has control risk. It's the risk that internal controls are not preventing, not detecting, not correcting errors and fraud on a timely basis. Then there's inherent risk. Inherent risk is the risk that a given account by its very nature could be overstated. Again, inherent risk is the risk that a given account by its very nature could be subject to errors and fraud, could be materially misstated. Cash has a lot of inherent risk. You know, securities, you know, liquid assets have a lot of inherent risk. Cash has more inherent risk than furniture and fixtures. Why? Because it's easier to, you know, fold up cash and stick it in your pocket and walk away with it than it is to try to bring your desk home, to try to steal a chandelier. Cash has a lot of inherent risk. Furniture and fixtures have less inherent risk. But inherent risk is the risk that a given account by its very nature could be materially misstated. Now, listen carefully. The combination of control risk and inherent risk. That equals the risk of material misstatement. It's very important you remember that. Control risk plus inherent risk equals the risk of material misstatement. That gives you your risk of material misstatement. The risk that an account could be materially misstated. That, you know, a disclosure could be materially misstated. R that is the risk of material misstatement. It's, com it's a combination of control risk and inherent risk. And then finally, there is detection risk. Oh, and I meant to mention that, you know, every account balance, you know, every assertion has some inherent risk to it, whether there's an audit or not. Now, again, the auditor will come into an audit and evaluate the inherent risk in a particular assertion. But every assertion has some inherent risk. Again, unrelated to the audit, whether there's an audit or not. Now, it's up to the auditor to come into a system and evaluate the inherent risk in a particular assertion. And as I say, the combination of control risk and inherent risk, that gives you your risk of material misstatement. And then finally, the last risk you have to be aware of is detection risk. Detection risk is the risk that the auditor will fail to detect material misstatements fail to detect errors and fraud that do in fact exist. This is the one risk that only exists because there's an audit, because it's the risk related to the auditor. This is the only risk we've talked about that only exists when there's an audit called detection risk. It's the risk that the auditor will fail to detect material misstatements that do in fact exist. Errors and fraud that do in fact exist.
Now, what the exam loves to test is how these risks interrelate. And if you look in your viewer's guide, you'll see a little table. I want to talk about it because it's very important you notice the relationships between these risks. Notice there are three columns in your viewer's guide. The first column is the risk of material misstatement. Remember, that's made up of what? Control risk and inherent risk. And then the next column is detection risk. And the third column is your further audit procedures. So think, what's, think about the relationships here. If the auditor evaluates the risk of material misstatement in a given assertion to be high, that meaning there's a high probability of material misstatement in this particular assertion, then the auditor will set their detection risk to be low. In other words, the auditor would want there to be a low probability they'll fail to detect errors and fraud because they think there's a lot of it. Notice there's an inverse relationship between the risk of material misstatement and detection risk. And of course, the exam likes to play with this language where there's an inverse relationship, where there's a direct relationship. So I want you to notice there's an inverse relationship between the risk of material misstatement and detection risk. So if the auditor assesses the risk of material misstatement in a particular assertion to be high, there's a high probability of errors and fraud, then the auditor then would set their detection risk to be low. They want there to be a low probability. They'll fail to detect errors and fraud because they think there's a lot of it. So what's the effect on further audit procedures? Extensive. We do a lot of further audit procedures, a lot of substantive testing. Notice there's an inverse relationship between the risk of material misstatement and detection risk. There's an inverse relationship between detection risk and our further audit procedures, right? If detection risk is set low, then we do much more audit procedures, much more substantive testing. There's an inverse relationship between detection risk and our further audit procedures. Now, if you just kind of cover up mentally that middle column, just cover up in your mind that middle column, there's a direct relationship between the risk of material misstatement and audit procedures, right? If we evaluate the risk of material misstatement in a particular assertion to be high, we do a lot of testing, just common sense. That's a direct relationship. We evaluate the risk of material misstatement in a particular assertion to be low, we do less testing. It's just common sense. There's a direct relationship between the risk of material misstatement and our further audit procedures. Now, this could also be expressed Mathematically, I mean, notice you can, express, you can express all of this in qualitative terms, you know, high or low. But you can also do it quantitatively. Let's say that the risk of material misstatement, the auditor estimates or evaluates the risk of material misstatement to be 10%. And the auditor wants to set the detection risk. Excuse me, the, inherent, the, the auditor evaluates the inherent risk. Pardon me. The auditor sets the detection risk to be 10%. You know, let's, let's express this numerically. If the auditor estimates the risk of material misstatement to be 10% and the auditor sets the detection risk at 10%, what's your, what's your audit risk? Well, the risk of material misstatement times the detection risk will give you your audit risk. So if the risk of material misstatement is estimated by the auditor to be, to be 10% and the auditor sets the detection risk at 10%, take 10% times 10%, that means your audit risk is 1%. Let's say, let's say the auditor wants to take an audit risk of about 1%. The risk of material misstatement times detection risk will give you your audit risk. Remember, audit risk is made up of those two risks, and you can express it mathematically. So with thinking mathematically, you can see what happens. What if the risk of material misstatement is 20%? and I still want to have an audit risk no greater than 1%, well, then I'd have to set the detection risk at 5%. It would go down. It's an inverse relationship, right? If the risk of material misstatement goes up 20%, and I still only want to take, as an auditor, an audit risk of about 1%, then I'll have to set the detection risk to be lower, 5%. 20% times 5% is 1%. There's an inverse relationship between the risk of material misstatement and detection risk. There's an inverse relationship between detection risk and further audit procedures. There's a direct relationship between the risk of material misstatement and audit procedures. Now, 
for our next class, you'll see in your viewer's guide that there are 12 multiple choice questions that we're going to be doing in our next class. I'm assigning those 12. In other words, I want you to have your answers to those 12 questions before you come to the next class, and then we'll discuss them together. So get those 12 questions done, and in the next class, we'll go through them together. I'll see you then. Welcome back to our discussion on internal control. In our last class, I assigned 12 questions that I wanted you to have done before coming to this class. If you don't have your answers to these questions, you really should shut the class down and get your answers first. That makes a big difference. You try the questions, get your answers before we discuss them together. But let's look at these 12 questions. Number one, which of the following most likely would not be considered not be considered an inherent limitation of the potential effectiveness of an entity's internal control. What's not an inherent limitation? Well, it's not B, management override, because that is an inherent limitation. You're stuck with that in any system. Management can override the controls. That would be true in any system. It's, in, you're, it's baked in the cake, inherent, unavoidable in any system. Same thing with answer C, mistakes in judgment. Human be Humans are fallible. How do we avoid that? That's inherent. That's unavoidable in any system. D, collusion. Collusion. You can have proper separation of duties, but if employees are going to collude, that would circumvent those controls. The possibility of collusion is inherent, unavoidable in any system. So B, C, and D are inherent limitations. But answer A, incompatible duties, that's not inherent. You can prevent incompatible duties by having proper separation of duties. That you have some control over. If you have a proper separation of duties, there shouldn't be, an en there shouldn't be any incompatible function. What's an incompatible function? You never want an employee to be in a position where they can both perpetrate something and cover it up in the records. That would be an incompatible function. If an employee is in a position where they can perpetrate something and cover it up in the records, that is an incompatible function, and that is not an inherent limitation in a system. That can be prevented by separating authorization, record keeping, and custody of assets. That's the ARC, A-R-C, that will protect us from a sea of troubles. Number two, in the consideration of an entity's internal control, an auditor is basically concerned that the controls provide reasonable assurance that A says operational efficiency has been achieved. Well, we want it to be achieved, but that's not what the auditor you know, is basically concerned with. C, management cannot override the controls. Uh, D, controls have not been circumvented by collusion. Well, again, you know, the auditor would be certainly concerned about both of those things, although they're inherent in any system, but that is not what they're basically concerned with. What the auditor is basically concerned with in any contro in internal control structure is answer B, that errors and fraud have been prevented, detected, corrected on a timely basis. That's the bottom line. That's the auditor's primary concern every time in any system. Errors and fraud, material misstatements, are they being prevented, detected, corrected on a timely basis? Number three, proper segregation of functional responsibilities in an effective internal control structure calls for the separation of the functions of, you know, answer B, authorization, recording, and custody of assets. Number four, proper segregation of duties reduces the opportunities to allow persons to be in a position to both, you know, answer D, perpetrate something and then conceal the errors and fraud, answer D. Five, the overall attitude and awareness of an entity's board of directors concerning the importance of internal control usually is reflected in answer C, the control environment. You know, do they emphasize internal control? Do they have a written code of conduct? Do they convey ethical values? That's the control environment. And as we said in our other class, if there's a weakness in the control environment, that component of internal control, that will have a pervasive effect 
on the internal control structure. Six, which of the following is not a component of an entity's internal control? Well, we know the components are C-R-I-M-E, crime. Strong internal control should prevent crime. And, of course, answer B, control activities, is the C in crime. Answer C, information and communication, is the I in crime. Answer D, the control environment, is the E in crime. So B, C, and D are components of internal control. The answer is A, control risk is not a, a component. It's not one of the components of internal control. It's a, it is something, unfortunately, that's in every internal control structure. There's a certain amount of control risk in every internal control structure. Whether there's an audit or not, there's some control risk. Some risk that the internal control structure is not functioning well. But that's not an element. That's not a component of internal control. The components are C-R-I-M-E. And if you know that, you knew it had to be answer A. Seven, the primary objective of procedures performed to obtain an understanding of an entity and its environment, including internal control. What step are we in in the audit process here? Step two. It's always important to think that way. You know, where am I in the audit process? A lot of times in the exam, when you're doing multiple choice. That, that should be something you stop and think about just for a second. Wait a minute, in this question, where am I in the audit process? Because it can matter. Here we're in step two. We're obtain, we're, we're, we are obtaining an understanding of the entity and its environment, including internal control. So the primary objective of procedures to obtain an understanding of an entity, its environment, including internal control, is to provide an auditor with, A says, knowledge necessary to assess the risk of material misstatement and the design of further audit procedures. No, that's steps three and four, right? That's not the second step of the audit process. That's really steps three and four, where we assess the risk of material misstatement in order to, divide, in order to design our audit procedures to address the risk of material misstatement. So that's steps three and four. We're in step two here. B says it's an, our primary objective would be an evaluation of the consistency of application of all management policies. Well, we do care about consistency. We do. Consistency of application. We care about that. It's not our primary objective. C says as a basis for modifying our tests of controls. It may be. It may be. We may use our understanding of the entity, its environment, including internal control, to use as a basis for modifying our tests of control. Why? Because if, you know, controls are strong, we probably will test the controls, right? We'll test the controls to make sure they're as strong as we think they are. If the controls are very weak, why would you test controls? If you already know they're bad, why would you test them to just prove how bad they are? You know, I'll say that again. Controls are strong. You would test the controls just to document they're as strong as you think they are. If you assess con control risk to be, you know, very high, a high probability of errors and fraud, why would you keep testing the controls just to show how bad they are? You'd go right to more substantive testing. So it's true that this would be a basis for modifying our tests of controls, but it's not our primary objective. Our primary objective is answer D, to gather audit evidence to use in assessing inherent risk. You know, wh what we're doing in step two, when we obtain an understanding of the, cl the client, its environment, internal control, is trying to understand the type of errors and fraud that could exist, that could occur. You know, where is the inherent risk? That's really what we're doing in, in the planning phase. You know, what are we dealing with here? What are the types of errors and fraud that could, could occur? Where is there the inherent risk? That's our primary objective. Answer D. Number eight, which of the following factors would most likely be considered an inherent limitation on internal control? You know it's answer B. Human fallibility, human judgment. That's an inherent limitation in any system. It's unavoidable. Human beings are, are fallible. No matter how well you design the system, you're stuck with that. It's baked in the cake in any system. Number nine, which of the following is an inherent limitation of internal control? I'm sure you picked it out right away. Collusion. Go ahead. Design a perfect system. Have perfect separation of duties. Well, if they, but the possibility of collusion is always there, that employees could collude to circumvent the system. 
That possibility is inherent in any system. Judgmental sampling is just an audit procedure. That's not an inherent limitation. That's an audit procedure you may use or not. Answer C and D, segregation of duties, employee peer review, those are controls, not inherent limitations. Number 10, the objective of tests of details of transactions performed as tests of control is to, what they're getting at in this question is that you can perform tests of controls and substantive tests, basically, tests of controls and tests of details simultaneously on the same transaction. And when you're performing tests of details as a test of controls, you're doing that for answer D to evaluate whether, whether the internal control procedures are effective. That's why you're doing it. You're using tests of details as a test of control to see if the control was effective, to see if the transaction was handled properly. Notice answer C, to detect material misstatements. That would be using tests of details as a substantive test. Answer C. But if it's used as tests of controls, is to see if the controls are effective. Number 11, when obtaining an understanding of an entity's internal control, we're in step two in the audit process, aren't we? where we obtain an understanding of the client and its environment, including internal control. An auditor should concentrate on the implement, implementation of the procedures. Why? You know why. Because it's substance over form. We don't, want, don't give us a list of procedures. We want to know if they've been implemented. We want to know if they're effective. We, want, we concentrate on implementation of the procedures because of answer B. Management can establish procedures, but then not enforce compliance with them. Don't give me a, a flow chart. Don't give me a narrative, what great controls you have. Have they been implemented? Are they enforced? We care about the substance of the controls, not the form. And then finally, number 12. In an audit of financial statements, an auditor's primary consideration regarding internal control policy or procedures is whether the policy or procedure, A, reflects management's philosophy and operating style. Well, I suppose it should. C says provides safeguards over access to assets. That would be a consideration, certainly a control. Enhances management's decision-making processes. That would be A, C, and D. Certainly all important objectives of internal control. What's the primary consideration? regarding an internal control policy or a procedure? Answer B. How does it affect financial statement assertions? That's what we really care about. How does it affect assertions? Now, before you do the next class, I want you to do 10 more questions. Get those 10 questions done, and then I'll look to see you in the next class. Welcome back. Let's take a look at these questions together. In number one, they ask, in planning an audit. So we're in the planning phase, we're in the second step of the audit process. The auditor's knowledge about the design of relevant internal control policies and procedures should be used for what purpose? Well, I'm sure you went right to it. It's for A. The reason we're obtaining a knowledge about the entity, its environment, internal control, is to try to identify what's there, to try to identify where the potential material misstatements might be, where the potential for errors and fraud could possibly occur. That's why we're obtaining this knowledge. It's not B, it's not to assess operational efficiency. We've said in these classes that may be one of the objectives of internal control. It's not really the auditor's focus, how efficient the internal control structure is. It's not C, determining whether controls have been circumvented by collusion. Collusion is something we have to accept is inherent as a possibility in any system. No matter how well you design a system, one of the inherent limitations, one of the things we have to accept is that employees might collude to circumvent the system. We just have to accept that. But that's not why we're obtaining knowledge about the design of internal control policies and procedures to determine if there's been collusion. That's not our purpose. But we have to accept the possibility is there. And 
It's not to document the assessed level of control risk. That comes later in the audit. That's going to come later in the third step when we are evaluating the risk of material misstatement in particular assertions we're going to have to document our assessed level of control risk related to particular assertions. So it is answer A. Number two, in obtaining an understanding of an entity's internal control, again we're in the planning phase, in a financial statement audit, an auditor is not obligated to. What is the auditor not obligated to? Well, answer A, determine whether the control procedures have been implemented. No, we are up. That's exactly what we're obligated to determine. Don't just give me a flow chart. I want to know exactly what controls have been implemented and try to understand that internal control structure. Tell me what's been implemented. That is my obligation in the planning phase. B, perform procedures to understand the design of internal control policies. We are obligated to do that in the planning phase. C, document our understanding of the company's internal control. We are obligated. What we're not obligated to do in the planning phase is answer D, search for significant deficiencies in the operation of internal control. Now, we may identify deficiencies. Later in these classes, we'll talk about how we handle control deficiencies, significant deficiencies, material weaknesses in internal control that we identify during the course of an audit. But we're not obligated to search for them, certainly not in the planning phase. So that's what we're not obligated to do, and the answer is D. Number three, in obtaining an understanding, we're in the second step of the audit process, planning phase. In obtaining an understanding of an entity's internal control, an auditor is required to obtain knowledge about, well, look at the second column, knowledge about the design of policies and procedures. That's exactly what we're required to do, but not the first column. We're not required to obtain knowledge about how effective the policies are. That comes later. The answer is no, yes. Answer B. You know, later in the third step, when we are evaluating the risk of material misstatement, particular assertions, then we're going to get into how effective the control policies and procedures are. Number four, which of the following statements is correct concerning the use of prior audit evidence? You know, we're at the same client year in, year out. What is correct concerning the use of prior audit evidence regarding the operating effectiveness of controls? Well, let's go right to it. The answer is B. If the auditor uses prior audit evidence for several controls, the auditor should have a sufficient portion of them in each audit should, should test a sufficient portion of them in each audit so that each is tested at least every third audit. That is the requirement. So if you are at the same client every year and you're going to rely on controls, assuming they have not changed, you want to test the, a sufficient portion of them so that all the controls get tested at least every third audit, at least every three years. Now, if a control has changed, that's different. Now, we're assuming the controls have not changed. These are controls you rely on year in, year out. You just you are required to test a portion of them so that all of them get tested at least every three years. But if a control has changed, you're required to test it for the current audit. And if a control is related to a significant risk, you are required to test it in the current audit. Number five. On the basis of audit evidence gathered and evaluated, an auditor decides to increase the assessed level of control risk from that originally planned to achieve an overall audit risk that is substantially the same as the planned audit risk. The auditor would what? I hope you went right to it. De answer B, decreased detection risk. Remember, if you look at this quantitatively, you see what happens if the, the risk of material misstatement, and remember, the risk of material misstatement is made up of control risk and inherent risk. If the risk of material misstatement is assessed to be around 10% and the auditor sets the detection risk at 10%, what's your overall audit risk? 10% times 10%, 1%. Remember, risk of material misstatement times detection risk 
equals audit risk, quantitatively. So when they say on the basis of audit evidence, gathered and evaluated, the auditor is going to increase their assessed level of control risk. Well, if you, assist, if you increase your assessed level of control risk, that means the risk of material misstatement would go up. So let's say the risk of material misstatement goes up to 20%. How do I end up with the same overall audit risk of 1%? I would lower my detection risk to 5%. Remember, risk of material misstatement times detection risk equals your audit risk. And there, it's an inverse relationship. If the risk of material misstatement goes up and you want to maintain the same overall audit risk, then you're going to have to set your detection risk lower. If the risk of material misstatement goes down and you, and you want to keep the same audit risk, you could set your detection risk higher. You could take a higher risk that you could fail to detect material misstatements because you don't think there are many. It's an inverse relationship. Number six, which of the following audit techniques ordinarily would provide an auditor with the least assurance about the operating effectiveness of internal control? What's going to provide you with the least assurance? Well, answer A, inquiry, B, inspection, C, observation. Those are your risk assessment procedures. They are supposed to provide assurance. But answer D, a system flowchart, that doesn't provide you any assurance. That's just a pretty picture. That's just the form. To understand the substance, we use observation, inquiry, inspection, analytical procedures. These are our risk assessment procedures. That's what's supposed to give us assurance to find out the substance of the system. Don't show me a flowchart, although a flowchart helps, but that's not providing me any assurance at all. Number seven, in obtaining an understanding of a manufacturer's, manufacturing entity's internal control concerning inventory balances, an auditor most likely would, well, again, think where we are in the audit process, obtaining an understanding. We're in the second step. We're in the planning phase. In the planning phase, you're not going to answer A, analyze liquidity ratios, turnover ratios. You're not going to answer B, perform analytical procedures, not in the planning phase. Not in the planning phase when you're just obtaining an understanding of internal control policies and procedures. You're not applying analytical procedures at that stage. In the planning phase, of course, in the overall planning phase, we are required to use analytical procedures. But we're not using analytical procedures to understand internal control. And in the planning phase, we're not in obtaining an understanding. We're not, answer D, performing test counts. That's more of a substantive test. No, what we're doing in the planning phase, in obtaining an understanding of the system, is, answer C, reviewing the entity's description of inventory policies and procedures. That's what we're doing at that stage of the audit. Number eight, after obtaining an understanding of the entity and its environment and assessing the risk of material misstatement, an auditor decides to perform a test of controls. Now, let's stop right there. At, they've obtained an understanding of the entity and its environment and its internal control, and they've assessed the risk of material misstatement. So we're out of the planning phase now, and they've decided to perform tests of controls. Well, if you've decided... To, to do tests of controls, has the auditor assessed the internal control structure to be weak or strong? What do you think if they're going to do tests of controls? Well, the auditor has assessed that the internal control structure is strong, not weak. If the, inter if the, inter if the auditor assesses the internal control structure to be weak, in other words, if the auditor assesses control risk to be high, they're not going to test the controls. Why would you keep testing the controls to show how bad they are. You wouldn't. No, you, you test controls when you assess control risk to be low. When you've decided that the internal control structure is strong, that's when you test controls to confirm that they're as strong, that the controls are as strong as you think they are. 
That's when you test controls. So that's what's going on here. They're going to test controls. They must think the internal control structure is strong. Control risk is low. The auditor most likely decided that answer D says there were many internal control weaknesses. No, it's not answer D. No, this internal control structure is strong. So are we going to test the controls to make sure they're as strong as we think they are? It's not C. They're not increasing the assessed level of control risk for certain assertions. If they're going to increase the level of control risk, they think internal controls are weak. They're not going to test those controls. And it's not B. To say additional evidence to support a further reduction in control risk is not available. It might be. Hopefully it will be. Doesn't, that's, that's not what the auditor has decided. What the auditor has decided is A, that it's more efficient to perform tests of controls that would result in a reduction of it would be more efficient to perform tests of controls that would result in a reduction in substantive testing. That's, what, that's the purpose. It's more efficient to test the controls, confirm that they're strong, and that's going to result in much less substantive testing. You have to do less further audit procedures. Remember these relationships. If control risk goes down, you can set your detection risk higher an inverse relationship. And if detection risk is higher, that means you can do much less substantive testing. That's really the objective. So the auditor has decided that it's more efficient. I'll test the controls, determine how strong they are, and therefore I can do less further audit procedures, less substantive testing. Number nine, inherent risk and control risk differ from detection risk in that. All right, so they want to know how inherent risk and control risk differ from detection risk. How about A? They differ in that they arise from the misapplication of auditing procedures. That's what detection risk is. You can't say they're, that's not how inherent risk and control risk differ from detection risk. Answer A is what detection risk is. It's not how they differ. Do they differ in the sense that they may be assessed in either quantitative or non-quantitative terms. No, they all can be. They all can be, can be assessed in either quantitative or non-quantitative terms. So that's not how they differ. They all can be. How about D? They can be changed at the auditor's discretion. Well, the auditor's assess, assessment of inherent risk, assessment of control risk, can be changed at the auditor's discretion. That's true. But the actual, the actual inherent risk of, say, cash, the actual control risk in a system, that these risks exist whether there's an auditor or not, and the auditor can't change them at their discretion. As I say, the auditor's assessment of inherent risk can be changed. The auditor's assessment of control risk can be changed at the auditor's discretion. But the actual risk can't be changed. There's a certain amount of inherent risk in a given account, you know, in a given disclosure. There's a certain amount of control risk in any internal control structure. That can't be changed. It exists, whether there's an audit or not, and it can't be changed at the auditor's discretion. So that's not how they differ, although detection risk can be. The auditor, the auditor can set the detection risk where they want it to be so they, they achieve the overall audit risk that they're willing to take. The answer is C. Inherent risk and control risk differ from detection risk in that they exist independently of the audit. That's exactly right. There's inherent risk in cash, whether there's an audit or not. There's control risk in any internal control structure, whether there's an, whether there's an audit or not. But detection risk only exists if there's an audit. Because it's the risk, the auditor will fail to detect material misstatements that exist in an audit. So detection risk only exists if there is an audit. So that is how they differ. And number 10, the acceptable level of detection risk is inversely related to what? What is detection risk inversely related to? Hope you went right to it. Answer A, the assurance provided by substantive testing. If an auditor 
sets their detection risk low. They want there to be a low probability. They'll fail to detect material misstatements. Then what happens to substantive testing? It goes much higher. You do much more substantive testing, much further audit procedures. It's an inverse relationship. Keep studying. Don't fall behind. And I'll look to see you in the next class. Welcome back. In this class, we're going to continue our discussion of internal control. And as we know, there are five components that make up internal control. There's control activities. There's risk assessment, information and communication, monitoring, and the environment. And the way we're going to remember those components for the rest of our lives is crime. Strong internal control should help to prevent crime. And what we're going to focus on specifically in this class is the C in crime, control activities, the specific policies and procedures that are in place that will assure that all transactions are properly initiated, authorized, approved, executed, and recorded. Now, when we say control activities, what sort of control activities are we looking for? I want to give you a memory tool. I want to give you a memory tool on the type of control activities that should be in any really strong internal control structure. And I think you'll find that this memory tool will help you, of course, with multiple choice and perhaps in a simulation. If you're given a narrative of a system, maybe a flow chart, what control activities do you look for? Well, let's go over the control activities that belong, that are essential in a strong internal control structure. My memory tool is Band-Aids. Just remember, the way you stop the bleeding is with Band-Aids. Let's go over what it stands for. The B in Band-Aids is bonding. Employees that work with cash, liquid assets, securities, should be bonded. And as you probably know, bonding is an insurance policy. And it works on a number of levels. First of all, if an employee does steal cash, the client is insured. So they would get an insurance recovery. But it works on another level as well. Before any insurance company pays out a claim, they do a thorough investigation. They get to the bottom of what happened. They find out who was responsible. And not only do we know that, the employees know that. And you know the insurance companies have a reputation. They are brutal. They get to the bottom of what happened. And as I say, employees know that. So it serves as a deterrent as well. It's a good control. So if cash is stolen, if liquid assets are stolen, the, the client would get a recovery. Of course, that's important. But don't forget that, ter that deterrent effect. Employees know that the insurance company would not pay out a claim without finding out who was responsible. It's an important control with liquid assets. The A in Band-Aids is authorization and approval. It's critical to control how transactions are initiated, authorized, and approved. Very important controls. The N in Band-Aids, numeric and cross-checks. Numeric checks, very simple things. Pre-numbered documents. Pre-numbered, you don't think of it as a control. It's a control. Pre-numbered checks. Pre-numbered purchase orders pre-numbered receiving reports. It's an important control because if they're pre-numbered, then we know the total population of something. It's a very essential control. Cross-checks. There should be cross-checks, many cross-checks in a, in a good system. A bank reconciliation is a cross-check. You'll see later in these classes, we're going to go through the purchases accounts payable system. And in the purchases accounts payable system, the accounts payable department does a cross-check between the original purchase requisition and the purchase order and the receiving report and the vendor's invoice. There's a cross-check between all those documents before the accounts payable department prepares a voucher package. Cross-checks, very important in a strong internal control structure. The D is documentation. Documentation is essential for the audit trail. Again, later in these classes, when we talk about the purchases accounts payable cycle, 
we're going to see all these documents have been filed for the audit trail. The original purchase requisitions, the purchase orders, the receiving reports, the invoices, the voucher packages. There's an accounts payable subsidiary ledger. Everything is documented. Everything is recorded. It's essential for internal audit. And it's an important control. And of course it helps and it's essential for monitoring the M in crime to monitor the system. It has to be fully documented. The A in band-aids would be appropriate physical controls. Simple things, locks on doors, employee ID badges, a safe. These are controls. There should be appropriate physical controls. The I is the internal audit function. The internal audit function, it, having an internal audit function is a control in itself. And again, it helps with the M in crime to monitor the system. The second D is detailed personnel policies and procedures. They have to be detailed, very carefully detailed personnel policies and procedures. Who does the hiring? Who does the firing? Who approves pay raises? Uh, things you might not think of, forced vacations. You know, if there is collusion in a system, if somebody is doing something and hiding something in the records, it's very hard to do that unless you show up every day and keep the con game going. So having forced vacations is a control, something you'd look for in detailed personnel, policies and procedures. And the S in Band-Aids, do I even have to say it? You know what the S stands for, segregation of duties. It is essential for internal control that we separate authorization from record keeping and custody of assets. A-R-C, separate authorization, record keeping, and custody of assets. That's the arc that protects us from a sea of troubles. We never want an employee to be in a position where, can, where they can both perpetrate something and cover it up in the records. That would be an incompatible function. And the way we prevent incompatible functions is by having a proper separation of duties. So if you know Band-Aids, and I know you will, that should help you in many types of questions in the exam because it should be in your head. You know, what specific control activities should a strong internal control structure have? And number one, they say after testing a client's internal control activities, an auditor discovers a material weakness in the operation of a client's internal control. Under these circumstances, the auditor most likely would, A says, issue a disclaimer because there's a weakness in, in internal control. No. C says, issue a qualified opinion. No. Not because there's a weakness in internal control. Withdraw, answer D, withdraw from the engagement? No, no answer B. If there's a weakness in internal control, they're going to increase their assessed level of control risk and therefore increase substantive testing. Remember, there's a direct relationship between the risk of material misstatement and audit procedures. If the risk of material misstatement goes up, and remember, risk of material misstatement is a combination of control risk an inherent risk. So if you've increased your assessed level of control risk, the risk of material misstatements has gone up. And if the risk of material misstatements has gone up, you have to do much more extensive further audit procedures, much more ex extensive substantive testing. That's the effect. Answer B. Number two, the ultimate purpose of assessing control risk is to contribute to the auditor's evaluation of the risk of what? Answer D, material misstatements. That's, that's the ultimate purpose of assessing control risk. It's coming up with auditor's evaluation of the risk of material misstatements that exist in the financial statements. Answer D. It's not answer A. It's not to contribute to the auditor's evaluation of the risk that specific internal control activities are not operating as designed, that is control risk. So you can't say the purpose of control risk is to 
contribute to the auditor's evaluation of control risk. A is control risk. So is B. The collective effect of the control environment may not achieve the control objective. That's really part of control risk. And it's not to contribute to the auditor's evaluation of the risk that tests of controls may fail to identify activities relevant to assertions. That's not the ultimate purpose. No, the ultimate purpose of assessing control risk is to evaluate the risk of errors and fraud in the financial statements. Number three, what is the most likely course of action that an auditor would take after determining that performing substantive tests on inventory will take less time than performing tests of controls? Well, if to start with, before you even start looking at answers, what does that mean to you? If an auditor has decided that performing substantive tests on inventory will take less time, in other words, be more efficient than testing controls, well, then controls must not be very good. Right? If the controls were strong, then your best course of action is to test some controls, make sure that they're operating effectively, and do much less substantive testing. It's much more efficient. But here they've decided that doing more substantive testing will be more efficient. Well, the controls must not be very good. So they want to know what is the most likely course of action. It's not D, perform only tests of controls. Why would you test the controls? We've already decided that they're not, they're not very good. It's not D. A says assess control at the minimum level. No, at, at maximum. Controls must be not very good here. So you wouldn't assess control risk to be at minimum, probably at maximum. And would, be, would the most likely course of action be B, perform both tests of controls and substantive tests? No. Why would you want to do both? If, take, if performing substantive tests is going to take less time, it's going to be more efficient, then the answer is C. Just perform only substantive tests. Why test the controls? We don't have to prove how bad they are. Let's just go right to substantive testing. It'll take less time. What we're going to get into next is how an auditor handles deficiencies in internal controls identified during the course of an audit. And the bottom line is an auditor is required, required to submit a written communication to management and those in charge of governance on any significant deficiencies and material weaknesses found during the course of an audit. That's the bottom line. An auditor is required to submit a written communication to management and those in charge of governance on significant deficiencies and material weaknesses found during the course of an audit. Let's get into some definitions. What's a control deficiency? A control deficiency is a deficiency in design, a deficiency in design or operation of controls that does not allow management or employees to prevent, detect, correct material misstatements on a timely basis. Let me go over that again. A control deficiency is a deficiency in design. That means the control's not there. When you see a, there's a deficiency in design, it means the control's not there. Or operation. That means the control is there, it's just not effective. So when you see, oh, a, a weakness in control, that, in, in operation, that means the control is there, it's just not effective. All right, so it's a deficiency in design, the control's not there, or operation, it's there but it's not effective, of controls that does not allow management or employees to prevent, detect, correct material misstatements, errors and fraud on a timely basis. And as we said, an auditor is required to submit a written communication to management and those in charge of governance for control deficiencies that are, that are determined to be significant deficiencies or determined to be material weaknesses. That's what we're saying that an auditor is required to submit a written communication to management and those in charge of governance for control deficiencies that have been determined to be significant deficiencies or material weaknesses. M let's go over what these are. What's a significant deficiency? A significant deficiency is a very bad control deficiency. That's what we're saying. A significant deficiency is simply a very bad control deficiency. More precisely, it is an internal control deficiency or a combination of deficiencies 
important enough to merit attention to management and those in charge of governance. One more time, a significant deficiency, a very bad control deficiency. It's a deficiency or a combination of deficiencies important enough to merit attention by management or those in charge of governance. What's a material weakness? A material weakness is a very bad significant deficiency. That's what a material weakness is. It's a very bad significant deficiency. It is a deficiency or a combination of deficiencies such that there is a reasonable possibility that material misstatements are not being prevented, detected, corrected on a timely basis. One more time, a material weakness is a very bad significant deficiency. It is a deficiency or a combination of deficiencies such that there's a reasonable possibility that material misstatements in the financial statements are not being prevented, detected, corrected on a timely basis. Now, if you look in your viewer's guide, you'll see an example of this written communication. Just to point out a couple of things. If you look at it, you'll see in the required written communication that it states what the auditor did, what the CPA did, the purpose of an audit. It's, it states that they are not expressing an opinion on the effectiveness of internal control. Notice that. It is stating that they are not expressing an opinion on the effectiveness of an internal control. They're also stating that the consideration of internal control is not designed to identify all deficiencies in internal control that might be significant deficiencies or material weaknesses. Notice we state that the consideration of internal control is not designed to identify all deficiencies in internal control that might be significant deficiencies or material weaknesses. And then the report defines what a significant deficiency is, what a material weakness is, and then identifies all the significant deficiencies and the material weaknesses that were found. And notice there's a restriction. Make sure you read that over. And you see the bottom line. If no significant deficiencies or material weaknesses are found, no written communication is required, right? It's that simple. If no significant deficiencies or material weaknesses are found, no written communication is required. If any significant deficiencies or material weaknesses are found, a written communication is required. What if the following year? You know, the auditor goes back to the client and the significant deficiency, the material weakness hasn't been fixed. Well, the CPA keeps reporting on that deficiency until it is fixed. What is the deadline for this written communication? Well, if it's a non-issuer, if the client's a non-issuer, the written communication has to, be, has to be filed by the audit report release date. Again, if the client's a non-issuer, the written communication has to be filed by the audit report release date, but under no circumstances can it be filed more than 60 days after the audit, re audit report release date. That's the rule. You know, the exam loves deadlines. So one more time, if the client's a non-issuer, the written communication has to be filed basically by the audit report release date, but under no circumstances can it be filed more than 60 days after the audit report release date. No more than 60 days after the audit report release date. The exam loves deadlines. Now, if your client is an issuer, then the written communication has to be filed before the audit report is released. Before the audit report is released. What if your client requests a written communication that says no significant deficiencies, no material weaknesses were found? You know, what if your client wants that? Your client would like a written communication that states no significant deficiencies, no material weaknesses were found. That's never done. I mean, unless it were required by a governmental agency, say, that would be very rare. But that's no, really never done because it could be misconstrued. I will look to see you in the next class. And there are two questions I want you to get done before I see you in the next class. And in the meantime, keep studying. Don't fall behind. Welcome back to our discussion on internal control. Let's do the two questions I wanted you to answer before we get into new areas. Number one says, which of the following matters would an auditor most likely consider to be a significant deficiency to be communicated to management and those charged with governance? Remember what a significant deficiency is. It's a very bad control deficiency. 
It's a deficiency or a combination of deficiencies important enough to merit attention. So what's going to be a significant deficiency here? How about A, management's failure to, to renegotiate unfavorable long-term purchase commitments? Well, that may not be great management, but it's not really related to internal control. Um, might indicate poor judgment. That would not be a significant deficiency. B, recurring operating losses that may indicate a going concern problem. Again, may or may not have anything to do with internal control. D, management's current plans to reduce its ownership equity in the entity. May or may not have anything to do with internal control. But answer C, evidence of a lack of objectivity by those responsible for accounting decisions. That looks like a serious internal control problem. That could be a significant deficiency, maybe even a material weakness. You know, material weakness is a deficiency or a combination of deficiencies that cause a reasonable possibility that material misstatements are not being prevented, detected, corrected on a timely basis. Might even be a material weakness, certainly a significant deficiency. Number two, which of the following is least likely, least likely to indicate the existence of a material weakness in internal control? Remember what a material weakness is, a very bad significant deficiency. It's a deficiency or a combination of deficiencies that would cause a reasonable possibility that material misstatements are not being prevented, detected, corrected on a material, on a timely basis. So which of the following would least likely indicate that there's a material weakness? A says fraud on the part of senior management. No, no, that would, that could certainly be a material weakness. That's not it. That likely is. B, previously issued financial statements were restated to reflect the correction of a material misstatement due to errors or fraud. So it could be an indication of a material weakness. C, those charged with governance exercise ineffective oversight of the entity's financial reporting and internal control. I would say, but almost by definition, that is a material weakness. Answer D, there's a substantial doubt about the entity's ability to continue as a going concern. That may have nothing to do with internal control. That's least likely to be a material weakness. Answer D. Now, what we're going to get into next in this class are some transaction cycles. And the transaction cycles we're going to go through come up a lot in the exam. You'll see when you do your homework, a lot of multiple choice refer to these cycles and the documents and the controls in these cycles. There are simulations that come up that are all about these cycles and the documents in these cycles and the controls in these cycles. So I think it's important that we step them through. Let's start with the purchases accounts payable transaction cycle. Let's go through the flow of documents. Think about the controls that are, that are built into a you know, classic purchases and accounts payable transaction cycle. Notice the cycle all begins in the user department. You know, the user department is using the raw material. And when they run out, they prepare a pre-numbered, notice the numeric check, right? It's, it's pre-numbered, we know the total population, a pre-numbered stores requisition. Copy one is filed for the audit trail. Notice the first D in Band-Aids, documentation. It's really how you monitor the system. You need that audit trail. Copy one is filed. Copy two goes to the storeroom. Now let's go to the storeroom. Storeroom would receive the store's, requi store requ store's requisition and send the goods back to the user department. That's what happens on a daily basis. The store's requisition comes in to the storeroom and they send the material back. But what happens when the storeroom runs out of raw material? Well, the storeroom prepares a pre-numbered, another numeric check, purchase requisition. Copy one is filed for documentation for the audit trail for monitoring. Copy two goes to accounts payable, and copy three goes to the purchasing department. Now let's go to the purchasing department. Now let's think about the A in Band-Aids, authorization, approval. Obviously, the purchasing department has been authorized to handle purchasing for this company. You know, 
to certain vendors within budget limits. But there's been authority given to the purchasing department to order goods like this. And there would have to be, this is where the approval would take place. The approval for this particular transaction would be handled here. And the purchasing department receives copy three of the purchase requisition, and the purchasing department prepares a pre-numbered, another numeric check, purchase order. Copy one of the purchase order is filed for the audit trail. Copy two goes to the vendor. Copy three goes to the receiving department, and notice it's a blind copy. The quantity ordered is blacked out so that when the receiving department gets their copy of the purchase order, the quantity's been blacked out. They have no preconceived notion of what's supposed to come in. It's another control. And copy four goes to accounts payable. Let's go to the receiving department. The receiving department receives copy three of the purchase order, the blind copy, and they prepare a pre-numbered, another numeric check, receiving report. Now, what happens to the pre-numbered receiving report? Copy one is filed for documentation for the audit trail. Copy two goes to accounts payable. And copy three, they, they fill in the number they received and send it back to purchasing. You know what it's for, a cross-check. Here's a cross-check. Very important control because they got a blind copy. Now, when the, when the goods come in, they fill the number in, send it back to the purchasing department for a cross-check. All right, now let's go to accounts payable. Now, think what accounts payable has in its hands. Accounts payable has received copy three of the purchase requisition, copy four of the purchase order, copy two of the receiving report, and now the vendor's invoice comes in. There would now be another cross-check between all those documents. This purchase would be recorded by the accounts payable department in the accounts payable subsidiary ledger. And now the accounts payable department prepares a pre-numbered voucher package. All right, so the, the accounts payable department does a cross-check between the purchase requisition, the purchase order, the receiving report, and the vendor's invoice. There's a cross-check. They record the purchase in the accounts payable subsidiary ledger, uh, ledger, and now they prepare a pre-numbered voucher package. Copy one is filed. Copy two goes to general accounting, and copy three goes to the Treasury Department. Let's go to the Treasury Department. Treasury Department receives copy three of the voucher package. They do a cross-check on all the documents, and they prepare and mail the check. Notice custody of assets stays in one hand, just in one place. Have you noticed this system did, did separate authorization, record keeping, custody of assets. So they would prepare the check and mail the check. Also, the Treasury Department would approve write-offs. That's important to remember. If a receivable, a bad debt is written off, that's approved by the Treasury Department. Why? Because when you write off a receivable, you're disposing of an asset. It's, again, it's custody. We want to keep custody in one department. And notice the Treasury Department, after they mail the check, they cancel the voucher package. They perforate it. They stamp it so the documents can't be used again to justify another purchase. Now general accounting gets copy two of the voucher package. They post it to the general ledger. They update the general ledger. Now one of the reasons you study that transaction cycle, and again, I want to emphasize, you'll see in your homework, this is not just busy work. The purchases accounts payable cycle is referred to a lot in the exam. Multiple choice, even simulations, the flow of the documents. You want to be really good at this. And when you, when you go over, and I know you will several times, go over that purchases accounts payable cycle, study the flow of documents. Notice how we went from the storage requisition to the purchase requisition, to the purchase order, to the receiving report, to the vendor's invoice, to the accounts payable subsidiary ledger, to the voucher package, to the check itself, and to the general ledger. Right? Get that flow of documents in your head. You know, the user department prepares the storage requisition. The, the storeroom prepares the purchase requisition. The purchasing department prepares the purchase order. The receiving department prepares the receiving report. The vendor sends in the vendor's invoice. The accounts payable department updates the, the accounts payable subsidiary ledger. The accounts payable department prepares the voucher package. The treasury department prepares and mails the check. And 
general accounting, updates the general ledger. Let's look at another transaction cycle. Let's look at the sales accounts receivable cycle. Another one the exam is very fond of. Notice in the sales accounts receivable cycle, everything starts in the sales department. That's where it all starts, where the sales department receives a purchase order from a customer. They get the customer purchase order. Then the sales department prepares a pre-numbered, there's a first numeric check, six-copy sales order. There's a pre-numbered six-copy sales order. Copy one goes to the billing department with the customer's purchase order. That's what goes to the billing department. Copy two goes to the, ship, the shipping department. Copies three and four go to the credit department. Copy five goes back to the customer. And copy six is filed, and you know why. Documentation, audit trail, monitoring. That internal audit function so important, such an important control. All right, now the credit department. The credit department receives copies three and four of the sales order. They approve the customer credit, and then they send copy three, the approved sales order, to the shipping department, and copy four of the approved sales order to the billing department. Let's go to the shipping department. Shipping department received copy three of the approved sale order. They also received copy two of the original sales order from the sales department. And the shipping department prepares a pre-numbered, another numeric check, bill of lading. Bill of lading is a shipping document. So they prepare a pre-numbered bill of lading. Copy one goes to the customer. Copy two goes to the billing department. And copy three is filed along with copy three of the approved sales order and copy two of the original sales order. All that is filed for documentation, for the audit trail. And, of course, the goods are shipped to the customer. Let's go to the billing department. The billing department, what's in the billing department's hands? Billing department received copy two of the bill of lading from the shipping department. They received copy one of the original sales order and the customer purchase order from the sales department. And they also received copy four of the approved sales order from the credit department. And the billing department prepares a pre-numbered, another numeric check, sales invoice. There's a pre-numbered sales invoice. Copy one goes to the customer. Copy two goes to accounts receivable. Copy three goes to general accounting. And then copy four is filed, along with copy one of the original sales order, the original customer purchase order, and copy four of the approved sales order. And the billing department would post this sale to the sales journal. Let's go to the accounts receivable department. Accounts receivable department has received copy two of the sales invoice from the billing department. They post this sale to the customer's account and update the account receivable master. Or they you know, record it in the account receivable subsidiary ledger. Then general accounting receives copy three of the sales invoice from billing, and they post it to the general ledger. They update the general ledger. So once again, study that cycle. You know, just go over it several times, and again, pay particular attention to the flow of documents. Notice how we went from the customer's purchase order to the sales order to the approved sales order to the bill of lading, to the sales invoice, and the sales journal, the accounts receivable subsidiary ledger, and the general ledger. That's the flow. Believe me, it'll help you. It's another transaction cycle that is tested a lot in the exam. All right, so the customer sends in the purchase order. The sales department prepares the sales order. The credit department approves the sales, sales order. The shipping department prepares the bill of lading. The billing department prepares the sales invoice updates the sales journal. The accounts receivable department updates the accounts receivable subsidiary ledger. And, the, and general accounting updates the general ledger. Make sure you know that flow of documents. Let's look at another transaction cycle. These all turn up. Let's look at the cash receipts transaction cycle. Cash receipts. Now, for cash receipts, it would all start in the mailroom. We have an employee that opens the mail and prepares a pre-numbered, notice a numeric check, a pre-numbered daily remittance listing. You know, for all the checks that came in that day, there would be a pre-numbered daily remittance listing. Copy one is filed for documentation, for audit trail. 
copy two goes to the cashier if there is a cashier if there's not a cashier it would go to treasury go to the treasury department copy three goes to accounts receivable copy four goes to general accounting let's go to the cashier if they do have one it will be the cashier or the treasury department the cashier or the treasury department receives copy two of the daily remittance listing and they prepare a pre-numbered another numeric check a pre-numbered deposit summary because the cashier or the Treasury Department makes deposits daily. That's an important control. The deposits are made daily. So they prepare a pre-numbered deposit summary. Copy one is filed for documentation for the audit trail. Copy two goes to accounts receivable. Copy three goes to general accounting. The exam could mention a bank lockbox. A bank lockbox is a good control. That's where customers send checks directly to the bank. Also, I should mention bank reconciliations are an important cross-check. Bank reconciliation should be done monthly, usually by accounts, it's usually by internal audit. But bank reconciliation is important. It's an imp it's, it should be done monthly. It's an important cross-check, usually done by internal audit, maybe the finance area, usually internal audit. Let's go to accounts receivable. Accounts receivable gets copy two of the deposit summary from the cashier. They also get copy three of the remittance listing from the, from the mail room. And they update the account receivable master. And they prepare a pre-numbered, another numeric check, cash receipt summary. There's going to be a pre-numbered cash receipt summary. Copy one is filed for the documentation for the audit trail. And copy two goes to general accounting. Let's go to general accounting. And also in the accounts receivable department, they would record this cash receipt in the cash receipts journal. They would record the cash receipt in the cash receipts journal. Now let's go to general accounting. What, is gen what does general accounting have in its hands? They, they have copy four of the remittance listing from the mailroom, copy three of the deposit summary from the cashier or the treasury, copy two of the cash receipt summary from accounts receivable. So there's a cross check. They post it to the general ledger, they update the general ledger, and that's basically the flow. So once again, you want to study that basic flow of documents and get used to the flow of documents. We went from the remittance listing to the deposit summary to the account receivable master, cash receipts journal, cash receipts summary, general ledger. Make sure you go over that flow you know, several times because these transaction cycles are tested, as I say couple of things about property, plant, and equipment. We won't go into the same level of detail, but a couple of things to look out for in property, plant, and equipment. Um, for property, plant, and equipment, make sure that there's a control that major purchases have to be approved by the board of directors. Major purchases, property, plant, and equipment, should be approved by the board of directors. Uh, there should be a control that there's adequate insurance coverage. There should be physical controls restricting access to property, plant, and equipment. And there also should be a, a stated policy regarding whether to expense something or capitalize something. In terms of human resources, payroll, remember the second D in Band-Aids is detailed personnel policies and procedures. A couple of things to look out for. You know, the human resources department should hire people, fire people. All right, there should be detailed personnel policies and procedures and the human resources department should hire people fire people and approve salary changes the payroll department should just process payroll and a good control is to have a separate payroll account called an impressed account it's an impressed account where you, you put in the exact amount that's needed for payroll so when everybody cashes their check the balance goes to zero couple other small things, if there is a signature machine for checks, any unused checks should be locked up. Unclaimed payroll checks should be handled by internal audit. Again, my advice from this class is make sure you take the time. I know it's not exciting, but take the time to go over those transaction cycles. Make sure you do and study the flow of documents. You'll see later in our classes this is going to help you with, with evidence as well. When we talk about tracing and vouching, 
to know these documents and the flow of documents and these transaction cycles will help you a great deal. Now, for the next class, there are 15 questions that I want you to have answered. 15. Please answer those questions, and I will look to see you in the next class. Welcome back. In this class, there are 15 questions that we're going to do together, and hopefully you've answered these 15 questions, you have your answers, and now we'll go through them together. Number one says, a weakness in internal control over recording retirements of equipment most likely would cause an auditor to what? Well, I think you know it's not A, trace additions to the other assets account to search for equipment that's still on hand but no longer being used. If it's still on hand, it hasn't been retired. Remember, we're looking for a weakness in internal control over recording retirements of equipment. So if this equipment's still on hand, it hasn't been retired. And it's not C, review the subsidiary ledger to ascertain whether depreciation was taken. That has nothing to do with retirements. My point is it comes down to B or D. That's what you might have really got stuck on. What's your best approach if you're an auditor, if you think there's a weakness in recording retirements? How about D? What if you inspect, what if you inspect certain items of equipment in the plant and then trace those items back to the accounting records? No, that doesn't work because if the items are in the plant, they haven't been retired. Remember, we're afraid there's a weakness in recording retirements of equipment. So if you start by finding something in the plant, it hasn't been retired. The answer is B. You want to select certain items of equipment from the accounting records and then see if you can find them in the plant. That makes sense, doesn't it? If you start by selecting certain items of equipment in the accounting records and then see if you can locate them in the plant, you might find that you have found equipment in the accounting records that you cannot find in the plant because they've been retired and it hasn't been recorded. That's how you would test to see if there's a weakness in recording retirements. Answer B. Number two. An entity's internal control requires that for every check request, there be an approved voucher supported by a pre-numbered purchase order and a pre-numbered receiving report. Sounds like a pretty good system to me. To determine whether checks are being issued for unauthorized expenditures. Are checks being issued for unauthorized expenditures? An auditor most likely would select items for testing from the population of what? Well, if you want to see if checks are going for unauthorized purchases, unauthorized expenditures, you would start with answer B. Start with the population of checks. You want to pick a, a selection of checks and then vouch back to all the supporting documentation and see if it was authorized. You don't want to go to purchase orders. You know they've been authorized. Receiving reports, that would be based on an authorized purchase order. A vouchers would have all sorts of authority attached to it. You know that A, B, and D all would be authorized, would, be, would involve an authorized transaction. But if you think there are checks going out for unauthorized, start with a population of checks. Get a, a random sample of checks and then see if you can find all the supporting documentation and see if there's any checks going out that are for unauthorized expenditures. You can't find the documentation or the documentation is not valid. Three. For effective internal control, the accounts payable department generally would, what would accounts payable do? Would it A, obliterate the quantity ordered on the receiving department copy of the purchase order? No, the purchasing department does that, not accounts payable. C says stamp, perforate, or otherwise cancel the supporting documentation after a payment is ma made. The treasury department does that. See why you have to know these cycles. D, ascertain whether each requisition is approved as to price, quantity, and quality by an authorized employee. Who would, who would handle the approval on a purchase requisition? The purchasing department. So A, B, A, C, and D can't be it. It is B, accounts payable, would establish the agreement of the vendor's invoice with the receiving report, the purchase order, the purchase requisition before they prepare the voucher package. It is answer B. That is something the accounts payable department would do. See why you have to know these cycles. Number four, an auditor tests, an auditor's tests of controls 
for completeness for the revenue cycle usually include determining whether A says each receivable is collected subsequent to year end. Well, that doesn't tell you whether revenue is complete. It just means all the receivables that have been recorded are collected. It doesn't t tell you whether there's a bunch of receivables that have never been recorded. You don't know whether revenue is complete there, just that all the receivables that have been recorded have been collected. How about C? Each invoice is supported by a customer purchase order. Well, that, that's a good control. But you don't know that all the invoices have been recorded that should be, that revenue is complete. D says each credit memo is approved. That's probably for return merchandise. Nothing to do with how, whether revenue is complete. Now, the answer is B. You want to see if there's an invoice for every shipping document. Every, every time goods have been shipped, there's an invoice prepared. Then you know revenue is complete. That would be your test. Look at all the shipping documents and make sure that there's an invoice for every shipping document. Every time something's been shipped, there's an invoice. Then revenue would be complete. Number five, which of the following controls would be most effective in assuring that recorded purchases are free of material errors? What's the most effective control here? How about A, what if the receiving department compares the quantity ordered on the purchase order with the quantity received in the receiving report. Receiving department wouldn't be able to do that because their purchase order is a blind copy. They don't know the amount that was ordered. Remember, that would have to go back to the purchasing department to make this comparison. Receiving department would fill in the amount received, send it back to purchasing, and they would do the comparison, not the receiving department. That doesn't make sense. How about B? Vendors' invoices are compared with the purchase orders by an employee who is independent of the receiving department. Well, that's a good control. But remember, we're looking for the, mo the most effective. But B is not a bad control in accounts payable. C, receiving reports require the signature of an individual who, is, who authorized the purchase. I don't see the purpose of that, really. Uh, the, receiving the receiving department bases everything on an approved purchase order. I don't see why the receiving report would need a signature. That, that doesn't make any sense at all. The answer, of course, is D. Notice, purchase orders, receiving reports, and vendor's invoices are all cross-checked, independently matched before you prepare the voucher. And that, of course, is done by the accounts payable department. Does the, that, that impressive cross-check before there's a voucher package. That's the most effective control. Number six, which of the following procedures most likely would not, would not be an internal control procedure designed to reduce the risk of errors in the billing process? So what is not an internal control for the billing process here? A, comparing control totals for shipping documents with corresponding totals for sales invoices. No, that would be a control for billing. Making sure that for everything that's been shipped, there's an invoice. That's a control for billing. B, using computer program controls on the pricing and mathematical accuracy of the sales invoice. That's obviously a control on billing. We're looking for what would not be. C, matching shipping documents with the approved sales order before there is an invoice prepared. Definitely a control for billing. But look at D, reconciling the control totals for sales invoices with the accounts receivable subsidiary ledger. Well, yeah, that is a control, but it's not a control for billing because it's too late. If you are reconciling, you know, adding up all your sales invoices and making sure that corresponds to what went into the accounts receivable subsidiary ledger, well, the billing's already taken place. You're adding up all the invoices that have gone out. That's not a control for billing. Billing has already happened. Seven, in testing controls over cash disbursements, an auditor most likely would determine that the person who signs the checks mails the checks. Answer D. You keep the custody of assets in one department. Separate authorization, record keeping, and custody of assets. Eight, the authority to accept incoming goods in, a rece in receiving 
should be based on what? An approved purchase order. That's the authority to receive incoming goods in the receiving department. It's based on an approved purchase order. Answer D. Nine, which of the following describes a weakness in accounts payable procedures? A says the accounts payable clerk files invoices and supporting documentation after payment. Nothing wrong with that. Documentation controls, audit trail, monitoring. It's good. It's good control. B, the accounts payable clerk manually verifies arithmetic on the vendor invoice. What's wrong with that? It's a good control. They want to know a weakness. The accounts, answer C, the accounts payable system compares the receiving report to the vendor invoice. Sounds like a good control to me. Answer D, the accounts payable manager issues purchase orders? No, that's a breakdown in control. Who should issue the purchase orders? The purchasing department. That's a breakdown in separation of duties. No, the accounts payable manager should not issue purchase orders. The purchasing department should. Ten, which of the following circumstances most likely would cause an auditor to, su to suspect an employee payroll fraud scheme? What's going to make you suspect fraud in payroll? <clears throat> B says payroll checks are, are dispersed by the same employee every payday. Nothing wrong with that that I can see. doesn't indicate fraud. C, employee time cards are approved by individual department supervisors. That seems fine. A separate payroll bank account is maintained on an impressed basis. That impressed account idea is actually a pretty good idea. Everybody cashes their check. The account goes to zero. What might indicate this, this fraud is A, there are significant unexplained variances, unexplained variances between standard and actual labor costs. If you have unexplained variances, maybe the explanation is fraud. Maybe that is the explanation. Number 11, proper authorization of write-offs of uncollectible accounts should be approved by who? Treasurer. Answer D, custody of assets. We separate authorization, record keeping, and custody of assets. And if you approve a write-off, you're disposing of an asset. When you write off a receivable, that's what you're doing. So we keep custody and the disposal of an asset, the Treasury Department. Twelve, employers bond employees who handle cash receipts because fidelity bonds reduce the possibility of employing dishonest individuals, and I'm sure you went right to answer B. It's deterrence. It deters dishonesty by making employees aware that insurance companies investigate and prosecute you bet they do. They're animals. And everybody knows it. And it's good. It's a deterrent. It's what it's meant to be. Thirteen. When, excuse me, which of the following situations most likely would lead, could lead to an embezzlement scheme? Well, A says the accounts receivable bookkeeper receives a list of payments prepared by the cashier personally makes entries in the customer's accounts in the subsidiary ledger. I don't see any problem there. B, each vendor invoice is matched with a related purchase order or receiving report by the voucher's payable bookkeeper who personally approves the voucher for payment. That's okay. Nothing that, nothing that would lead to embezzlement there. D, vouchers and supporting documentation are examined and then canceled by the treasurer who personally mails the checks. That seems like strong internal control to me. Look at answer C. Access to blank checks and signature plates is restricted to the cash disbursements bookkeeper who personally reconciles the bank statement. Remember, bank statements, it's an important cross-check. Bank statements should be, should be reconciled monthly. It's an important cross-check by the internal audit department, generally, internal audit. But a bank reconciliation should never be done by an employee who handles cash. You know, keeps records, signs checks, handles receipts or disbursements. Never. Say it again. Bank reconciliations should be done every month, probably by internal audit, maybe the finance area, maybe. But 
Never buy an employee that handles cash. Never buy an employee that keeps records. Never buy an employee that signs checks. Never buy an employee who handles receipts or disbursements. Never. That could lead to fraud. Answer C. Number 14. Which of the following questions would an auditor least likely include on an internal control questionnaire concerning the initiation and execution of equipment transactions? You know, what question would you least likely find on an ICQ, an internal control questionnaire, concerning the initiation and execution of equipment transactions? A, are requests for major repairs approved at a higher level than the department initiating the request? No, that would be on an ICQ regarding the initiation and execution of equipment transactions. That is about initiation, execution. B, are pre-numbered purchase orders used for equipment and periodically accounted for? That would certainly be a reasonable question on that internal control questionnaire. C, are requests for purchases of equipment reviewed for consideration of soliciting competitive bids? That certainly belongs on that internal control questionnaire. But answer D, are procedures in place to monitor and properly restrict access to equipment? Well, that could be on an internal control questionnaire, but not on an internal, qu internal control questionnaire concerning just the initiation and execution of equipment transactions. Access is, is, an, is a control, and it might be on an internal control questionnaire about access, but not about the initiation and execution of equipment transactions. Wouldn't be on that ICQ. That would least likely be there. Answer D. And finally, number 15. Which of the following events occurring in the year under audit would most likely indicate that internal controls utilized in previous years may be inadequate in the year under audit? How about A? The entity announced that the internal audit function would be eliminated after the balance sheet date. Well, that might be a problem in future years. That doesn't indicate that a control you relied on in prior years you know, might not be effective in the current audit. No, they're going to eliminate the internal audit function. That's not a good sign. I don't like it. But again, that could, that could affect future years, not the year under audit. B says, the audit committee chairperson unexpectedly resigned during the year under audit. That may or may not have anything to do with internal controls. D. The frequency of accounts payable check runs was changed from bi-weekly to weekly. That could just indicate an increase in volume, I mean, a, different, a, different, a different policy. That does not indicate that you know, controls that you relied on in previous years can't be relied on this, on this year. Look at answer C. The chief financial officer waived approvals on all checks to one particular vendor to expedite payment. All of it. So there's been a breakdown in controls here, controls that we've always used in the past now there's been a breakdown in the current year for this particular vendor. That, that, could, that could indicate that the control we used to rely on is inadequate for the, the current year under audit. I hope you did well on that set of questions. And as always, I worry that you're careful not to fall behind. Keep studying. And I'll look to see you in the next class. Welcome back. In this class, we're going to begin our discussion of audit evidence. And as I'm sure you know, audit evidence refers to all the information gathered by the auditor during the course of the audit, which will form a basis for the auditor's opinion on the financial statements. We're talking about all the information gathered by the auditor during the course of the audit, whether it's through observation, inquiry, analysis, examination, whether it's in documentary form or electronic form, which will serve as a basis for the auditor's opinion on the financial statements. And when you think about it, in just about every step of the audit process, the auditor is gathering and analyzing audit evidence, except for the sixth and final step in the audit process, where the auditor forms an opinion based on the evidence and issues the audit report in every other step of the audit process. The auditor is gathering and analyzing audit evidence, even in the first step of the audit process, 
when the auditor establishes an understanding with the client. That understanding is documented in the engagement letter. The engagement letter will be part of the work papers. Really, the engagement letter is the first piece of evidence in an audit, always the first piece of evidence in the audit. Then we move into the second step, the planning phase. In the planning phase, we obtain an understanding of the client and its environment, including internal control. And in the second step of the audit process, in the planning phase, the auditor performs risk assessment procedures. Observation, inquiry, inspection, and even analytical procedures. And in the risk assessment process, the auditor is trying to identify items that have a high degree of inherent risk. You know what inherent risk is. It's the risk that a given account by its very nature could be misstated. By its very nature, it could be subject to errors and fraud. Cash has a lot of inherent risk. So the auditor is gathering evidence right away to try to identify items that have a high degree of inherent risk. The auditor is using analytical procedures in the risk assessment process, like ratios to identify significant changes from the last accounting period to the current accounting period. The auditor might be comparing budgeted amounts to actual amounts. Again, looking for significant changes, but the auditor is gathering, analyzing evidence. In the third step of the audit process, the auditor is going to use their understanding of the client and its environment and the internal control to evaluate the risk of material misstatement in given assertions. And the auditor's evaluation of the risk of material misstatement in particular assertions will determine the nature of the evidence that will be required on the audit, the extent of the evidence that will be required on the audit, uh, required on the audit and also the timing of the evidence. Notice nature, extent, timing, the NET, the net we throw it. We always think of ourselves as auditors on a sea of transactions, throwing out our net, nature, extent, timing of audit procedures. And I know this makes sense to you. Why would the auditor's evaluation of the risk of material misstatement affect the nature of the evidence we gather on the audit? Because if the evaluation of, risk of, of, the, material, of the risk of material misstatement in a particular assertion is low, the auditor is going to rely more on the client's records. That's the type of evidence the auditor can rely on. But if the risk of material misstatement is high, the auditor is going to need more outside corroboration. So notice the nature of the evidence is affected by our evaluation of the risk of material misstatement. Also, the extent. If we evaluate the risk of material misstatement to be low, we don't need as much evidence. We're not going to have to gather as much evidence to support our opinion. But if we evaluate the risk of material misstatement to be high, we're going to need a lot more evidence. And then finally, timing as well. If we evaluate the risk of material misstatement to be low, we can do more interim testing. If we evaluate the risk of material misstatement to be high, we're going to do our testing at the year end. So notice, our evaluation of the risk of material misstatement in a particular assertion is going to affect the nature of the evidence that we gather, the extent of the evidence that we gather, and the timing of the evidence that we gather. Then in the fourth step of the audit process, now we get right down to it. We design and perform our audit procedures to address the risk of material misstatement in a particular assertion. Our audit procedures are going to include both tests of controls and substantive tests. Your basic tests of controls, observation, inquiry, inspection, and we may reperform some transactions. Substantive tests include both analytical procedures, and tests of details. But the point is that we're going to examine journals and ledgers and schedules. We're going to examine all the underlying accounting data that supports the financial statements. And of course, we as auditors gather all this evidence to test management assertions. You know, what is management asserting about account balances? What is management asserting about transactions? What is management asserting about balances? What is management asserting about disclosures? That's why we're gathering this evidence to test whether 
management assertions have any material misstatements. And again, we're talking about, man we're testing management assertions about account balances, transactions, totals, and also disclosures. And as you know, audit evidence also includes outside corroboration, accounts receivable confirmations, bank cutoff statements. And it's always important to remember that under U.S. generally accepted auditing standards, an audit must include both the client's records and also outside corroboration. Never forget that, that an audit done under U.S. generally accepted auditing standards must include evidence drawn from both the client's records and also outside corroboration. Another important point to remember, that substantive tests are required for all material assertions. I mean, we have some requirements here. Substantive tests are required for all material assertions. Then as we enter the fifth step of the audit process, we're evaluating the audit evidence. We're going to evaluate all the audit evidence to determine if there are any material misstatements in the financial statements. We're trying to determine, are there any misstatements in the financial statements that are so significant that a reasonable person could be misled? Are there any errors and fraud in the financial statements that are so material that the financial statements are misstated, that financial statements are not fairly stated? And of course, if the financial statements are not fairly, fairly stated, we're going to require our client to make an adjustment to those financial statements. And if they refuse, we're going to have to modify our, our opinion. And of course, the last step of the audit process, we have to form our opinion based on all the evidence, based on all the evidence we've drawn. We form an opinion and issue our audit report. But you can see that all through the audit process, the auditor is gathering and evaluating audit evidence. And we'll continue our discussion of audit evidence in our next class. I look to see you then. Welcome back. In this class, we're going to continue our discussion of audit evidence. And as we established in our last class, all through the audit process, the auditor is gathering and evaluating audit evidence. Now, I think we know what it means to gather evidence. It means, you know, get everything you can get your hands on. But how do we evaluate audit evidence? Well, under U.S. generally accepted auditing standards, to serve as a basis for an audit opinion, evidence must be both sufficient and appropriate. That's how we evaluate audit evidence. Is it both sufficient and appropriate? Because under U.S. generally accepted auditing standards, to serve as a basis for an opinion, evidence must be both, both sufficient and appropriate. What does sufficient mean? Well, it means enough. In the auditor's judgment, it's enough evidence to serve as a basis for an opinion. And of course, to judge sufficiency of evidence, the auditor has to consider the risk of material misstatement because if the risk of material misstatement is high, the auditor is going to require more evidence to be satisfied. If the risk of material misstatement is low, the auditor won't need as much evidence to be satisfied. And of course, the auditor also has to consider, in relation to sufficiency, the quality of the evidence. If the quality of the evidence is high, the auditor won't need as much. If the quality of the evidence is low, the auditor is going to require a lot more. Now, what, is, what does it mean to say that evidence has to be appropriate? To be considered appropriate, evidence has to be both, both relevant and reliable. That's what we mean by appropriateness, that the evidence has to be both, both relevant and reliable. Now, relevant means, you know, it's not off the wall. Relevant means that the evidence has to be related to the audit purpose. It has to be related to the assertion that you're testing. In other words, if you're testing management's assertion about investments, you don't go off and 
start looking at purchase orders. It has to be relevant. It has to be related to the audit purpose, the assertion you're testing, not off the wall, as I say. What does reliable mean? Well, for evidence to be reliable, it has to be persuasive, not conclusive beyond all doubt. That's not the standard. No, it has to be reliable. It has to be persuasive. And to decide how persuasive a piece of evidence is and the degree of persuasiveness that the auditor requires, the auditor is going to have to consider materiality, the materiality of the assertion and its inherent risk. In other words, the more inherent risk in an assertion, the more materiality related to the assertion the evidence is going to have to be more persuasive, more reliable. But here's what I'm getting to. In the exam, you could get a multiple choice or even a, a simulation where they want you to evaluate evidence and decide what's more reliable. They could ask you, for example, you know, what's more reliable, a bank statement or a client's purchase order? You know, what's more reliable, what's more persuasive, a, a client's receiving report or an accounts receivable confirmation. You know, you're in an exam, and they could ask you to do an evaluation like that. Which, you know, what evidence is more reliable? What evidence is more persuasive? So what I'm going to give you is a little table that I hope will help you answer whatever question the exam dreams up on what evidence would be more reliable, more persuasive. I'm going to give you five levels of reliability from the most reliable evidence to the least reliable. Let's start at the top. Level one, the most reliable evidence is the auditor's direct personal knowledge about something, you know, and observation of something. You know, that's, that's the most reliable evidence. That's level one. Can't beat that. Auditor's direct personal knowledge and observation about something. But let's go to level two. The second level would be evidence, so you know, it's a little less reliable, a little less persuasive, would be evidence that's externally generated and also externally circulated. Then level three, a little less reliable, would be evidence that's externally generated but internally circulated. And then level four, a little less reliable, would be evidence that's internally generated but externally circulated. And then finally, level five, the least reliable would be evidence that's internally generated and also internally circulated. So what does all this mean? Well, you know what the auditor's direct personal knowledge and observation of something is, but let's go to level two. What do I mean when I say evidence that's externally generated and also externally circulated? Well, a great example would be a bank cutoff statement. A bank cutoff statement is a statement from the bank that's mailed you know, from the bank to the auditor about 30 days after the audit. So notice, that bank statement is mailed from the bank. It's externally generated. And it comes directly to the auditor. It's externally circulated, right? It's both externally generated, it's mailed from the bank, and externally circulated. It comes directly to the auditor. In other words, my client never gets their hands on it. That's very persuasive, very reliable evidence. Another example of level two would be accounts receivable confirmations. Accounts receivable confirmations are on the client's letterhead, but the auditor mails the confirmation to the customers, and the customers mail the confirmations directly back to the auditor. So notice they really are level two because the auditor mails the confirmations to the customers, they're externally generated, and the customers mail the confirmations directly back to the auditor. They're externally circulated. Client never gets their grubby little hands on it. Very persuasive evidence. Very reliable. Now, since we're talking about accounts receivable confirmations, it's important to remember that there are two types of confirmations. There are, generally speaking, two types. Positive confirmations and negative confirmations. And it's very important that you understand the difference. With a positive confirmation, 
the, we're asking the customer to respond whether or not they agree with the balance. That's what we mean by a positive confirmation, where we ask the customer to respond whether or not they agree with the balance. And generally, you use positive confirmation when there's a small number of accounts, large dollar values, you know, weak internal controls over, over receivables. In other words, control risk is high. A lot of disputed accounts. That's generally when you want to use positive confirmation. When you have a small number of accounts, significant dollar values, weak internal control, control risk is high, a lot of disputed accounts. And another strength of positive confirmations, another huge strength of positive confirmation, is that the customer does not respond. Remember, we ask, we ask the customer to respond whether or not they agree with the balance that's on the confirmation. But if the customer does not respond, the auditor has to follow up. The auditor has to contact the customer, find out what the problem is, get to the bottom of it. It's another huge strength of positive confirmations that there's follow-up. Now, with a negative confirmation, I know you're ahead of me, with a negative confirmation, we, have, we ask the customer to respond only if they disagree with the balance. So it's hard to know what a non-response really means. Does it mean anything? I mean, presumably, a client would act in their own interest. Excuse me, presumably, a customer would act in their own best interests. So if we send a statement of their account and it's overstated, they'll respond. Because presumably, customers would act rationally and protect their own interests. But what if the mistake is in their favor? Would they respond? You know, it's hard to know. What does a non-response really mean? Can you really infer anything from a non-response? Generally, we use negative confirmation, where we ask the customer to respond only if they disagree with the balance. When we have a large number of accounts, small dollar values, internal controls are strong. You know, control risk is low. You know, very few disputed accounts. Now, they're both used. Make no mistake about it. In an audit, you know, you can use both positive, negative confirmation. They're both used. And again, they're externally generated. They're mailed by the CPA, by the auditor. The customer mails the confirmations directly back to the CPA, to the auditor. They're externally circulated all, also. So they're very reliable, very persuasive. How about level three? How about evidence that's externally generated but internally circulated? Well, how about a bank statement? A bank statement is externally generated. It's mailed from the bank, but it's mailed to my client. It's internally circulated. So it's a little less reliable. Level four, evidence that's internally generated but externally circulated. Well, how about a canceled check? It was internally generated. It was written by my client. But it's externally circulated because it went through the bank. It has bank markings on it. And then finally, the fifth and final level, the least persuasive evidence, the least reliable, would be evidence that's internally generated and also internally circulated. That's internally generated and also internally circulated. My client's purchase orders, my client's receiving reports. Of course, a tremendous amount of evidence would be from my client's records, which would be internally generated and internally circulated. Let me ask you, can an auditor use the fifth level of evidence as a basis to form an audit opinion. Yes, all evidence is used. No one's saying that an auditor has to use, you know, the first two levels. No, an auditor is using level one, level two, level three, level four, level five. Auditor is going to use everything they can get their hands on as a basis to form an opinion on the financial statements. But as you can see from going through the levels, generally speaking, reliability refers to what? It refers to the source of the evidence and the nature of the evidence. That's what ultimately reliability or persuasiveness refers to, the source of the evidence and the nature of it. In other words, generally, 
evidence is more reliable, more persuasive if it's obtained from outside sources. Generally, evidence is more reliable, more persuasive if it's obtained directly by the auditor, if it's an original document rather than a copy. But as I say, an auditor is going to use everything they can get their hands on in an audit. Level 1, level 2, level 3, level 4, level 5. They can all be appropriate, relevant, and reliable. They can all be. Now, before you start the next class, you'll see that there are 10 multiple choice questions that I want you to do. And you know how I feel about this. It's so important that you get your answers to those 10 multiple choice before you start the next class. And I will look to see you in the next class. Keep studying. Welcome back. You know that I've assigned 10 questions that I wanted you to get answered before opening this class. I know you've done that, so now let's go through the questions together. Number one, which of the following procedures would provide the most reliable audit evidence? What's the most reliable? How about A? How about inquiries of the client's internal audit staff held in private? You know, just to emphasize how internal this is. That's all internal stuff. B, inspection of pre-numbered client purchase orders filed in the vouchers payable department. Wouldn't that be classic level five? Internally generated, internally circulated. It's always been in the hands of my client. My client's records. C, analytical procedures performed by the auditor on the entity's trial balance. Well, the entity's trial balance was internally generated, always internally circulated. So A, B, and C are all internal examples of evidence. But answer D, inspection of bank statements obtained directly from the client's financial institution, that's classic level two, right? Classic, very reliable. Externally generated, it was mailed from the bank, and it was mailed directly to the auditor, externally circulated, very reliable, very persuasive. Audit evidence, answer D. Number two, negative confirmation of accounts receivable is less effective than positive confirmations of receivables because A says a majority of recipients usually lack the willingness to respond objectively. That's certainly, you know, we expect that with a negative confirmation, as I think we've already mentioned, that if a mistake was in their favor, they might not respond. I mean, they're not objective parties. They're just a customer responding to a request. And so they're only supposed to respond if they disagree. And, you know, will they disagree if the error is in their favor? It's one of the problems with negative confirmations. But that is, you can't, you can't make that statement about a majority of the recipients, certainly. B says some recipients may report incorrect balances that require extensive follow-up. That may happen, but it's not a problem necessarily associated with negative confirmations. D, negative confirmations do not produce evidential matter that is statistically quantifiable. No, it does. It does. Negative confirmations are used, and they are statistically quantifiable. Auditors use them and use them as valuable evidence. But, of course, the problem is C. The auditor cannot infer that all non-respondents have verified their accounts. You know, what does a non-response mean? And again, if the error was in their favor, maybe they would just say nothing. You can't assume that a non-response means that they've verified their information. You can't assume that. It's just a, an inherent problem with negative confirmation. Number three, for which of the following judgments may an independent auditor share responsibility with the entity's internal auditor, who is assessed to be both competent and objective? The external auditor, the, the independent auditor, can use the client's internal audit staff to help with tests of controls, substantive tests, but 
no in the first column. You can't ask the internal audit staff to share responsibility about assessing anything, the assessment of inherent risk, the assessment of inherent risk. That's up to the independent auditor. Same thing with the second column, no. You can't share responsibility with the internal audit staff about assessing control risk. The assessment of inherent risk, the assessment of control risk falls squarely with the external auditor, the independent auditor. So it's double no, answer D. Number four, in auditing accounts receivable, the negative form of confirmation requests most likely would be used when, I know you went right to it, answer B, the combined assessed level of inherent and control risk is low. That's when negative confirmations are used. You have a lot of accounts, small dollar value, a few disputed accounts, and control, control risk is low, right? Strong internal control. Control risk is low. Inherent risk is low. That's when you're going to use negative confirmations. Answer B. Number five, an independent auditor asked a client's internal auditor to assist in preparing a standard financial institution confirmation request for a payroll account that had been closed during the year under audit during the year under audit and after the internal auditor prepared the, the form the controller signed it and mailed it to the bank what was the major flaw in this procedure I know you went to it answer B the form was mailed by the controller remember all confirmations all confirmations should be mailed by the auditor and mailed directly back to the auditor I don't care what kind of confirmation it is an accounts receivable confirmation you know, this is a confirmation to a financial institution, any kind of confirmation like this, outside corroboration. You want it mailed by the auditor and then mailed directly back to the auditor, externally generated and externally circulated. Number six, the blank form of accounts receivable. Now, what the, the blank form of accounts receivable confirmation, that's a confirmation that where you ask the customer to fill in the amount. It's blank. You don't, you don't put in the confirmation, the amount owed to your client based on the client's records. You leave it blank and you ask the customer to fill it in. The blank form of accounts receivable confirmation may be less efficient than the positive form because it is answer C. Oh, you get a lot more non-responses. Uh, anytime you ask, you know, the customer to, you know, go out, you know, you, you look it up in your records. You know, it's one thing to Ask them, you know, in a negative confirmation, only respond if you disagree. That takes a lot less work. But if you ask the, the customer to actually go into their records and figure out and then fill in exactly according to their records what is owed, you know, you're asking them to do more work, so you get more non-responses. Number seven, which of the following procedures would yield the most appropriate evidence? What's the most appropriate? A scanning of a trial balance, an inquiry of client personnel, a comparison of beginning and ending retained earnings. A, B, and C are all internal, all internal. But how about D? A recalculation of bad debt expense. Remember, the most reliable, the most persuasive evidence is direct personal knowledge of the auditor you know, obtained through, you know, calculation and observation, you know, so if the auditor recalculates what the bad debt expense should be, does their own aging schedule, that's very reliable. It's the most, on, on, on the five levels we looked at in our last class, it's the most reliable. The auditor's direct personal knowledge based on observation, computation. Number eight, which of the following procedures is considered a test of controls. What's a test of controls? A says an auditor reviews the entity's check register for unrecorded liabilities. Well, that's a test of details. We're trying to find material misstatements there. B, an auditor evaluates whether a general journal entry was recorded by uh, recorded at the proper amount. Again, that's a that's a substantive test. That's a test of details, looking for material misstatement. D, an auditor reviews the audit work papers to ensure proper sign-off. Well, that's a quality control procedure. 
The test of controls, of course, is, is answer C. An auditor interviews and observes personnel to determine proper separation of duties. That's a test of controls. Number nine, which of the following factors most likely would lead a CPA to conclude that a potential audit engagement should be should not be accepted, should not be accepted. A says there are significant related party transactions. Well, that's as long as they're fully disclosed, that's not a reason to reject the engagement. B, internal control activities requiring segregation of duties are subject to management override. Remember, that's an inherent risk in any system. That's just no matter how beautifully you design a system, management's always going to be able to override it. That's an inherent limitation in any inter internal control system. Even the best internal control system devised by mankind would have that limitation, that management would have the ability to override controls. You're just stuck with it. So that's not going to lead a CPA to reject a client because they'd have to reject all clients. And we know they don't want to do that. C, management continues to employ an inefficient system of information technology. How efficient a system is, that's more management's concern. An auditor is not that concerned with how efficient a system is. Certainly would not reject a client because the system is inefficient. Of course, it's answer D. What could get you to reject a client? It's unlikely that sufficient appropriate evidence is available. Well. Remember, you have to have. That's, that's, not, that's not an option. An auditor has to have sufficient, appropriate evidence to form an opinion on the financial statements. And if that's not available, they can't take the engagement. It's that simple. Number 10, the company being audited has an internal auditor that is both competent and objective. That is, and that's what we want. We, want, we can use the internal audit staff if it's both competent and objective. The independent auditor wants to assign tasks to the internal auditor to perform. Under these circumstances, the independent auditor may, the answer is A, allow the internal auditor to perform tests of internal controls. You know, when the internal audit staff is competent and objective, we can ask the internal audit staff to help with tests of controls, substantive tests, as long as they are competent and objective. Now what I want to get into next is another example of evidence that's level two. Very persuasive, very reliable, externally generated and also externally circulated. And it's another confirmation. What I want to talk about is a letter of audit inquiry to a client's attorney. A letter of audit inquiry to a client's attorney is just like an accounts receivable confirmation, but it's sent to the client's attorney. And it'll be mailed by the, like all confirmations, by the auditor. It's externally generated. And the lawyer will fill it in and send it right directly back to the auditor. It's externally circulated, so it's very reliable, very persuasive evidence. Now, before we look at the details of a legal letter. I want to emphasize that management is the primary source of information about litigation, claims, and assessments. Let's not forget that. Management is the primary source of information about litigation, claims, assessments. But we also have outside corroboration with the client's attorney. And if you look at your viewer's guide, you'll see an example of a legal letter. And to remember the basic elements of it, just remember I-L-L-L-C. That'll give you the basic elements. I love legal letter confirmations. I-L-L-L-C. I love legal letter confirmations. And if you look at the letter in your viewer's guide, you'll see the elements. The I, notice the letter identifies the client. That's the I. The first L, we ask the lawyer to L, give us a list of pending litigation that the attorney has done significant work on. So that's the, that's the first L where we ask the, the lawyer to provide L, a list of pending litigation that the attorney's done significant work on. Also, we'd want them to list any unasserted claims or assessments, any claims or assessments that have 
to this point been unasserted that they are aware of. Then the second L. We want L, a legal opinion. We want the attorney's legal opinion on the outcome of each case. Now, it could be in doubt, and that's fine. The attorney could say, well, you know, that's, the outcome is in doubt. That's fine as long as it's fully disclosed. The third L. We want the attorney to disclose, third L, any limitation on their ability to respond. You know, maybe it's attorney-client privilege, something like that. But are there any L, limitation, on the attorney's ability to respond? And then the C's contingencies. We want the attorney to confirm that all C contingencies have been communicated to the client. Just remember, I love legal letter confirmation. That gives you the basic elements of the letter. And again, notice again that it's externally generated. It's going to be mailed by the CPA to the attorney, and the attorney is going to mail it back directly to the CPA. It's externally circulated. It's level two, very reliable. What if the attorney refuses to respond? Well, that's a scope limitation. That's very serious. If the attorney will not respond to the legal letter, that's a scope limitation. So you know how to handle it. If it's a material scope limitation, an except for qualified opinion. If it's very material, if it's considered in the auditor's judgment to be very material, pervasive, then the auditor would have to disclaim an opinion. What if the client will not let you send a letter of audit inquiry to their attorney? They refuse. Well, that's a different animal, isn't it? Because that's a client-imposed scope limitation. With a client-imposed scope limitation, that would generally be considered very material, persuasive, very pervasive, very pervasive, very material. So in that case, the auditor would disclaim an opinion and withdraw from the engagement. One other thing that can come up in this area, what audit procedures should an auditor use to locate you know, any unrecorded litigation claims and assessments? Because they could ask you that. Exactly how would a, an auditor locate any unrecorded litigations, litigation claims, or assessments? Well, just remember the five R's. The five R's will do it. You just follow the five R's and you will locate any unrecorded litigation claims and assessments. The first R, review the internal controls that are in place to record litigation claims and assessments. That's the first R, review. Review the internal controls that are in place to record litigation claims and assessments. The second R, request, request a, li a list of litigation claims and assessments from management. Remember, management is the primary source of information about litigation claims and assessments. The third R, read attorney co correspondence and the attorney's bills. That's very, very informational. Read attorney co correspondence with your client and bills they send to the client. You know, let's say the bill for the last two years has been consistently $500 every month. But all of a sudden, this month, it's 15000 Something's going on that we need to know about. The fourth R, read minutes of meetings and also the most recent interim statement. Look at the disclosures. So it's read minutes of meetings and also the most recent interim statement, especially the disclosures. And then the final R, get a representation letter from management at the end of the audit that addresses litigation claims and assessments. That's the final R. Get a representation letter from management at the end of the audit, which addresses litigation claims and assessments. Just follow the five R's to locate any unrecorded litigation claims and assessments. Keep studying, don't fall behind, and I'll look to see you in the next class. Welcome back to our discussion about audit evidence. You know that so far in these classes, we've mentioned a couple of important letters that you have to be aware of when you take the exam. We've talked about the engagement letter, and we've talked about the legal letter or the letter of audit inquiry to the client's attorney. Well, there's one more letter that you have to be aware of and comfortable with, and that is the management representation letter. The management representation letter 
is a letter from management to the auditor at the end of the audit. And really, the management representation letter itself is a piece of evidence, and it's the last piece of evidence in an audit. The engagement letter is always the first piece of evidence in an audit, and the management representation letter is always the last piece of evidence in an audit. And a management representation letter is required under generally accepted auditing standards. To get an unmodified opinion, the client has to provide a management representation letter. In other words, if management refuses to give the auditor a management representation letter, that precludes an unmodified opinion because it's a client-imposed scope limitation. And it would be pervasive. It would be very material. So what would the auditor do? The auditor would have to disclaim an opinion and withdraw from the engagement if management will not give the auditor a management representation letter. Again, what that amounts to is a, man, is a client imposed scope limitation. Disclaimer of opinion, withdraw from the engagement. And the purpose of the management representation letter is to confirm all the representations management has made to the auditor during the course of the audit. And hopefully the management representation letter reduces the chance of any misunderstanding. If you look in your viewer's guide, you'll see an example of a management representation letter. And if you just look at it, you can see as an example what you'd expect to find in a management rep letter. Notice the letter states that the financial statements are presented fairly in accordance with U.S. generally accepted accounting principles or whatever applicable financial reporting framework is being audited. Notice the letter states that management is responsible for the design, implementation, and maintenance of internal controls relevant to the fair presentation of financial statements and the prevention and detection of fraud. The letter states any non-compliance with laws and regulations. It states that all requested information was provided to the auditor during the course of the audit. It states that there's been proper cutoff. In other words, assets, liabilities, revenues, expenses have been reported in their proper period. It states that all transactions have been recorded and reflected in the financial statements. In other words, nothing's been omitted. It states that all required disclosures are included in the financial statements including disclosures on related party transactions, subsequent events, litigation, claims, and assessments. Basically, the management representation letter documents the continuing appropriateness of all the representations that management has made to the auditor during the course of the audit. It's signed by top management, either the chief executive officer or the chief financial officer, and it's dated the date of the auditor's report. Now, in, on international auditing standards, the management representation letter must be dated as close as possible to the date of the audit report, but never after. I'll say that again. Under international standards, the management representation letter must be dated as close as possible to the date of the audit report, but never after. But in U.S. generally accepted auditing standards, it's dated the date of the audit report. It's important to remember that the management representation letter does not, by itself, does not in any way reduce the scope of the audit. It does not in any way reduce audit risk. And it does not in any way re reduce the auditor's responsibility to detect errors and fraud in the financial statements. But as I say, it is considered a piece of evidence, audit evidence, and it is the last piece of evidence in an audit. Now before you take the next class, you'll see that there are eight questions that I want you to have answered before you do that class, and I will look to see you in the next class, and we'll continue our discussion on audit evidence. Welcome back to our discussion on audit evidence. I assigned eight questions that I wanted you to have answered before coming to this class, so let's begin by 
talking about these eight questions. In the first question, it says, which of the following statements ordinarily is not included, not included among the written client representations made by the chief executive officer and the chief financial officer? Notice B says, there are no unasserted claims of it or assessments that our lawyer has advised us are probable of assertion and that must be disclosed. No, that would be in the management representation letter. We want that letter to document that there are no, there's no litigation claims or assessments that we're not aware of that haven't been disclosed in the financial statements. No, that would be in that management rep letter. C says, we have no plans or intentions that may materially affect the carrying value or classification of assets and liabilities. Again, that would be in the letter. That statement would be there. D, no events have occurred subsequent to the balance sheet date that would require adjustment or disclosure in the financial statements. No, we, that would be in the letter. We want the letter to address subsequent events. But answer A, sufficient audit evidence has been made available to the auditor to permit the issuance of an unmodified opinion. No, no that would not be in the letter. It's not, it's not up, to the ma up to management to decide whether the evidence that's been provided to the auditor is sufficient, sufficient enough for an unmodified opinion. That's up to the auditor. Would, the letter would not say anything like that. Number two, to which of the following matters would materiality limits not apply in obtaining a written management, represent, management rep letter? Where would materiality not, materiality not apply? How about B, losses from purchase commitments? No, we would care whether it's material or not. If it's immaterial, we wouldn't be concerned about it. C, the disclosure of compensating balance arrangements involving related parties. We only care about related party activity if it is material. D, reductions of obsolete inventory to net realizable value. Well, again, we'd only be concerned about that in any way if it was a material reduction. Answer A, the availability of minutes of stockholders and directors meetings. Materi materiality doesn't come into that. We want, we want a copy of those. We want to be able to read those minutes. In other words, we wouldn't accept as an answer, well, nothing of you know, materiality was discussed in those, in those meetings. Oh, no. No, we, want, we, have, we have to see the minutes of those meetings. We don't care if they say that it w the meetings were about something immaterial. Doesn't matter. Materiality limits wouldn't apply. We have to see those minutes. Thir number three says, to which of the following matters, again, would materiality limits not apply when obtaining written client representation? A says violations of state labor regulations. No, we'd only care about those violations if they were material, not some technical insignificant, you know, minute violation. We're not worried about that. It would have to be material. Materiality limits would apply to that. B says disclosure of line of credit arrangements. Again, the disclosure is important if it's material. C, information about related party transactions. You know, related party transactions must be disclosed if they are material. Materiality limits would apply. But answer D, instances of fraud involving management. Materiality limits wouldn't come into that. There shouldn't be any fraud by management, even a penny. Any fraud at all by management would be a matter of concern, would have to be communicated to those in charge of governance. Materiality limits wouldn't apply to fraud involving management. Number four, which of the following most likely would cause an auditor to consider whether a client's financial statements contain material misstatements? What would be an indicator? that the financial statements are materially misstated. A says management did not disclose to the auditor that they consulted with another accountant about significant accounting matters. Well, that's okay. As long as the auditor can discuss with those in charge of governance the auditor's view of the matters, the auditor's view of the situation. That's okay. B says the chief financial officer will not sign the management representation letter until late in the audit. But that's, that's, that's usual practice. That the, the minute representation letter comes at the end of the audit. So that's not a problem. C, audit 
trails of computer-generated transactions exist only for a short time. Well, that's, that's not a good thing, but it wouldn't indicate necessarily that there are any material misstatements in the financial statements. But how about D? The results of an analytical procedure disclose unexpected differences. Oh, unexpected differences? It's a red flag. It may indicate that there are material misstatements. Number five, when considering the use of management, rep management rep written representations as audit evidence about the completeness assertion, an auditor should understand that such representations, I'm sure you went right to it, it's A, complement but do not replace substantive tests designed to support the assertion. That's what the management representation letter does. It complements, but does not by itself replace, you know, any substantive, substantive testing. Doesn't in any way reduce audit risk or the auditor's responsibility to detect material misstatements in the financial statements. That's what it does. It complements. And that's all it does. Number six, the refusal of a client's attorney to provide information requested in an inquiry letter generally is considered, you know, it's a scope limitation. Answer B. And you'd have to decide, is it a, a material scope limitation or is it very material? If it's material scope limitation, an except for qualified opinion. Very material, pervasive, disclaim. And of course, it's not, it's not answer D, a reportable condition. A reportable condition is a deficiency in internal control. The answer is B. Number seven, which of the following procedures would an auditor most likely perform regarding litigation? A says, confirm directly with the clerk of court that the client's litigation is properly disclosed. No, the, that is not how the auditor would nail down whether a disclosure is adequate about litigation, asking the clerk of court. They, they wouldn't know. C says, inspect the legal documents in the client's lawyer's possession. You can't do that. You don't have a right to do that. It's confidential information. D says, confirm the details of pending litigation with the client's adversaries. Legal representation. Now, you know that's not going to happen. Again, it's all confidential client information. You can't go to your adversary's attorneys and ask for information. Of course, it's B. Discuss with management its policies and procedures for identifying and evaluating litigation. That is a procedure an auditor would perform regarding litigation because management is the primary source of information about litigation, claims, assessments. So answer B is exactly what the auditor would always do. Go to management. Ask for a list of litigation claims and assessments. Number eight, a client is a defendant in a patent infringement lawsuit against a major competitor. Which of the following items would least likely be included in the attorney's response to the auditor's letter of inquiry? A says a description of the potential litigation in other matters or related to an unfavorable verdict in the patent infringement lawsuit. No, that's exactly what would be. That's what we want the lawyer to comment on. A discussion, answer B, a, a discussion of case progress and the strategy currently in place by client management to resolve the lawsuit. Again, it's exactly what, what, what we want as a response from a legal letter. We want the attorney to comment on that. C, an evaluation of the probability of loss and a statement of the amount of, or range of loss if an unfavorable outcome is reasonably possible. Of course, that's exactly what we want the lawyer to provide us in the, in the legal letter, and we want the lawyer to have provided that to the client because it's a contingency and for purpose of adjustment or disclosure in the financial statements. The client needs that information, and we need it confirmed in the legal letter. But what's least likely to be in the legal letter? Answer D, 
an evaluation of the ability of the client to continue as a going concern. That's the auditor's responsibility. That, that's not the lawyer's responsibility, and it's not part of a legal letter. Welcome back to our discussion on audit evidence. And as you know, the reason why we are gathering and analyzing all this audit evidence is to determine if there are any material misstatements, any errors in fraud in management assertions. And as auditors, we're going to design our audit procedures to address the risk of material misstatement in particular assertions. So what assertions are we talking about? We know that financial statements are really just a set of assertions. Management is asserting in the financial statements that this is our cash balance. Management is asserting these are our fixed assets. Management is asserting these are our liabilities. Management is asserting this is my capital structure. Management is asserting these are my disclosures. So all financial statements really represent is a set of assertions. So exactly what assertions are we testing? Just remember that we are going to test three categories of management assertions. We're going to test management assertions on account balances, on transactions, and also on presentation and disclosure. Let's start with account balances. What assertions will management be making about account balances? Well, first, there's an assertion about completeness, that this account balance is complete. Nothing has been omitted. Next, management also asserts ownership rights or obligations about an account balance. In other words, if the account balance is an asset, the company has ownership rights to the asset. If it's a liability, it's an obligation of the entity. So management is asserting ownership rights or obligations about an account balance. Next, Valuation, allocation, accuracy. Management is asserting that the account balance is valued properly, accurately, that estimates are reasonable. And then finally, existence or occurrence, that the account balance represents an event that actually occurred. An account balance represents an asset, a liability, or a piece of information in the financial statements, a capital stock balance, you know, retained earnings that actually exists. So management also makes assertions about existence or occurrence. This account balance actually exists. These events actually occurred. Now, if you organize that, notice that management assertions about account balance, account balances, really uh, come down to the word COVE, C-O-V-E. The C is completeness, the O is ownership rights or obligations, the V is valuation, allocation, accuracy, and the E is existence or occurrence. So in your mind, with, with any category of assertions, Always start with the word cold. It's always a good place to start. Start with cold. Let's move on to transactions. What assertions will management make about transactions? Well, we'll start with cold. First of all, the transactions are complete. Nothing has been omitted. All transactions have been recorded. Management is asserting that. So don't forget completeness. We're also going to add cutoff to the C. That all assets, liabilities, revenues, expenses have been recorded in their proper period. All transactions have been recorded in their proper period. There's been proper cutoff. So C, C now stands for completeness and also cutoff. O will be occurrence, that this transaction represents something, an event that actually did occur. V, valuation, allocation, accuracy. The transaction is valued properly. Estimates are reasonable. All adjustments have been made that are required. And then finally, existence, occurrence, existence. The transaction represents an event that actually did occur. That actually does exist. 
the transaction does represent a financial transaction that did actually exist. Now, in addition to Cove, we're going to, for transactions, in addition to Cove, we're going to add understandability and classification. That the transaction is understandable and it's been classified properly. The transaction is understandable and properly classified. What assertions will management make about presentation and disclosure? We'll start with Cove. First of all, completeness. All the presentation disclosures are complete. Nothing is omitted. O is ownership rights, obligations. That the assets that are presented or disclosed, the entity has ownership rights to those assets. The liabilities that are presented or disclosed represent obligations of the entity. V, valuation, allocation, accuracy. That everything presented has been Everything presented or disclosed has been valued properly, accurately. Estimates are reasonable. And then finally, existence or occurrence. Everything presented or disclosed actually exists, actually did occur. And then we'll add understandability and classification. Everything is presented, disclosed in an understandable manner. Everything that is presented, disclosed, is classified properly. Now, if you always start with Cove and you add understandability and classification, you really get the management assertions down. And I want to mention that the public company accounting oversight board standards for assertions really come down to cove as well for for the peekaboo standards the c is completeness o is ownership rights or obligations v is valuation allocation accuracy e is existence or occurrence so even in the peekaboo standard you start with cove for management assertions and they add presentation and disclosure now, what I'm going to do is let's just boil this down to one memory tool. So that way, you just have to remember one memory tool, whether they're asking about management assertions for account balances, transactions, presentation, disclosure. You're always going to come back to Cove. The C is going to stand for completeness, cutoff, classification, and also understandability. That's the C now in Cove. Completeness, cutoff, classification, and understandability. O, ownership rights or obligations. V, valuation, allocation, accuracy. E, existence or occurrence. So when you're in the exam, if they start talking about management assertions, it doesn't matter whether it's related to an account balance or a transaction or a presentation and disclosure. You come right back to Cove. And you'll have, I hope, the management assertions right at your fingertips. Now, before I see you in the next class, there are three questions that I want you to have done. I know you'll get your, your answers to those three questions, and I look to see you in the next class. Welcome back to our discussion on audit evidence. Let's begin this class by going over the three questions that I assigned to you. In the first question, it asks, which of the following explanations most likely would satisfy an auditor who questions management about significant debits to the accumulated depreciation account. There's been a lot of debits to accumulated depreciation. What's going to satisfy the auditor as an explanation? How about A? The estimated remaining life of plant assets was revised. Well, I hope you thought that's a change in estimate. You're changing the esti estimate of life. And when you change an estimate, you ignore prior periods, and then you only adjust depreciation going forward. It only affects the current period and future periods if they're involved. So that wouldn't explain any sudden debits to accumulated depreciation. We're just going to change our estimate of life going forward. It's a change in estimate. 
prospective only, nothing retroactive. C says the prior year's depreciation expense was erroneously understated. Well, if it was understated, then you, it's correction of an error. You'd have to go back to an automatic prior period adjustment where you'd have to increase the depreciation, and that would increase accumulated depreciation. That would cause credits to accumulated depreciation, correcting that error, not debits to accumulated depreciation. D says overhead allocations were revised at year end. Well, when you're doing overhead allocations, that's just going to affect how you allocate the debit to depreciation expense. The credit to accumulated depreciation would not be affected at all. That wouldn't explain in any way why there are debits to accumulated depreciation. What would explain debits to accumulated depreciation is answer B. Plant assets were retired during the year. That would cause debits to accumulated depreciation, and that would satisfy the auditor because it makes sense. Number two, an auditor scans a client's investment records for the period just before and just after year end to determine that any transfers between categories of investments have been properly recorded. The primary purpose of this procedure is to obtain evidence about management's financial statement assertion of what? Why would we focus in on transfers from trading to available for sale, available for sale to held to maturity? Classification, answer D. Our main focus would be, are these investments classified properly and therefore, you know, are trading securities valued properly? Is available for sale securities? Are the available for sale securities valued properly? Are held to maturity securities valued properly? But are the investments classified properly? If you've transferred an investment from trading, which is a current asset always, to you know non-current available for sale, is that investment classified properly? That's why we're focusing in on transfers between categories of investments. Number three, after making inquiries about credit granting policies, an auditor selects a sample of sales transactions and examines evidence of credit approval. This test of controls most likely supports the management assertion of what? It's not about rights and obligations. We, are, we care about whether credit approval has been given is to determine whether accounts receivable, sales, have been valued properly. What this is all about is the assertion of valuation and allocation, and the answer is C. Not rights and obligations. It's not why we're focusing in on credit approval. We want to make sure that accounts receivable is valued properly. Sales are valued properly. Answer C. Well, you know that We've been saying that in the final analysis, auditors design all their audit procedures to address the risk of material misstatement in management assertions. And the audit procedures the auditor will use include both, both tests of controls, observation, inquiry, inspection, reperform transactions, and also substantive tests, analytical procedures, and tests of detail. Let's talk about analytical procedures. Analytical procedures is the process of analyzing plausible relationships between financial data and plausible relationships between non-financial data, you know, to identify variances, to identify something that's unexpected, unexpected changes. We're analyzing plausible relationships between financial data, plausible relationships between non-financial data. For example, an analytical procedure could be very, something very simple, looking at last year's allowance for bad debts compared to this year's allowance for bad debts. See if it's approximately the same. Why is it significantly a higher amount? Why? Why has it changed? Another example, you could take a, a company's average effective interest rate times their average outstanding debt and see if it approximates the interest expense on the income statement. Why wouldn't it? Why wouldn't it come close? And as I said, 
We could even be analyzing plausible relationships in non-financial data. We could look at last year's disclosures compared to this year's disclosures and focus in on what's changed. We could compare budget to actual. There's a million examples. Now, it's important to remember that analytical procedures are required. Remember, in auditing, you're either required to do something or you're not. And analytical procedures are required in the planning phase of an audit to assist the auditor in understanding the entity and its environment and inter internal control. Analytical procedures are required in the planning phase to help the auditor identify items with a high degree of inherent risk. Also, analytical procedures are required in the review stage, the final stage of an audit, the review stage, to test the validity of the conclusions reached by the auditor. Do they make sense? To evaluate the overall financial statement presentation. So analytical procedures are required in the planning phase of an audit, and they're also required in the review stage of an audit. Now, analytical procedures can be used as a substantive test. An auditor is not required to use analytical procedures as a substantive test, but it, analytical procedures are one substantive test that can be used to test management assertions. But if you do use analytical procedures as a substantive test, it only gives you circumstantial evidence. You have to get corroboration. All analytical procedures can do is give you circumstantial evidence. Again, it requires additional corroboration. Now, one very important example of analytical procedures would be ratios, ratio analysis. And as you're probably aware, the exam tests ratio analysis in financial accounting and reporting, but it also tests ratio analysis in the auditing exam as well. And I always tell my students that, you know, the only way you can handle ratio questions in the exam is by knowing a formula. Let's be honest. You can't do ratio questions if you don't know a formula. I mean, you must memorize formulas for financial accounting and reporting and for auditing and attestation as well because, again, anal analytical procedures include ratio analysis. It's a classic analytical procedure. There are 15 ratios that you absolutely have to memorize. You know, these, what I'm saying is if you know these 15 formulas, it's not every conceivable ratio that exists, but if you know these 15, you're protecting yourself. You're protecting yourself in financial accounting and reporting, and you'll also protect yourself in auditing as well. Let's go over the big 15 ratios that you have to know. The first two ratios are measures of liquidity. First, make sure you know the current ratio. It's an easy one. But if you're going to calculate the current ratio, in the numerator, you want total current assets. And in the divisor, you want total current liabilities. That's all it is. Total current assets divided by total current liabilities. That's the current ratio. Also, number two, the second one that measures liquidity, make sure you know the acid test ratio or the quick ratio. If you're going to do the acid test ratio or the quick ratio, in the numerator, you want your most liquid assets, cash plus marketable securities plus receivables. And you divide by total current liabilities. Again, in the numerator, your most liquid assets, cash plus marketable securities plus receivables, and divide by total current liabilities. Again, these, the current ratio and the asset test ratio are measures of liquidity. The ability, it measures the ability of ma management to meet their short-term obligations. That's what we're trying to measure. And generally, you want this higher. You want these ratios higher, the better. And as an analytical procedure, if you look at last year's current ratio or last year's asset test ratio, and now this year, it's gone down. Generally, you want it higher. Higher is better. So if it's gone down, that would be a concern. Concern about management's ability to meet short-term obligations. It might indicate a problem area. Now we're going to talk about measures of activity. The first measure of activity we're going to talk about is one the exam loves, and that is the accounts receivable turnover. If you're going to calculate the accounts receivable turnover, in the numerator, you want net credit sales. And in the divisor, you want average receivables. Now what's average receivables? 
its beginning receivables plus ending receivables divided by two. That's where a lot of people mess this one up. Remember, in the divisor, it's average receivables. It's beginning receivables plus ending receivables divided by two. So if you take your net credit sales and divide by your average receivables, that'll give you your accounts receivable turnover. And what it's trying to measure is the quality of the receivables. In other words, you know, higher is better. An account receivable turnover of 10 is better than an account receivable of 9. You'd rather see your receivables turn over 10 times during the year than 9 times. 10 times is better than 3 times. It's measuring the quality of your receivables. Now, you can also show the accounts receivable turnover in days. If you want to show it in days, take the number of days in a year, 365, and divide by the account receivable turnover. Again, if you want it in days, take the number of days in a year, 365, and divide by the account receivable turnover. Let's say that's 5, just making up a number. If the account receivable turnover is 5, it turns over 5 times, divide that into 365, that means every 73 days you collect your receivable. It takes you 73 days to collect your receivables. You know, you get, the lower the better there on, in terms of days. You'd rather collect your receivables every 60 days rather than every 73 days. You know, again, you'd, rather, you'd want the divisor to be higher. An account receivable turnover, you know, higher is better than lower. And in this case, the number of days, the less days, is a better, you know, is, indicates a better quality of receivable. But here it's taking 73 days on average to collect the receivables. Another one the exam likes is inventory turnover. If you're going to calculate inventory turnover, in the numerator, you want cost of goods sold. In the divisor, you want average inventory. And you know what that is. That's beginning inventory plus ending inventory divided by 2. Cost of goods sold divided by average inventory. And, you know, it's a measure of how quickly you're selling your inventory. And generally, you want it higher. You know, you'd rather sell your inventory, you know, 12 times during the year rather than four times. Generally, you want it higher. You can also show inventory turnover in days. Just take the number of days in a year, 365, and divide by inventory turnover. I'll just make up a number. Let's say inventory turnover is 4.5, making up a number. You can't derive that from what I've said. So if I take the number of days in a year, 365, divide by inventory turnover, let's say that's 4.5, then in days, it's 81 days. It takes me, on average, 81 days to sell my inventory. There's also the accounts payable turnover. If you're going to calculate the accounts payable turnover, in the numerator, it's cost of goods sold. In the divisor, it's average accounts payable. Beginning accounts payable plus ending accounts payable divided by 2. Watch out for these divisors. It's average accounts payable. Beginning accounts payable plus ending accounts payable divided by 2. If you take cost of goods sold, divide by average accounts payable, that'll give you accounts payable turnover. You know, how quickly is it, is it taking the company to pay their payables? And here again, generally, higher is better. You know, if, if payables are turning over six times, during the year, they used to, and now they're just turning over three times. It's gone down. I mean, these, remember, these, these are used very often as analytical procedures, these ratios. What was accounts payable turnover last year? Well, the payables turned over six times last year. Now this year, they, they only turned over twice. That could indicate if it's slower, if it's lower, slower, turning over your payables, that the client's having cash flow problems. You can also show accounts payable turnover in days. You know what to do. Take the number of days in a year, 365, and divide by the accounts payable turnover. Let's say that's 7. Again, just making up a number. If my accounts payable turnover is 7, I tr it turns over 7 times, divided into 365, that means, on average, it takes me 52 days to pay my payables, on average. Now, let's talk about measurements of profitability. First of all, gross margin. You know what that is. The ninth ratio would be gross margin. That's just the company's gross profit over their net sales. That's the gross profit percentage or the gross margin. Number 10 would be net operating margin. The net operating margin would be, in the numerator, net operating income. Net operating income 
is the gross profit minus your operating expenses. Again, in the numerator, we want net operating income. And that is the gross profit minus operating expenses, all your expenses except interest. And you divide by net sales. That's your net operating margin. Now, one that's a little complicated that the exam seems to like is the return on assets. The exam complicates this. You'll see what I mean. Here's the normal formula. The normal formula for return on assets. In the numerator, you put the company's net income and divide by average total assets. You know what average total assets would be? Beginning total assets plus ending total assets divided by two. So it's not a difficult formula. And by the way, anytime you see that phrase, return on, that means net income over something. If I said, you know, what's return on my house? It's silly, but it would be net income over my house. That's what return on means. Net income over. Net income over whatever you want to measure it against. So return on assets would be net income over average total assets. Let me make up some numbers to illustrate. If the company's net income is $10 million and average total assets is $100 million, what's the return on assets? It's the net income $10 million over average total assets, $100 million return on assets would be 10%. Well, I, I show you the numbers because there's another way to calculate the same 10%. There's another way to calculate return on assets. The other way to do it is to take the net profit margin times the asset turnover. And the exam gets into this. It's just another way to get to the same place. Another way to get return on assets is to take a company's net profit margin and multiply times the asset turnover. Now, how do you get net profit margin? Net profit margin is the net income divided by the net sales, net income divided by net sales. Now, I'll use the same numbers here. Here, I'm assuming the net income is $10 million. And let's say that the net sales were $200 million. That would be a net profit margin of 5%. Again, if I take the net income, which I'm assuming is still $10 million, divide by net sales, which I'll assume is $200 million, my net profit margin is 5%. I can take that 5% times the asset turnover. What's the asset turnover? That's the net sales, the $200 million we've already mentioned, over average total assets, which we mentioned before is 100 million. So asset turnover is two times. If I take two times 5%, that gives me 10%. And the exam gets into that way of calculating return on assets. In other words, all they're doing is analyzing return on assets more deeply. It's another way to get to the same thing. If I take the net profit margin, 5% times the return on assets times two, that'll also give me 10% the return on assets. It's two ways of calculating the same thing. And you say, well, Bob, why did you bring that up? Because the exam has gone at it both ways. You have to know both formulas. Now let's talk about long-term debt paying ability. Make sure you know the debt to equity ratio. The debt to equity ratio would be total liabilities in the numerator divided by total common stockholder equity. That's how you figure out the debt to equity ratio, by taking the total liabilities of the company and dividing by total common stockholder equity and this is measuring the amount of protection creditors have and creditors would rather see this low in other words a debt to equity ratio of 2 is better than a debt equity to ratio a debt equity to equity ratio of 3 so creditors would rather see this lower also there's times interest earned if you want to figure out times interest earned in the numerator, you want your earnings before taxes and before interest. In the numerator, you want your earnings, your net income. But that's before taxes and before interest, and then divide by your interest expense. And it basically shows you the company's ability to make their interest payments. And creditors want to see that higher, of course, rather than lower. Then finally, there are investor ratios. The first investor ratio is book value per share. Book value per share. Now, if you're going to calculate book value per share in the numerator, you want total stockholders' equity. And if you stop and think about it, total stockholders' equity is the book value of the corporation. It's assets minus liabilities or total stockholders' equity. So in this ratio, what you're putting in the numerator, when you put in total stockholders' equity, you're putting in the book value of the corporation, assets minus liabilities, or total stockholders' equity. And in book value per share calculations, you divide 
by the number of shares outstanding. Now, be careful. Don't divide by authorized shares. Don't divide by issued shares. You always divide by the number of shares outstanding. So if you take total stockholders' equity or the book value of the corporation, divide by the number of shares outstanding, that'll give you book value per share. Now, the last ratio you've got to be comfortable with is earnings per share. And, of course, I'm talking about earnings per common share. It's not earnings per preferred share. It's earnings per common share. That's what earnings per share always means, earnings per common share. Here's the formula. If you're going to do earnings per share, in the numerator, you want net income applicable to common stockholders. That's net income applicable to common stockholders. To figure that out, you've got to take the company's net income minus the current year's preferred dividend. One more time, in the numerator, you want net income applicable to common stockholders, which is defined as the company's net income minus the current year's preferred dividend. And make sure this is clear in your notes. You're going to back out that current year's preferred dividend if it's declared or not, if the preferred stock is cumulative. When the preferred stock is cumulative, you back out that current year's preferred dividend whether it's declared or not. So I'll just make up some numbers. If the company's net income is 250000 and the current year's preferred dividend is 4000 and if the preferred is usually cumulative, if it's cumulative, I'm going to back out that 4000 whether it's declared or not. That means net income applicable to common stockholders is 246000 246,000. Now you divide by the weighted average, common shares outstanding for the period. You're going to divide by the weighted average, common shares outstanding for the period. Don't forget, in earnings per share calculations, in the divisor, you've got to weight the common shares. You've got to weight the common shares by how many months they've been outstanding. Let me show you how to weight shares. Let's say a company had 100,000 shares outstanding on January 1st. And those shares were outstanding for the entire year. A company had 100,000 common shares outstanding on January 1st. And those shares were outstanding for the entire year. Well, because they were outstanding for the entire year, you give those shares a full weight of one. Because they were outstanding for the full year, give those shares a full weight of one. So you'd multiply by one. That's 100,000 weighted shares. Let's say they also issued another 20,000 common shares on October 1st. Well, if they issued another, another 20,000 shares on October 1st, those shares have been outstanding for October, November, December, three months, three-twelfths of the year. Give those a weight of three-twelfths, a weight of a quarter. That's another 5,000 weighted shares. So add it up. What's the weighted average common shares for the period? 100,000 plus 5,000, 105,000. Now we can calculate earnings per share. If I take the net, in, net income applicable to common stockholders, Remember, that was 246000 That's the net income, 250000 minus the current year's preferred dividend, 4000 246000 divide by the weighted average common shares for the period, 105000 Earnings per share comes out to $2.34 a share. You've got to know how to do that. But if you know those 15 formulas, you're protecting yourself because it is a basic analytical procedure that is used in auditing and that they mention quite a bit in the exam. Not only in multiple choice, but they've had simulations on ratio analysis. Got to know these formulas. Before you do the next class, make sure you do the five questions that I've assigned, get those five answers, and then I'll look to see you in the next class. See you then. Welcome back to our discussion on audit evidence. I assigned some questions that I wanted you to get answered before coming to this class, so let's start by reviewing these questions. Number one, an auditor most likely would apply analytical procedures in the overall review stage of an audit. And remember, analytical procedures are required in the review stage. So why would they do analytical procedures in the review stage? Is it A, to enhance the auditor's understanding of subsequent events? No, it's not about understanding subsequent events. B, Identify auditing procedures omitted by the staff accountant. No, that's not why we're doing analytical procedures in the final review stage. D says evaluate the effectiveness of internal control activities. Oh, that would come much earlier in the audit process than the review stage. No, it's C. We're using analytical procedures in the review stage to determine whether additional audit evidence may be needed. In other words, it's one final check. We are, you know, testing one, one final time 
you know, the validity of the conclusions that we've reached. You know, we're evaluating in that review stage the overall financial statement presentation. And we're evaluating whether the evidence that we have gathered is adequate to support our opinion. It's just that final check. Did we gather enough evidence to support our opinion? To support our opinion, do we need to gather more evidence? One final check, the review stage. And analytical procedures help in that analysis. Number two, auditors try to identify predictable relationships when applying analytical procedures. Relationships involving transactions from which of the following accounts most likely would yield the highest level of evidence. Well, did you notice B, allowance for bad debts, C, accounts receivable, D, accounts payable are all balance sheet accounts. A, interest expense is the only income statement account, and that's the answer. Income statement accounts, answer A, are more predictable. They give you more predictable results. Why? Because income statement items are measured over a period of time, where balance sheet accounts are measured at a given point in time. That's the difference. Income st statement items are always measured over a period of time. So the results are more predictable, better for analytical procedures. Number three, which of the following activities is an analytical procedure an auditor would perform in the final overall review stage of an audit to ensure that the financial statements are free from material misstatements? Well, did you notice A, reading minutes of, of meetings, and B, obtaining a legal letter, and D, ensuring that the representation letter signed by management is in the audit file? A, B, and D are not analytical procedures. The only analytical procedure that's in the answers is C, comparing current year's financial statements to those of prior years for overall presentation. That's the only analytical procedure that's mentioned, and the answer is C. Number four, in auditing accounts payable, an auditor's procedures most likely would focus primarily on management's assertion of what? Completeness. Answer C. Remember, what we're worried about with liabilities is they could be understated. Not everything's reported. That's, that's what we're worried about with liabilities and what we're worried about with expenses. These are things that could be understated. Maybe not all liabilities have been recorded. Maybe not all expenses have been recorded. We want to really focus in on completeness, where with assets, with revenues, we're worried about overstatements. But if accounts payable is a liability, so we would focus on completeness. Number five, in evaluating the adequacy of the allowance for doubtful accounts, an auditor most likely reviews the aging schedule for receivables to support the assertion of what? Valuation. Valuation and allocation, answer B. Because remember, accounts receivable will be reported on the balance sheet net of the allowance account. So we test the aging schedule to determine whether the allowance account is, has been properly calculated because that's going to finally work into the valuation of net receivables on the balance sheet. What that's all about is valuation and allocation. Now, we know that in general there are two types of substantive tests. There's analytical procedures, which we've talked about, and there are tests of detail. And I bring this up because there are two substantive tests of detail that you have to know very well, that you have to be comfortable with in particular, because these two substantive tests of detail are very heavily tested. What I'm talking about is vouching and tracing. Sometimes we call it retracing. But you have to be comfortable with these concepts and these substantive tests because they're so heavily tested in the exam. When you do your homework, you'll see so many questions mention vouching and tracing. So if you look in your viewer's guide, you'll see the outline of a little house. And you'll notice in the cellar of the house, there's the original authorization and approval of a transaction. And then as you go up the house, you go through the source documents, the books of original entry, the subsidiary ledgers, the general ledger, the trial balance, and then finally in the attic of the house, 
or the financing station. That's a little house of gas there. Well, just remember this. When you're vouching, when you're vouching, you're starting in the attic with the financing station. And you're going back through the trial balance, the general ledger, the subsidiary ledgers, the book's original entry, the source documents, all the way back to the seller, all the way down to the seller, to the original authorization and approval of the transaction. That's the direction you're going. You're going from the attic down to the seller. And when you're vouching, you're testing for existence. In other words, you find an asset in the attic. You find an asset in the financial statements, and now you want to see if you can find the, original, the source documents. Does this asset really exist? You're testing for existence or occurrence. And what you're really trying to test for is overstatement. You know, can I, can I find an asset in the balance sheet in the attic and I can't find any supporting documentation for it? Think that's ever happened? Of course it has. There's a piece of land on the balance sheet and I can't find, you know, any deeds, any source documents because they made it up. When you're vouching, you're testing for existence or occurrence. And what you're looking for is overstatement, generally speaking. And this might seem silly, but the V in vouch is like a little arrow pointing down. That's the direction you're going. You're going down the house. Now, when you're tracing, you're going up. When you're tracing, you start in the cellar, in the original authorization and approval, and you go up the house through the source documents, the books of original entry, the subsidiary ledgers, the general ledger, the trial balance, all the way up to the attic, the financial statements. When you're tracing, you're testing for completeness. In other words, I find all the supporting documentation, say, for a liability, and I can't find the liability in the attic, in the financial statements. I'm testing for completeness. And what I'm basically looking for when I'm tracing is understatement. What, what is it management would like to understate, perhaps? Liability. Expenses. Again, management's bias could be to overstate assets or revenue. Their bias could be to understate expenses or liability. So when you're tracing, you're going up the house. And this could be stretching a point, but the T in trace, that the cross of the, the bar that crosses the T, if you bend it just a little bit, a little, like an arrow pointing up. You're going up the house. You're testing for completeness. Looking for understatement, liability, expenses, things that could be understated. Now remember, as long as you're within the confines of that house, you know, up and down, the direction makes perfect sense. When you're vouching, you're going down the house. When you're tracing, you're going up the house. As long as you're within the house. Now when you get outside the house, it's a little different. If I, if I find an asset in the financial statements, and then I go to the factory to find the actual asset, you, you, you can't really think of it as up or down, right? Because I'm outside the house now. If I find an asset in the financial statements, and I go to the factory floor to see if I can find the equipment and the serial numbers, that's vouching. I'm testing for existence. Hey, there's an asset here in the financial statements. Go to the factory, show it to me. Show me the serial number. I'm going from the house to the actual asset. Again, it's not really up or down, is it? But that's vouching, testing for existence. Same thing the other way. If I find an asset in the factory, you know, on the factory floor, and then I go, well, show it to me in the financial statements. Where is it in the financial statements? I'm testing for completeness. I'm looking for understatement. I'm tracing. So just remember, if I go from the financial statements to the asset, the actual asset, I'm vouching, testing for existence or occurrence. If I go from the assets themselves to the financial statements, I'm tracing, testing for completeness. So it's not really up or down. Now, there are a couple of transaction cycles that I want to get back to, a couple of transaction cycles that are very heavily tested in internal control and also evidence. And it's very important when you go in the exam in terms of audit evidence, to know cold the flow of documents in these transaction cycles. So let's look at a couple of them. There are three big ones that the exam really likes a lot. Let's start with the purchases accounts payable cycle. We've been through it before. Remember, it all starts 
in the user department. The user department fills out a storage requisition. Got to know the, the flow of documents. User department, department that's using the raw material. If they need material, they you fill out a store requ storage requisition. The storeroom, when they run out of goods, fills out a purchase requisition. Then the purchasing department, they're going to they're going to fill out a purchase order. All right. So the user department, if they need material, fills out a storage requisition. A storeroom. When the storeroom needs raw, more raw material, fills out a purchase requisition. The purchasing department fills out a purchase order. The receiving department, when the goods come in, fills out what? You know, a receiving report. The accounts payable department gets the vendor invoice and then combines it with the, store, the, the purchase requisition, the purchase order, the receiving report, and makes out a voucher package. Updates the accounts payable master file. Records the transaction in the cash disbursements journal. The treasury department makes out and, and mails the check. We keep custody in one pair of hands. Cancels the voucher package. And then the general accounting department updates the general ledger. So again, I say in terms of audit evidence, make sure you know that flow of documents. We've gone from the store requis store's requisition to the purchase requisition, to the purchase order, to the receiving report, to the voucher package, to the canceled check, to the general ledger. So let's keep in mind we're within the house of gap. So if, if you are going from the, pur the purchase order to the receiving report to the accounts payable master, you're tracing, you're testing for completeness, right, because you're going up the house. On the other hand, if you go from the general ledger back to the accounts payable master, back to the receiving report, back to the purchase order, you're going down the house. You're vouching. You're testing for existence or occurrence. Memorize that flow of documents. Another transaction cycle the exam likes a lot is the sales accounts receivable cycle. The sales accounts receivable cycle all start in the sales department. The sales department gets the customer purchase order and fills out a sales order. Again, the sales department, after they get the customer purchase order, fills out a sales order. The credit department approves credit, so now makes it an approved sales order. The shipping department ships the goods and fills out a bill of lading, a bill of lading, a shipping document. The billing department prepares the sales invoice, posts the transaction in the sales journal. The accounts receivable department posts the transaction into the customer's account, updates the accounts receivable master. In general accounting, po posts his transactions in the general ledger. So once again, what you want to focus in on, what you want to memorize, is the flow of documents. I mean, memorize them. We've gone from the sales order to the bill of lading to the sales invoice to the sales journal to the accounts receivable master to the general ledger. So once again, we're within the house of gap. So if you're tracing, you could be going from the bill of lading to the sales invoice to the accounts receivable master. You'd be testing for completeness, looking for understatements. If I'm vouching, I'm going from the account receivable master back to the sales invoice, back to the bill of lading, back to the sales order, testing for existence or occurrence, looking for overstatements. As long as you're within that house of gap, the direction up or down makes sense. And then finally, the cash receipts cycle. How does the cash receipt cycle look? We've been through it before. It all starts in the mail room. You know, somebody opens up the daily mail, gets the checks that come in. They fill out a daily remittance listing. So the mail room fills out a daily remittance listing. Then the cashier, if there is a cashier, could be the treasurer, either one. The cashier or the treasurer makes the deposit. We keep custody in the same hands. And we always, se we always separate authorization, record keeping, and custody. So the treasurer or the cashier makes the deposits daily and fills out a deposit summary. The internal audit staff does a bank reconciliation. The account receivable department updates the account receivable master and records the transaction in the cash receipts journal. General accounting updates the general ledger. So once again, what you want to focus in on is that flow of documents.
If I go from the deposit summary to the account receivable master, I'm tracing. I'm going up the house, testing for completeness. If I go from the general ledger back to the account receivable master, back to the deposit summary, I'm vouching. I'm testing for existence or occurrence. You'll find that it's slow. these transaction cycles come up in the exam in multiple choice and even in simulations, and knowing this flow of documents and knowing the direction you're flowing for vouching and tracing will always make a big difference, always be important in that exam. Make sure you take the time to study that flow of documents and just know them cold. Now, before you do the next question, you'll see there are nine questions that I'd like you to answer. And I will look to see you in the next class. Keep studying. Welcome back. You know that I've assigned nine questions for you to have finished before coming to this class. So let's start by going over those nine questions. First, in number one, they say in testing the existence assertion for an asset, an auditor ordinarily works from what? Well, we know that if we think in terms of that house, the house of gap, when we're testing for existence, we're going down house. Remember, as long as you're within that house, then the direction will work. When you're going down the house, you're vouching. You're testing for existence, looking for overstatement, generally speaking. When you're going up the house, you're tracing, and you're testing for completeness. So as long as you're within the confines of that house, that direction will work. And since we're testing for existence, the answer, of course, is C. We're vouching. We want to go from C, the accounting records, down the house, you know, starting with the accounting records, you know, on the roof, all the way down the house, into the, you know, down towards the cellar, back to the supporting documentation and the original authorization, testing for existence. Answer C. Number two, in determining whether transactions have been recorded, now we're testing for completeness, aren't we? So they're asking if we're testing for completeness, whether transactions have been recorded, is whether anything's been omitted. We're tracing, we're going up the house. The direction of the audit testing should be from what? From the bottom of the house, from answer C again, the original source document. We start from the original source documents. We find all the documentation for sale liability. Why isn't it in the record? We trace it to the record. Make, make, we trace it to the financial statement. Make sure it's being reported. Make sure that nothing's been omitted. Testing for completeness. Number three, an auditor selects a sample from the file of shipping documents to determine whether invoices were prepared. This test is performed to satisfy the audit objective of what? Well, if I'm going from the shipping documents, the bill of lading, to the invoices, if I'm going to the vendor's invoices, am I going down the house or am I going up the house? I'm going up, right? I'm going from the bill of lading, the shipping documents, up the house to the billing department that prepares the invoice. If I'm going up the house, I'm tracing, I'm testing for completeness. And the answer is B. Number four, an auditor selected items for test counts while observing a client's physical inventory. The auditor then traced the test counts to the client's inventory listing. This procedure most likely obtained evidence concerning management's assertion of what? Well, now we're outside the house, right? Remember, now we're not within the within that house of, you know, generally accepted accounting principles. We're not within that house, you know, with the financial statements at the roof all the way back to the original authorization in the cellar. We're not in that house anymore. And once you're outside the house, it's not, don't think of it as really up or down. Here, we're going from, you know, test counts to the records. We're going from the assets, basically from the factory floor to the records, 
Remember, if you're going from the factory floor to the record, you're testing for completeness. And the answer is B. That's tracing. When you, know, you find assets on the factory floor, in this case a test count, and you want to see if they're in the record, you're testing for completeness. Not really up or down, but that's tracing. Now, if you went from the records, if you found assets in the financial statements, and then went to the factory floor to see if you could find them, now that's vouching. You're testing for existence. Hey, I found some assets that are being reported. Go to the factory and say, where are they? Show me the serial number. So it's not really up or down. So just remember, if you go from asset to records, you're tracing, testing for completeness. If you go from the records, right directly to the asset, you're vouching, testing for existence. You have to get used to that. You're outside the confines of the house now. Number five. Which of the following is a substantive test that an auditor most likely would perform to verify the existence and valuation of accounts payable? Well, if we're testing for existence, right away we think of vouching, so we go, let's go to C. The C makes sense, it's vouching. Would we, if we want to test for existence and, and valuation of accounts payable, would we vouch selected entries in accounts payable back to the purchase orders and the receiving reports, yes. That's how you test for existence. You're gonna start with accounts payable and then vouch back to the receiving reports and the actual purchase orders to test for existence and ultimately valuation, whether accounts payable is overstated. And the answer is C. And I wanna mention that this would be true, you know, whether it's, you know, a paper environment, well, you know, with a paper audit trail, or an electronic environment. This information has to be there. You know, when there's the, one of the problems with an electronic environment is that there's no natural audit trail. There's no paper trail. Well, then the documentation has to be built into the system. There still has to be an audit trail. This information, even if it's not in paper form, reading, receiving reports, purchase orders would have to be there. So important to have documentation controls in an electronic environment, in any environment. But in electronic environments, it's, it's essential that it's built into the system because there's not a natural paper audit trail. Number six, which of the following procedures would an auditor most likely perform in searching for unrecorded liabilities? Unrecorded liabilities. Well, if we're looking for unrecorded liabilities, how about A? Would I trace, and of course, your, your initial thought is, well, unrecorded liability, I'm looking for understatements. And generally, when you're looking for understatements, you're tracing, right? When you're vouching, you're looking for overstatements, generally speaking. So you're in the exam and you go, well, I'm gonna search for unrecorded liabilities. So you know, generally, I'm worried that liabilities are understated. You'd wanna trace. So, of course, answer A is right there for you, trace. It says, trace a sample of accounts payable entries recorded just before year end. Now, wait a minute. If these accounts payable entries were recorded just before year end, then it's, how, how, how are you testing for unrecorded liabilities? If you're starting with accounts payable that were recorded just before year end, doesn't make any sense, right? This can't be the answer. Even though you think, well, I'm testing for, I'm looking for an understatement, and liabilities, I'm gonna trace. But that doesn't make sense. Because if I start with accounts payable that were recorded just before year, year end, well then I'm starting with liabilities that have been recorded. I'm looking for unrecorded liabilities. This may strike you as strange, but here we're gonna vouch, and the answer is C. We're gonna vouch a sample of cash disbursements recorded just after year end, back to the receiving reports and the vendor's invoices. Now why, are we, why is it a vouch? Because basically, you're going to vouch back to the supporting documentation. You're looking at disbursements right after, you know, right at the beginning of the year. You know, so right after the close of the year, the beginning of, say, year two, you find some disbursements, vouch back to the receiving reports and the invoices. And what you're trying to find is that these payments right after year end, the payments at the beginning of year two, really, when you look back at the supporting documentation, were for a liability that should have been recorded in year one. So if this makes sense to you, you, know, you vouch, when you're vouching, you're looking for overstatements. Well, year two would be overstated 
year two liabilities really would be overstated because it, the liabilities should have been recorded in year one. Year one liabilities were understated. There were unreported liabilities in year one. They, there wasn't proper cutoff. So it's a little bit convoluted there. Again, you're vouching to find really an overstatement in year two liabilities because the liability belongs in year one. Year one liabilities were understated, which is unreported. And as I say, they didn't have proper cutoff. So it's kind of, they're kind of playing with you there about whether you're looking for overstatements or understatements. He, in this case, we would vouch. Number seven, a weakness in internal controls over recording retirements of equipment may cause an auditor to, well, this is, I think is really going to come down to A or D. Do I want to go from the assets to the records, or do I want to go from the records to the assets? You know, again, we're outside the house now. So in terms of tracing and vouching, can't really think in terms of going up or down here. I want to find out if there's, a, if there's a weakness in recording retirements of equipment. So should I go from the assets to the records, or should I go from the records to the assets? A, notice, is going from the assets to the records. A says, if I inspect certain items of equipment in the plant and then trace them back to the accounting records, will that do it? No, because if I start with the equipment in the plant, obviously the equipment hasn't been retired. Remember, I'm afraid that equipment's been retired, but it hasn't been reported. There's a weakness in reporting retirements. So I'm afraid that there's equipment that's been retired and the retirement's not reflected in the records. So if I go with A and I start with equipment in the plant, obviously that equipment hasn't been retired. That doesn't make any sense at all. If I go from assets, if I go from assets to records in this case, remember, because that's tracing assets to records. And you're looking for completeness. You're looking for understatements. We're not looking for an understatement here. We're looking for an overstatement. Because if there's a weakness in retiring uh, equipment, recording retirements, that means equipment is overstated. We're looking for an overstatement, so we want to vouch. And the answer is D. If I select certain items of equipment from the accounting records and try to find them in the plant. And if I can't find them in the plant, it's because they were retired. And the retirement wasn't recorded. There was a weakness in reporting retirements. So equipment is overstated. Does that make sense to you? I want to go from the assets. I, excuse me, I want to go from the records now to find the assets. I'm vouching. I find this equipment in the records, go to the plant. I can't find it but because it's been retired and the retirement wasn't recorded. So equipment is overstated. I'm vouching. And the answer is D. Number eight, the purpose of tracing a sample of inventory tags to a client's computerized listing of inventory. Notice we're going from assets to records. So we're tracing, right? We're going from assets. We're not in the confines of the house now. We're, we're outside the, the confines. Can't think in terms of up or down. We're going from assets to records. And what is the purpose of that? To determine whether the inventory items, answer A, represented by the tags, were included in the listing. We're testing for completeness. We're tracing. That's why we're doing this, to determine whether the inventory items, answer A, represented by the tags, are on the listing. We're testing for completeness. We're tracing. Number nine, Cooper CPA performs a test to determine whether all merchandise for which the client was billed was received. The population for this test consists of what? Where do you begin? Wh what is the population you'd start with? If you want to test to see whether all merchandise for which the client was billed was actually received, the population you'd start with is answer B, everything they were billed for. You'd start with all the invoices. You'd start with all the invoices, and then you would vouch back to the receiving report. Right? You're, you're, you're looking for overstatements here. You're looking for an overstatement in accounts payable. So you're vouching. You, now, now you're within the confines of the house. You're going down the house. So you'd want to vouch, starting with, with the invoices, back to the receiving report to see that merchandise was actually received when they've been billed. 
Now, you know that all this audit evidence that we're gathering is documented in the work papers. And the work papers, of course, are essential. The work papers support the audit report. The work papers show that the auditor adhered to generally accepted auditing standards. And the work papers also aid in the conduct of the audit. And basically, the work papers are comprised of the permanent file and the current file. The permanent file contains items of continuing audit significance. You know, the permanent file is that file you lug to the client year in, year out. And as I say, it contains items of continuing audit significance. The articles of incorporation, you know, chart of accounts, internal control questionnaires, flow charts, items of continuing audit significance. That's the permanent file. You lug it to the client year in, year out. And then there's the current file, which contains items of current audit significance. You know, a working trial balance, account receivable confirmations, a letter of audit inquiry to the client's attorney, you know, lead schedule for something like cash supported by 18 bank accounts, items of current audit significance. Now, don't forget that the CPA, the auditor, owns the work papers. The CPA owns the work papers. However, the work papers do contain confidential client information. So the CPA needs the client's permission to disclose the information to a third party. Remember that. Even though the CPA does technically own the work papers, it is confidential client information. So the CPA would need the client's permission to disclose the information to a third party. Now, there are some exceptions. They don't need the client's permission if it's in response to a subpoena, it's part of a professional practice review. But basically, the client needs, the CPA needs the client's permission to disclose the information to a third party. It's confidential client information. And there's some rules we need to talk about. If your client is an issuer, you know, Sarbanes-Oxley, let's not forget that, SOX. Sarbanes-Oxley requires that if you are, your client is an issuer, the CPA has to retain the work papers and all supporting documentation that supports the audit report for at least seven years. At least seven years or there are criminal penalties very significant. And if your client is a non-issuer, you must retain audit documentation for at least five years. And, you know, basically what you're retaining, what the auditor is required to retain is work papers sufficient for another veteran auditor to understand the work that was performed. And in terms of requirements, absolute requirements, the auditor is required to document the work papers, all their audit procedures, you know, the, the nature, the extent, the timing of all their audit procedures, the results of all the audit procedures, and the conclusions that the auditor reached regarding that evidence. That's what's required. I mean, it's very common sense. The auditor has to document the nature, the extent, the timing of all their audit procedures and the results and the conclusions that were reached. The auditor has to document a reconciliation of the client's accounting records to the financial statements. A couple more rules. When do you have to complete the audit work papers? There's some rules here. When does the auditor have to complete the work papers? Well, if your client is a non-issuer, you have to complete the work papers no more than 60 days from the audit report re release date. No more than 60 days from the audit report release date. If your client is an issuer, you must complete the work papers no more than 45 days from the audit report release date. And the public, the public Company Accounting Oversight Board standards, the Oversight Board standards also have another requirement, that if there are any changes to the audit documentation after it's been completed, very significant, Oversight Board standards say, hey, any changes to audit documentation after, after the work papers have been completed must be fully documented and you also must keep the original documentation as well. Now before you start the next class, I do want you to answer three questions on work papers and make sure you get those answered before you go to the next class and I'll see you then. Welcome back.
you know that I assigned three questions that I wanted you to answer before coming to this class. So let's start with those three questions. Okay, number one, they say, which of the following statements is most accurate regarding sufficient and appropriate documentation? D says, audit documentation is the property of the client. We know that's not true. The work papers are the property of the auditor, the CPA, to start with. So that knocks out D. C says, if additional evidence is required to document significant findings or issues, the original evidence is not considered sufficient and appropriate and therefore should be deleted from the work papers. Of course not. All that would be retained. A says accounting estimates are not considered sufficient and appropriate documentation. That's not true. What the auditor would have to document is the basis for those estimates. Now the answer is B. B says sufficient and appropriate documentation should include evidence that the work papers have been reviewed. As you know, there's a, there's a review of work done at every level. Staff members' work is reviewed by supervisors. Supervisors' work is reviewed by managers. Managers' work is reviewed by partners. And all of that is part of sufficient and appropriate documentation. Number two, which of the following factors most likely would affect an auditor's judgment about the quantity, type, and content of the work papers? A says the assessed level of control risk. Well, that's it, isn't it? If control risk is high, that means there's a high probability that the internal control structure is not working well. And if control risk is high, the auditor is going to have to gather much more evidence to be persuaded, much more. That's going to affect certainly the quantity of evidence that's gathered and also type because now the auditor is going to need more outside corroboration and, of course, the content as well. So you don't have to go beyond A. Number three, which of the following factors would least likely affect the quantity and the content of the work papers? A says the condition of the client's records. No, that would affect the quantity and the type and the content, wouldn't it? If the records are a shambles, you know, you're going to need a lot more evidence. You're going to need more outside corroboration. B says the assessed level of material misstatement. Well, if the assessed level of material misstatement is high, you're going to have to gather a lot more evidence. And again, more outside corroboration. It's going to affect the quantity, the type, and the content. C says the nature of the auditor's report. No, that, that's not the answer. That would affect the quantity and the type and the content of the evidence because you're certainly going to gather a lot more evidence if it's a qualified opinion or an adverse opinion as opposed to an unmodified opinion. No, the answer is B. The content of the management representation letter is very unlikely to affect the quantity, the type, or the content of the work papers. It really doesn't have any bearing on it at all. Now, we know that we are gathering all this evidence and documenting all this evidence to determine if there are any material misstatements, any errors and frauds in management assertions. And our audit procedures are going to include test of controls, of course, observation, inquiry, inspection. We reperform some procedures and some substantive tests. And I want to give you a memory tool so you will easily remember all the substantive tests of detail that we might perform. Just remember the words Corvair, C-O-R-V-A-I-R, -I Corvair. And it will just give you a handy reference point to remember the substantive tests that are used. Let's go through what it means. The C in Corvair is confirmation by confirming accounts receivable. The O in Corvair is observation and inquiry. Now, you may say, well, how can observation, which is, of course, one of the tests of controls, how can observation be used as a substantive test? Well, we could observe the taking of the ending inventory, for example. How about inquiry? How could inquiry be used as a substantive test? We could inquire about the company's policy on determining obsolete inventory. So observation, inquiry can be used as a substantive test. R is rephrasing. 
You know what B is, about. A is analytical procedures. I is inspect or examine. And R is recompute or reconcile. Remember Corvair, you have a, a quick list of the substantive tests that are used to check out management assertions. And you know the way you remember management assertions is code. So you're using Corvair, which is sort of an old plastic junk of a car, to check out the code. And one more thing. Let's talk about subsequent events. You know what subsequent events are. Subsequent, uh, subsequent event is an event that occurs after the balance due date, after the balance due date, but before the company issues their statement, right? That's a subsequent event. It's an event that occurs after the balance due date, usually December 31, but before our client issues the statement. And it's also important to know how you would search for subsequent events. And the way you'd search for subsequent events, just remember, you're looking for a miracle. M-I-R-A-C-L. You're looking for a miracle. M is the management representation letter. You're going to have, you're going to be sure to have the management representation letter address whether or not there have been any subsequent events. And, of course, I is inquire. Inquire of management whether there have been any subsequent events. The R is read minutes of meeting. Read minutes of meeting. That's very informative. You could read also interim statement. You know, the next interim statement. But read minutes of meeting. The A, asset or liability valuation changes at the beginning of the year. You want to look at any asset or liability valuation changes from the end of the year under audit to the beginning of the following year. That would be an indication. The C in miracle is cut off. You want to make sure that you test assets, liabilities, revenues, expenses for proper cutoff. And L is the legal letter. In the letter of audit inquiry to the attorney, you would inquire about any subsequent events. So you want to put, you want to make sure that that's part of your arsenal as well. So you know Corvair, you know the subsequent tests that are used, and you know Miracle, how to search for subsequent events. And what I'm getting to is that once you know Corvair, and once you know Miracle, and you know Management Assertion, Code, now you're able in any multiple choice or a simulation to determine, you know, what audit procedures sound appropriate, what audit procedures would be appropriate for any given assertion, because that's the position the exam very often puts you in. You're in a multiple choice, and they're asking you, you know, what, what audit procedures would be appropriate. Or in a, in a simulation, you may be asked to determine what audit procedures would be appropriate. So, you know, just to give you an example, if we had to decide what audit procedures were appropriate for the management assertion of inventory, just as an example, and you're in the exam, let's say it's a simulation, and we have to decide what audit procedures would be appropriate. Well, you could, in your scrap paper, just write down management assertion, code, and then just start thinking about the way you would test each assertion for completeness in code, for completeness. If it's inventory, couldn't you trace from test count, you could trace from test count for inventory to the inventory listing, you know, testing for completeness. Right, going from test count from the auditor to inventory list, see if there, see if it's listed, see if it's correct. Testing for completeness. You could, how about cutoff? You could inspect or examine a sample of inventory transactions before and after year end to determine proper cutoff. Classification and understandability. You could. Examine all disclosures related to inventory to make sure that they're understandable. Ownership rights, obligations. You could confirm any consigned goods that are held by third parties. 
you know, confirm the, the balance of consigned goods, consigned goods held by third parties. Remember, those goods still belong to your client. They have ownership rights to, to that merchandise. For valuation, you could inquire about management's policy regarding obsolete inventory. You could recompute, lower of cost of margin. You could do an analytical procedure. You could analyze the change in inventory turnover. If inventory, inventory turnover has gone down, it might indicate there is more obsolete inventory. For existence, now you want to vote from the records to the assets. You, would have, you want to vote from the inventory listing to the inventory tab, checking for existence. Going from the inventory listing to the inventory tab, checking for existence. You could observe the taking of the ending inventory, observe the beginning and the ending inventory. I'm not, I'm not trying to list every possible audit procedure. All I'm saying is that anytime you're in that exam and you're put in a position where you have to decide what audit procedures can be used, well, start with code. You know management's assertion, and then think about, in terms of Corbair, what substantive test would be appropriate in that circumstance, appropriate for that assertion. And you should be able to answer anything they come up with. And then don't forget subsequent events. It's always, always relevant to search for subsequent events regarding inventory. You know, one more time, you're looking for a miracle. So you'd want, it's appropriate to have the management representation letter address whether there were any subsequent events that affected inventory. Inquire of management whether there were any subsequent events that relate to inventory. You'd want to read minutes of meetings. Look at any changes in asset or liability valuation from the end of the year to the beginning of the following year. Test for proper cutoff. Send out a legal letter asking the client's attorney whether there have been any subsequent, ev subsequent events related to inventory. And let me just also mention that, you know, if it's something like, you know, equipment or fixed assets, not only is it appropriate to apply management assertions in terms of fixed assets, also it's appropriate to think of anything related to fixed assets, like accumulated depreciation. So, you know, exp expand your thinking a little bit. If we're, talking, if we're talking about fixed assets, then accumulated depreciation is also relevant. You'd want to apply management assertions to both, and Corvair to both, Miracle to both. If it's accounts receivable, what's related to it? Allowance for bad debt. You know, all of that is appropriate. But if you have Corvair and you have Miracle and you know management's assertion, you should always be in a position to decide you know, whether audit procedures are appropriate. You know, let's think about you know, cash receipts. If we had to think about audit procedures that we would use for cash receipts, well, again, we'd write down code. How about completeness? Well, we want to trace, right? W wouldn't we trace a sample of cash receipts from the remittance listing to the deposit summary to deposit slip to the cash receipts journal? You know, testing for completeness. Cutoff. Examine a sample of cash receipts transactions before and after year end to determine proper cutoff. You know, classification, understandability. You want to examine any disclosures that are related to cash, to the cash balance. Ownership rights, obligations. You'd want to inquire of management if there are any restrictions on cash. Valuation. You'd want to reconcile the bank cutoff statement. Bank cutoff statement is, is sent from the bank to the CPA about 30 days after year end. So you'd want to reconcile the bank cutoff statement. Existence. Well, of course, you want to vouch. Why wouldn't you vouch a sample of cash receipts from the cash receipts journal back to the deposit slip, back to the deposit summary, all the way back to the remittance listing? Again, I'm not trying to list every possibility. I'm just saying it's a way of thinking. If I'm, if I'm put in that position in the exam where I've got to think about what audit procedures would be appropriate, I've got Corvair. 
I know man is used to serve him. And then I'm, I can always look for a miracle. That's always relevant. You know, were there any subsequent events that affected Ted? You know, so you have the man's representation letter address that. You inquire of man. You read minutes of meetings. You look at any change in an asset or liability valuation from the end of the year to the beginning of the following year. You test for cutoff. You send out a legal letter. Always important. Now, regarding tax, I want to go over a couple of terms that you might see in the exam that affect tax. First term I want to go over is kiting. Here's what kiting is about. What a client can do at year end is write a check from bank account number one and deposit it in bank account number two. So we have a client, we have a client at year end, they write a check from bank account number one and they, they don't report it, they don't report it in the check register. It's not reported. The disbursement's not reported. And they deposit it in bank account number two. And of course what they're hoping is that in the year end bank statement, the you know the, the cash is going to show up in both places. That on, on the book, on the book, it'll show up in both places. Because they didn't report the disbursement, the disbursement in the cash disbursement journal from bank account number one, but they do record the receipt and the deposit in bank account number two. They just hope it shows up in both places. That's kiting. And the way to find kiting is for the CPA, for the auditor, to do a bank transfer schedule. That's the way you find it. You do a bank transfer schedule, and for every transfer in, there should be a transfer out. And what you're basically looking for when you do the bank transfer schedule is when you see a transfer in, you see a deposit, you're looking for a deposit that is dated earlier than when you find the transfer out, the disbursement. That'll tell you there's been kiting. Anytime you find a deposit, the deposit in you know, bank account number two, for example, you find the deposit and it's dated earlier than when you find the disbursement in bank account number one. How could that be? That would tell you that there's kiting. And of course, kiting could not happen if you have proper separation of duties. You want to separate the person who handles cash from the record keeping, and you have the internal audit function do the bank reconciliation. Another term you might see is lapping. Here's how lapping works. Let's say customer number one pays their bill, and I steal the money. Customer number two pays their bill. I steal their money. Then customer number three pays their bill, and I use the money from customer number three, and I post it to customer number one's account. That's lapping. Customer number, number one pays their bill, and I steal it. Customer number two pays their bill, I steal it. Then when customer number three pays their bill, I take the cash from customer number three, and I post it to customer one's account. So there's a delay. That's how you know there's lapping. When there's a delay between when the cash was seized and when it was posted to the customer's account. Now, one way you can find lapping is send out accounts receivable confirmation on an interim date because customers are going to scream. You know, I paid this bill. Why hasn't it been posted to my account? So if you send out an account receivable confirmation on an interim date, that should find lapping. Another thing you might see mentioned in the exam is a lockbox. That's a pretty good system. With a lockbox, customers send their payments directly to the bank. And of course, lapping can be stopped with a proper separation of duties. If there's proper segregation of duties, it's going to be very difficult to do lapping without uh, some sort of scheme where employees collude. You have proper separation of duties. There shouldn't be lapping. Uh, let's look at a couple of questions. If you look at question number four, question number four and five are on the same information. It says the information below was taken from the bank transfer schedule prepared during the audit of Fox Company's financial statements for the year ended December 31, year one. Assume all checks are dated and issued on December 30th, year one. And the first question, they want to know which of the following checks would indicate kiting. What would be kiting here? Well, look at 
look at check number 202. 202, notice the disbursement date on the books is January 3rd. But on the receiving side, on the books is December 30th. You see what I mean about how can the receipt, how can the transfer in be before the transfer out? That indicates type. That's a bank, that, that's a bank transfer schedule. So as an auditor, you're looking at that and saying, well, how can the transfer in on the receiving side be before the transfer out on the disbursement side? That would indicate typing. Look at check 404. On the disbursement side, it was on January 2nd for books. And on the receiving side, notice it's on the bank statement December 31. Now here again, how can you have the transfer in, the deposit, December 31 for a bank, before the disbursement? That's what indicates kiting, and the answer is B. Check 202 and 404 are kiting. Now, in question 5, they say which of the following checks would be a deposit in transit? Well, now it's 101 and 303. If you look at 101, the, the disbursement was on December 30th, and that's on the disbursement side. And on the receiving side, it's on the books December 30th. But it doesn't show up on the bank statement on the receiving side until January 3rd. And it doesn't clear the disbursement bank until January 4th. So at year end, it's, that's a, that is a deposit in transit. On the receiving side, that's deposit in transit. The deposit was written on December 30th. On the disbursement side, on the receiving side, it's on the books December 30th. But it doesn't clear that bank until January 3rd. So for the receiving side, that would be a deposit in transit. And same thing with 303. The disbursement was on December 31. Notice it doesn't show up on the receiving side for a bank until January the following year. So for the receiving side, that's a deposit in transit. Keep studying. Don't fall behind. And I'll look to see you in the next class. Welcome back. In this class, we're going to talk about governmental auditing. And the first thing I want to say about governmental auditing is that auditing is auditing. Whether you're auditing a profit-making company or a government program or activity, auditing is auditing. And don't forget that U.S. generally accepted auditing standards apply to all audits. So it makes perfect sense that generally accepted government auditing standards, that's generally accepted government auditing standards, usually called the yellow book, includes all U.S. generally accepted auditing standards. So the yellow book gives us the standards for audits of governmental organizations, programs, activities, functions, and also the yellow book applies to government assistance received by contractors and also nonprofits. Now, as I say, the yellow book includes all of the U.S. generally accepted auditing standards, but the yellow book does have different points of emphasis and a few different requirements. For example, the audit requirements for federal financial assistance includes expanded internal control documentation and testing. It includes expanded reporting requirements, including a formal written report on the consideration of internal control and the assessment of control risk. Also expanded reporting on whether the federal financial assistance was administered according to applicable laws and regulations. So while the Yellow Book does include all of U.S. generally accepted auditing standards, as I say, it has different points of emphasis, different requirements. Let's talk about the different types of audits that can be done in governmental auditing. First, you might see a financial statement audit. A financial statement audit is performed according to the Yellow Book, and its purpose is to determine whether the financial statements are presented fairly in accordance with U.S. GAAP or maybe even an OCBOA. 
The audit also includes a report on internal controls and compliance with laws and regulations and contractual requirements and grant requirements. You know, it's important to say this, that the Yellow Book requires a written report on the auditor's understanding of internal control and the assessment of control risk on all audits. Let me say that again. That's important. The Yellow Book requires a written report on the auditor's understanding of internal control and the auditor's assessment of control risk on all audits. You know, whereas in U.S. gas, there's only a written report if significant deficiencies are found in internal control. So, of course, the auditor is required to obtain an understanding of the design of internal control and to determine whether the controls have been implemented. And the auditor has to communicate to, ma to the management, those in charge of governance, all significant deficiencies noted during the audit, even if they're not material weaknesses. And significant deficiencies are also reported to the appropriate legislative and regulatory bodies. In the Yellow Book, there's also additional attention given to fraud and what is called abuse. Abuse is a misuse of authority for gain. Now, the auditor is not required to you know, search for abuse, but if abuse is detected, it requires further testing. The point is that non-compliance with laws and regulations, contractual requirements, grant requirements, or abuse that has a material effect on the financial statements must be reported to management and those in charge of governance. And of course, any written response by the organization is included in the audit report. The auditor is required to report all illegal acts, you know, all illegal acts or possible illegal acts to a top official of the entity and also any oversight body or legislative or regulatory body. The auditor is required to report fraud and illegal acts to the federal inspector general if management fails to disclose the fraud and illegal acts or take remedial action. Now, of course, a management representation letter is required at the end of every audit, and the management representation letter is going to state that there have been no violations or possible violations of laws or regulations that should be disclosed in the financial statements. That the management representation letter is going to state that management is responsible for complying with all laws and regulations. And the management representation letter is going to state that management has disclosed to the auditor all laws and regulations that have a direct material effect on the financial statements. Let me say a word about compliance audits. A compliance audit is usually done in conjunction with a financial statement audit. And the Yellow Book requires that the auditor design the audit to provide reasonable assurance of detecting material misstatements that result from non-compliance with laws and regulations. The auditor's opinion on compliance is at the program level. And you know if you do a financial statement audit, if you do an audit of a profit-making company, what we're always thinking of as an auditor is the risk of material misstatement. We know the risk of material misstatement is made up of two other risks. It's made up of the inherent risk for the particular account and control risk, right? In risk of material misstatement is made up of inherent risk and control risk. Well, it's very similar with a compliance audit. The risk of non-compliance. It's just a different way of thinking. The risk of non-compliance is made up of inherent risk and control risk. So if the risk of non-compliance goes up, 
if inherent risk and control risk is higher, then the auditor has to set the detection risk lower to control the overall audit risk of noncompliance. And in the required management representation letter in a compliance audit, management's going to state that management has disclosed all instances of noncompliance or that there were no instances of noncompliance. Let's talk about the required documentation. You are required to document in the work papers the assessment of the risk of noncompliance, the procedures that were performed to test the controls and the results, and the basis for materiality levels. Now, also, in governmental auditing, there are attestation engagements, examinations, reviews, agreed upon procedures. And these are performed according to the Yellow Book, and the Yellow Book incorporates the statements on standards for attesta attestation engagements. It's all incorporated in the Yellow Book. And if we're talking about an examination, there are expanded requirements on reporting on the effectiveness of internal control and identifying any deficiencies in internal control. Also reporting on compliance with laws and regulations and contracts requirements and grant requirements. And then finally there are performance audits. Performance audits, the purpose of a performance audit is to provide you know, findings or conclusions based on evaluating sufficient, appro sufficient appropriate evidence against a particular criteria. The objective of a performance audit is to assist management and those in charge of governance with, imp with improving the program's performance and operation to achieve the organization's goals effectively and efficiently. Let me say a few words about the Single Audit Act. The Single Audit Act requires an audit be performed in accordance with the Act for entities that expend federal funds, federal assistance, during any fiscal year equal to or greater than $750,000. Say it again. The Single Audit Act requires an audit be performed in accordance with the Act for entities that expend federal funds during the fiscal year, you know, federal assistance during the fiscal year, equal to or greater than 750000 Now, there are two primary objectives of the Single Audit Act. First, to audit the entity's financial statements and report on a separate schedule the expenditures of federal funds in relation to the financial statements. And number two, it's also a compliance audit of federal funds expended during the fiscal year for each program. The Single Audit Act requires additional audit procedures for specific programs, including a separate evaluation of materiality for each program. You know, materiality is determined for each program, and it's using a risk-based approach. The way you determine a major program is by looking at inherent risk and control risk and detection risk. That's to help you determine a major program. Now, what's required in the Single Audit Act is that the auditor must express an opinion or a disclaimer of opinion on the financial statements and the, the separate schedule of expenditure of federal funds. If there's noncompliance with with the requirements of the federal financial assistance, if there is noncompliance, well, if it's material, it's qualified opinion. If it's very material, it's adverse. Also, of course, the auditor is required to report on 
a major program's internal control and their compliance with laws and regulations. Now, to finish your preparation on governmental auditing, make sure you do all the multiple choice in this area, and I think you'll be ready for this area for the exam. I look to see you in the next class. Welcome back. In this class, we're going to begin our discussion on statistical sampling and how statistical sampling relates to auditing. We know that auditing is all about risk. We've talked about this many times in the course, that risk is unavoidable in auditing because we don't examine 100% of the documentary evidence that supports the financial statements. We always take a risk in auditing. And we've identified very particular types of risks that we take as an auditor. We know that there's control risk, the risk that internal controls are not functioning well. There's inherent risk, the risk that a given account by its very nature could be misstated. There's detection risk, the risk that an auditor will fail to detect material misstatements that do in fact exist. And of course, the ultimate risk is audit risk, the risk that the financial statements are materially misstated, they're misleading, but the auditor misses it all somehow and gives an unmodified opinion. That's the ultimate risk that we take, audit risk. All right, so let's get to the point. Why do we use statistical sampling in auditing? Because statistical sampling allows an auditor to quantify risk, to measure in mathematical terms the amount of risk that the auditor is taking. Now, generally speaking, there are two types of statistical samples. There are attribute samples and there's variable samples. There's attribute sampling, there's variable sampling. When you're attribute sampling, you're testing a population for a certain characteristic, a certain attribute. You know, how many accounts receivable have never filed a credit application? How many accounts receivable have that attribute, that characteristic? And generally, we use attribute sampling to test controls, you know, test compliance. And then there's variable sampling. When you take a variable sample, you're estimating the dollar value of a population. And how does that value you know, differ from what's stated in the financial statements? So generally, we use variable sampling for substantive testing of details. Now, I want to start with some basic concepts. In fact, three basic concepts. The first step in any sampling plan is to define the population. So let's think about this for a minute. How many populations that you could sample would you find in a typical set of financial statements? Well, there's the population of accounts receivable. There's the population of accounts receivable more than $700. There's the population of accounts receivable between Four and eight hundred dollars, more than twenty-four days overdue. There's the population of accounts receivable between a dollar and two thousand dollars that are more than ninety days overdue. I think you see my point. The amount of populations that you could sample in a typical set of financial statements is almost infinite. So that's my point. It's up to the auditor to define in precise terms the population that's going to be sampled. That takes auditor judgment, and it may surprise you, but there's a lot of auditor's judgment being used in a sampling plan. So from the, the very beginning, judgment is used because it's up to the auditor's judgment to define the population. Now, once you define the population, listen carefully, once you define that population, here's our first major concept. You always assume that that population 
have the pro has the properties of the normal curve. I'll say that again. Once you define that population, we always assume that that population has the properties of the normal curve. Now, am I saying that all the items in the population, if you plotted them on a graph, would form a normal curve? No, I'm not saying that. Listen carefully. What I'm saying is the means, the arithmetic means of all the samples you could draw from that population, if you were to plot them on a graph, would form a perfect normal curve. It's called the central limit theorem. It's a huge key to sampling, that once you define a population, you assume the population has the properties of the normal curve, not that all the items in the population form a no normal curve. No, but the means of all the possible samples you could draw from that population, if you were to plot them on a graph, would form a perfect normal curve. So that's our first major concept, that the auditor has to define the population. And once the population is defined, we assume the population has the properties of the normal curve. And we'll say more about those properties later on. Second major concept, for a sample to be mathematically valid, the sample has to be an unrestricted random sample. Let me say that again. For a sample to be mathematically valid, the sample has to be an unrestricted random sample. So the second concept here is randomness. It's a key concept. What does randomness mean? Well, basically what it means is that every item in the population has an absolutely equal chance to be selected in the sample. Every item in the population has to have an equal chance to be selected in the sample. In other words, this is the one place, this is the one place in a sampling plan where there can't be any judgment at all. There can't be any judgment in deciding what transactions will be sampled. It has to be an unrestricted random sample. In other words, you go to a random number generator on a computer and the random number generator says, go to transaction 619. So you go to transaction 619, find all the supporting documentation for that transaction, and you audit that transaction, whether it looks interesting, whether it looks boring, whether it looks routine, doesn't matter. The random number table said sample transaction 619. Well, you get all the supporting documentation for transaction 619, and you audit it to its final conclusion. How about this? Let's say the random number table said go to transaction 713. And we sit there and we go, you know, I'm at this client every year and I can tell from that transaction code, that's a very old transaction. I'm going to have to go to get the supporting documentation for that transaction. I'm going to have to go to the archives, you know, down in the cellar. It's not computerized records that old. I'll have to go down in the cellar and dig out the paperwork. And I've seen rats down there the size of a toaster oven. I don't think I want to do that. So I'll, I think I'll just substitute another transaction. If you substitute another transaction, that destroys randomness. That destroys randomness because now you've added judgment in what items are going to be selected in the sample. Can't be any judgment. Can't be. Now, if you don't want to go down in the cellar and fight huge rats, well, then call the transaction correct or call it an error. You know, they can't, they can't support the amount, whatever. You've got to make it, it, the random number table said to sample that transaction, you have to sample that transaction. It's an unrestricted random sample. How about this? Could I sit like a file drawer and go, okay, I've got to, I've got to look at some documentation here. I look at some transactions. So I take a dollar bill out of my pocket. The first serial number is nine. So I count nine you know, invoices in. And then I look at every tenth one after that. That's called systematic sampling. It is a form of randomness. But it's a weaker form of randomness. It is a form. But it's a weaker form of randomness because if the population is in any order, you know, for example, if all the large transactions were at the beginning of the file drawer, you could, it's going to distort your results. You know, your, your strongest form of randomness is a random number table says 
go to transaction 1247. You go to transaction 1247, whether it looks interesting, boring, routine, doesn't matter. Get all the supporting documentation for that transaction and audit it to its final conclusion. But for your sample to be mathematically valid, it has to be an unrestricted random sample. So that's our second major concept. First major concept, we assume the population, once it's defined, has the properties of the normal curve. Second, for our sample to be, to be mathematically valid, it has to be an unrestricted random sample. And now, our third major concept, variability. Variability is very important in a sampling plan and in a population. Now, let me illustrate it to you this way. Let's say there was a, just a big barrel of money, a big barrel full of money. And my boss says, Bob, did you count the money in the barrel? All we know about the barrel is there's a million pieces of money. That's, we don't know whether it's nickels, dimes, quarters, $5 bills, $100 bills. We have no idea. We have no idea what's in there. We just know there's a million pieces of money in the barrel. So, Bob, I'd like you to count that money in the barrel. So, I'm given this job, and I think, well, I'm not going to sit here and count a million pieces of money. I'll take an unrestricted random sample of money, and I'll project the value of the money in the barrel. So, let's say, if you're with me on this, if you can buy this, hypothetical. Let's say it's possible to open the top of the barrel, put a blindfold on, and I reach in and take out 100 pieces of money at random. Just allow me that. I can do that. Put a blindfold on. I take out 100 random pieces of money. And when I take out 100 random pieces of money, I pull out 100 nickels. Just nickels. And then I go, I don't know. Maybe the sample wasn't big enough. So I take out another 100 random pieces and another hundred, and another hundred, and another hundred. Finally, I've taken out 500 random pieces of money. And what I've come up with is 500 nickels. In other words, there's no variability. So what I'm going to do in that case is I'm going to say to my boss, with a great deal of confidence, we'll say more about confidence later, but I'm going to say to my boss with a great deal of confidence, I think what's in the barrel is a million nickels. Because I, I, don't, I don't see any variability. I pulled out 500 random pieces of money. I came up with 500 nickels. I think what you have in the barrel is a million nickels. I think the value of the money in the barrel is $50,000. My boss says I'm not satisfied. Of course, they never are. My boss says, all right, Bob, I'll tell you what. Just humor me. Go in and take one more random piece of money. Just one more. And if it's a nickel... I, I'll buy your results. So I put on my blindfold, and I dig into the barrel. I pull out one more random piece of money, and that's a million-dollar bill. Now, I think you see what just happened there. When that million-dollar bill comes out, of course, now there is an enormous amount of variability, right? I mean, how many million-dollar bills are there? Is this the only one? That's possible. Maybe there's only one. We came up with it in the sample. Maybe there's one every 500. And you see what each million dollar bill does to the value of the money in the barrel. It changes everything. Well, what you'd have to do in that case, because there's such a huge amount of variability, you'd have no choice but, I've, I've got to know how many million dollar bills there are. Is there one? Is this the only one? Are there 10 more? The only, the only, thing, you'd have, the only thing you could do in that case is now take samples of thousands of pieces of money, maybe, maybe tens of thousands, to try to see how often a million-dollar bill comes up. All right, here's my point. Variability causes uncertainty. The more variability there is in a population, the more uncertainty there is. And generally speaking, the more variability there is in a population, the larger your samples have to be. This is what variability does to you. Causes your samples to be much greater, much greater. Again, how many million dollar bills are there? I'd have to sample thousands and thousands of pieces of money to try to get an idea how many times a million dollar bill, how often a million dollar bill is going to come up. I want you to remember that standard deviation is the standard measure of variability. And we'll say more about that in our next class. I'll see you in our next class. Welcome back. In this class, we're going to continue our discussion of statistical sampling and how statistical sampling 
relates to auditing. And as you remember, in our last class, we began our discussion with variable sampling. We use variable sampling to estimate the dollar value of a population. We use variable sampling as part of our substantive testing of details. And in this class, I want to go through a simple variable sample and the results. So here's the information. Let's say we have done a variable sample. And we're going to do what is called a mean per unit projection. That's what we're going to, what's what we're going to work on, a mean per unit projection. So we've done a variable sample. And let's say that the population, as we've defined it, has 2,000 transactions. We took an unrestricted random sample of 100 of those transactions. And we audited those 100 transactions. And our audited value, based on our audit, of those 100 transactions, the audited value of the sample, $25,000. I'm going to assume that our standard deviation is $100. Remember, that measures variability. Our standard deviation is $100. The standard error of the mean is $10. And I'm assuming that the auditor has a 10% tolerable misstatement, which I'll get to later. All right, so let's do our mean per unit projection. I'm going to take the audited value of the sample, $25,000. I'm going to divide by the 100 transactions in our random sample. That comes out to $250. That's the arithmetic mean of the sample. That was the audited value of the average transaction in the sample. That's the arithmetic mean of the sample, $250. I'm going to multiply that arithmetic mean, $250, times the 2,000 items in 2,000 transactions in the population, and that comes out to $500,000. That's our best estimate of the value of this population, $500,000. That is what, what is called our point estimate. Now, remember we said in our last class that once we define a population, we assume the population has the properties of normal curve. So let's put down a normal curve, and let's talk about a couple of properties. We put down a normal curve, and we're going to put a line right down the middle. So 50% is to the left of the curve. 50% is to the right of the curve. And we're going to put our point estimate, our best estimate of the value of the population, right in the middle, 500,000. Now, what are the properties of the normal curve? Well, one of the properties of a normal curve is that 50% of the population falls to the left of the curve. In other words, is less than 500,000. 50% of the population is to the right of the curve, right to the right of the point estimate, more than 500,000. That's one of the key properties of a normal curve. 50% of the population falls to the left of the point estimate, less than 500,000. 50% of the population falls to the right of the point estimate, is more than 500,000. Another property of a normal curve, if I go one standard deviation to the left and to the right, of the point estimate, I will encompass 68% of that curve. It's one of the properties of a normal curve. If I go one standard deviation to the left and one standard deviation to the right of the point estimate, I will encompass 68% of that curve. So let's do that. Let's do a calculation. How many standard deviations am I going to go to the left and right of the curve, to the left or the right of the point estimate? One. So I'm going to go one, one standard deviation. That's going to, that's going to cover 68% of the curve. I take that number of standard deviations, 1, times the standard error of the mean, $10. I gave you that. That comes out to $10. Times the number of transactions in the population, 2,000. And that comes out to plus or minus $20,000. Now let's put that on our curve. If I go one standard deviation to the left of the point estimate, that's less than 20,000. So that brings me down to a lower limit of 480,000. If I go one standard deviation to the right of the point estimate, that's plus 20,000. That brings me up to 520,000. Now, here's what I'm saying. We are 68% confident. It is 68% probable that the value of this population is $500,000, plus or minus $20,000. I'm admitting it could be as low as 480,000. It could be as high as 520,000, plus or minus 20,000, give or take 20,000. Another way to express this, 
I'm 68% confident that the value of this population is 500,000 plus or minus 4%. Very often they'll express what is called the precision, your plus minus factor in terms of, of a percent of the point estimate. If you take 4% of 500,000, you get 20,000. I am 68% confident. It is 68% probable. Notice confidence relates to probability. It is 68% probable, therefore I am 68% confident that the value of this population is $500,000, plus or minus 4%, plus or minus 20,000. I'm admitting it could be as low as 480,000, could be as high as 520,000, plus or minus, give or take, 4%. And again, that 4%, that's the, that's the actual precision that you calculated at 68% probability. Now, don't confuse that with the auditor's tolerated misstatement. The auditor's tolerated misstatement is plus or minus 10%. The auditor's tolerated misstatement, that relates to the auditor's judgment about materiality. In other words, we're saying that we're 68% confident that the value of this population is 500,000 plus or minus 4%. Well, if the auditor's tolerated misstatement is plus or minus 10%, if you go to the balance sheet and this item, accounts receivable, whatever it is, is 300,000, there's a problem. Right? The, auditor's, the auditor is willing to say, you know, if, they're within t if I go to the balance sheet and it's within 10%, that's the auditor's tolerated misstatement. As long as I'm within 10%, I don't, I, then it's not a material problem. But uh, as I say, if the auditor goes to the balance sheet and sees this accounts receivable, whatever the population is that we were testing, is 300,000, there's a problem. It's, way, it's, it's off by way more than 10%. Or the auditor looks on the balance sheet and sees that accounts receivable is 800,000. It's way beyond 10%. But don't again, don't confuse the auditor's tolerable misstatement with the actual precision we calculated at 68% confidence, which is plus or minus 4%. Another property of the normal curve, if you go 1.96 standard deviations, almost two, if you go 1.96 standard deviations to the left and the right of the point estimate, you'll encompass 95% of that curve. But let's do that. Let's work, let's work out the actual precision at that level. I'm going to take the number of standard deviations I need for 95% probability, 1.96, times the standard error of the mean, $10. That comes out to 19.60 times the items in the population, 2,000. comes out to plus or minus $39,200. So let's put it on our, on our curve. If I go 1.96 standard deviations to the left of the point estimate, that's minus 39,200 brings me down to 460,800. That's my lower limit. That's the lower limit of that projection. If I go 1.96 standard deviations to the right of the point estimate, that's a plus 39.2. That brings me up to $539,200. That's the upper limit of that projection. So what are we saying? We're saying it is 95% probable. Therefore, I am 95% confident. Remember, confidence relates to probability. It is 98% probable. Therefore, I'm 98% confident that the value of this population is 500,000, plus or minus 39,200, give or take 39,200. I'm admitting I could be off by 39,200, plus or minus 7.8%. Very often, precision is expressed in terms of a percent of the point estimate. You take 7.8% of the 500,000, you get 39,2. But that's what we're saying. We're 95% confident the value of this population is 500,000, plus or minus 7.8%. We're admitting we could be off by up to 7.8%. Now, the auditor's tolerable misstatement is plus or minus 10%. So, you know, you look on the balance sheet and say it's accounts receivable and it's showing at 540000 So, you know, the, the, with the auditor's tolerable misstatement, they, they would, could even allow it up to 550000 a plus 10%. Because that's what the auditor can, would, would consider a material problem. 
So again, auditor's tolerable misstatement relates to materiality, auditor's judgment about materiality. Again, don't confuse that with the actual precision we calculate at a certain level of probability, a certain level of confidence. All right, now let me show you another way to do the same type of projection. We just went through a mean per unit projection, but there are different ways you can get that point estimate. Let me show you a ratio estimation. Here's how you do a ratio estimation. Let's say that the audited value of our sample is $8,000. The book value, in other words, the audited value of the transactions we took in our sample, once we've audited those transactions, $8,000. The book value says $10,000. Take $8,000 over $10,000, the ratio is 80%. So if the book value of the population is $100,000 times our 80%, our point estimate is $80,000. That's our best estimate of the real value of that population, $80,000. That's a ratio estimation. How about a difference estimation? Here's how you do a difference estimation. Again, we'll assume the book value of our sample is 10,000. And we audit a random sample of transactions. Our audited value is 8,000. What's the difference? $2,000. Take that $2,000, divide by the 100 random items in our sample. It's a $20 difference per transaction. Now all you'd have to do is take the 1,000 items in the population times the difference the $20 difference from our estimation, and that comes out to $20,000. So, and it would be a minus $20,000, right? Because the, the audited value of the sample was less than the book value. Audited value, $8,000. Book value of, of those transactions, $10,000, because it was less. This would be a minus $20 per transaction. Take that minus 20 times the 1,000 items in the population, be a minus $20,000. So what's, what's, what is our difference estimation? Well, if the book value of the population is $100,000 minus that $20,000 from our, from our difference estimation, our point estimate would be $80,000. Our best estimate of the value of that population would be $80,000. All I'm saying is when you win the exam, make sure you know the difference between a mean per unit projection, a ratio estimation, or a difference estimation. Let's talk about stratified sampling. When you stratify a population, all you're doing is dividing a population up into smaller populations. That's what it means to stratify, dividing a population into smaller populations. Let me give you an example. Let's say we're, we're going to sample the population of equipment transactions. And our client has 11,200 11, equipment transactions. Now, 11,000 of those transactions are for $500 or less. 200 of those transactions are for $5 million or more. Okay, so that's, that's our situation. We want to sample a population of equipment transactions. Our client has 11,200 equipment transactions. 11,000 of them, $500 or less. 200 of the transactions, $5 million or more. Now, if I define that as just one population, I think you see the problem. If we just define that as one population of equipment transactions, there's a gigantic amount of variability. Sample sizes are going to skyrocket. So here's what I can do. Since it's up to the auditor to define the population, why can't I define equipment transactions as two populations? I have a population of equipment transactions, 500 or less, and I have another population of equipment transactions, $5 million or more. I have two populations. And what, what you'd find is you have two populations with each population has very little variability. You would take a, sm a much smaller sample out of each. So this is why you stratify. You stratify a population to reduce variability, and that results in smaller sample sizes. Now, I want to go back to risk. By the way, when I did statistical sampling, I, I don't know if I ever had a population that I didn't stratify. <laughs> I'm not sure. I mean, it was just, it's such a huge, huge concept to try to reduce variability. You're always looking at a way to, to, to break up those populations to really break, to really get the variability down so you, your sample sizes can be much smaller. I was stratifying all the time. Now, I want to go back to the concept of risk. We know that there are all kinds of risks in auditing. We've talked about control risk and inherent risk and 
we've talked about audit risk. Well, there are risks in sampling as well. What's the basic risk in a sample? The sample could be wrong. I mean, that is possible, right? You're not guaranteed. If you take a random sample, even an unrestricted random sample, there's no guarantee it is per perfectly representative of what's in the population. It is a perfect representative of what, of what is in the population. No guarantee of that. In other words, you could just pick out an odd selection of items. It's possible. The sample could be wrong. That's your basic risk with sampling, that the sample could be wrong. So here's how we break those risks down. There's the alpha risk. The alpha risk with a sample is this, that the financial statements are correct. Okay, here's your alpha risk with sampling. The financial statements are correct. They're fairly stated. But your sample says there's a problem. Remember, the sample's wrong. So what you end up doing is modifying your opinion. That's called the risk of incorrect rejection. You reject the financial statements, and you shouldn't have. They were fine. So that's the alpha risk. Financial statements are fine. Sample says, oh, there's a material problem. You modify your opinion. You give a qualified opinion. That's the risk of incorrect rejection. Now, of course, the beta risk is the opposite. It's the one we're really worried about. In the beta risk, the financial statements are materially misstated, loaded with errors and fraud. Sample says everything's fine. Remember, the sample's wrong. You just get an odd selection of items. Sample says everything is fine, so you give an unmodified opinion. That's called the risk of incorrect acceptance. That's the risk of incorrect acceptance. Got to know these risks. Also make sure you know the effect of the effect of certain items on sample sizes. How about variability? More variability means what? Larger sample sizes. Less variability means less sample sizes. That's a direct relationship. How about tolerable misstatement? The auditor's tolerable misstatement. Well, if the auditor has a smaller tolerable misstatement, you know, plus or minus a half a percent, generally the samples are larger because there's very little room for error. So if the auditor's tolerable misstatement is very small, generally the samples have to be larger. If the auditor's tolerable misstatement is large, plus or minus 15%, generally it's not as tight, you take smaller samples. It's an inverse relationship. In our next class, we'll talk about attribute sampling. I'll see you then. Welcome back to our discussion on statistical sampling. Now, as we've said in our prior classes, we use variable sampling, which we've talked about to this point, when we're trying to estimate the dollar value of a population. Generally, we use variable sampling when we're doing substantive testing of details. Now I want to get into attribute sampling. When you're attribute sampling, you're testing the population for a particular attribute, a particular characteristic. How many accounts receivable have never filled out a credit application? You know, that's something you don't want. In other words, with an attribute sampling plan, you're looking for an error rate. You're looking for errors, trying to determine an error rate. And generally, you use attribute sampling when you're testing controls, testing compliance. So just to show you a, the simple result of an attribute sampling plan, let's say that we're testing the population of accounts receivable for that attribute. How many customers have never filled out a credit application? Let's say in our unrestricted random sample, 7% of the customers never filled out a credit application. Well, that's our point estimate. We're assuming the population has the properties of the normal curve. And since I want to be 95% confident, that's 1.96 standard deviations. So I go 1.96 standard deviations to the left of the point estimate. That brings me down to 3%. 1.96 standard deviations to the right of the point estimate brings me up to 11% because the precision that I calculated was plus or minus 4%. So what we're saying in statistical terms is this. We're 95% confident that the true error rate in the population is 7%. Plus or 
plus or minus 4%. We're admitting it could be as low as 3%, high as 11%. But we're 95% confident it's not more than 11%. That's what we're saying in statistical sampling terms. We're 95% confident, it's 95% probable, that the true error rate in this population is 7%, plus or minus 4%. We're admitting it could, it could be as low as 3%, high as 11%. But we're 95% confident it's not more than 11%. Now let's say the auditor's tolerable error rate. Remember, that relates to the auditor's judgment about materiality. If the auditor's tolerable error rate is 12%, then it's fine because we're 95% confident it's not more than 11 percent and the auditor could tolerate up to a 12 percent error rate in this particular item let's go back to sampling risk we know the basic risk with any sample is that the sample could be wrong you're not guaranteed with a statistical sample with an unrestricted random sample you're not guaranteed to get a perfect represent, representation of what's in the population. You could pick out a weird group of items. Even at 99% confidence, 99% confidence, there's a 1% chance that your sample is just wrong. So let's break down the risks with an attribute sampling plan. With an attribute sample, the alpha risk is that Internal controls are affected. Internal controls are affected. But your sample says there's a major weakness in internal control. Remember, the sample's wrong. The basic risk is the sample's wrong. It leads you in the wrong direction. So with the alpha risk, internal control is affected. But your sample says there's a material weakness. So what do you do? You assess control risk too high. That's the risk of under-reliance. That's called the alpha risk, is the risk of under-reliance. Because you don't rely on internal control, and you should have. And the result is, you do way too much substantive testing. Now, the beta risk is the opposite. With the beta risk, internal control is not affected. It's not. But your sample says everything is fine. So you assess control risk too low. That's the risk of over-reliance. You rely on internal control when you shouldn't, the risk of over-reliance. So the result is you do too little substantive testing. Now, it's always important to know the effect on sample sizes. Let's talk about the effect on sample size from the expected deviation rate, the expected error rate. If the expected error rate is high, you take larger samples. Expected error rate is low, you take smaller samples. That's a direct relationship. If the auditor expects the error rate, you know, the, the auditor is at this client every year, and if the auditor expects the error rate to be high, generally they take larger samples. If they expect the error rate to be low, they take smaller samples. That's a direct relationship. Now, don't confuse that with the tolerable error rate, what the auditor could tolerate. It's auditor's judgment. If the auditor's tolerable error rate is high, Generally, you take smaller samples. It's an inverse relationship. The, if the auditor can tolerate a huge error rate in something, it's probably an insignificant item, immaterial. So you take smaller samples. But if the auditor's tolerable error rate is low, it's very tight, it's probably a very important item, generally you take larger samples. It's an inverse relationship. You might see in the exam that they mentioned discovery sampling. Discovery sampling is a type of attribute sample where you want a predetermined probability of discovering one error. That's a discovery sample, where you have a predetermined probability of discovering one error. This is used for critical items, you know, where you expect the error rate to be very small. You know, how many canceled checks for more than $500,000 will have less than four signatures? Because that's the policy. If it's more than $500,000, you've got to have four approved signatures. So I'm going to take a sample of canceled checks, more than 500,000. How many canceled checks for more than $500,000 are going to have less than four signatures? I mean, you would hope that would be none. That's the policy. So I, I want to see how many have less than four signatures. I expect the error rate to be very, very small, to be close to zero. But with a discovery sample, 
I want a predetermined probability of discovering at least one error. Let's talk about PPS sampling. PPS stands for probability proportionate to size. If you do a PPS sample, probability proportional to size, you're using an attribute sample table for a sample for variables. I know it seems odd, but that's what you're doing with a probability proportional to size, PPS, a PPS sample. You want to use an attribute sampling table for a sample for variables. If you look in your viewer's guide, you'll see a problem, Hill Company. It says Hill has decided to use probability proportional to size, PPS sampling, sometimes called dollar unit sampling, in the audit of a client's accounts receivable balances. Hill plans to use the following table. So you have an attribute sampling table here. First column is number of overstatement misstatements, the risk of incorrect acceptance. We know what that is. And we're given a risk of incorrect acceptance of 1%, 5%, 10%, 15%, and 20%. Additional information. Tolerable misstatement, 48,000, which the auditor could tolerate. Risk of incorrect acceptance, 20%. Again, that's the auditor's judgment, what they could risk for incorrect acceptance, where you know, internal, internal controls are bad, sample says everything is fine. You accept internal control, you assess control risk too low, risk of incorrect acceptance. They'll, the acceptable risk for this auditor is 20%. Number of misstatements allowed, one. The book value of accounts receivable, 480,000, and there's 360 accounts. They want to know what would be the sample size. Well, what you do is start with the risk of incorrect acceptance. Go to the 20% column. They have a risk of incorrect acceptance of 20%. Go to the 20% column. Now, what's your number of allowed misstatements? One. So go, to, go under the number of misstatements, one. And if you look over under the 20% column, you see the number three. That's your reliability factor. Your reliability factor is three. So now we can work out the sample size. If you take the tolerable misstatement, $48,000, remember that's auditor judgment, what they could tolerate for a misstatement, $48,000, divide by that reliability factor, three. It comes out to $16,000. That's your sampling interval. Now it's just a matter of taking the book value of all your accounts receivable, 480000 Divide by that sampling interval, 16,000, and you get a sample size of 30. Answer D. You're using an attribute sampling table to do a sample for variables. Why do they do this? Well, there's some advantages. With a PPS sample, the sample size is not affected by variability. It's not affected. The sample size is not affected by variability, and you know it normally would be. Not with a PPS sample. Also, a big advantage of PPS sampling, you can start the sample before the entire population is available. Sometimes that's very useful, you know, out in practice, where you can start a sample before the entire population is available to you. And also with a PPS sample, the population is automatically stratified. You get automatic stratification because larger dollar value transactions have a higher probability of being selected in the sample. So there are some advantages. To PPS sampling. Keep studying, don't fall behind, and I look to see you in the next class. We're going to shift our focus, and I want to talk about information technology. When information technology is used in an accounting system, it affects the control activities that are used, it affects the risk assessment that your client would use, it affects information and communication, monitoring the system, and of course it affects the environment. It affects every component of crime. Every component of internal control is affected by information technology. And information technology itself creates some internal control problems. Information technology is a wonderful thing, but when information technology is used in an accounting system, 
as part of an internal control structure, it creates some internal control problems. For example, information technology cannot by itself distinguish between reasonable and unreasonable data. You know, if you tell, you know, a physical payroll clerk, a person, to write a payroll check this week to the janitor for $100 million, hopefully a clerk would say, now wait a minute, that doesn't make any sense. What do you mean $100 million for, for the janitor, for anybody? It doesn't make sense. Information technology by itself can't distinguish what's reasonable, what's unreasonable. There, there is a lack of, of, of physical traces. Information technology is processing transactions online in real time without necessarily leaving any physical traces. So there's no natural audit trail. And perhaps the major problem with information technology is there's a high concentration of duties within information technology. Information technology at times is doing functions that if it were handled by a person would be incompatible because there is such a high concentration of duties. So let's talk about the control activities that you would look for if information technology is part of the accounting system. Well, as far as information technology is concerned and control activities within information technology, there are two broad areas. There are general controls and there are application controls. Remember that. It's either going to be general controls or application controls. General controls refer to the system that's built around IT. And perhaps this is obvious, but it should be said, any weakness in general controls will have a pervasive effect on the system. Pervasive. You don't want any weakness in general controls. And again, general controls refer to the system that's built around information technology. First general control is that you'd want to separate information technology from the users of the output. They should be separate. Information technology from the users of the output. Information, the information technology by itself should never initiate, authorize, or approve anything. No, the information technology part of the accounting system should just process activity. Shouldn't be initiating, authorizing, approving anything. It should process transactions. Another important general control. There should be procedures to review, test, approve, and document. Again, procedures. Part of general controls would be to have procedures to review, test, approve, and document two things, systems and changes to systems, programs and changes to programs. That's essential. Documentation controls, so important in IT. Things get out of control very quickly without strong documentation control, again, for monitoring. But there must be procedures to review, test, approve, and document those two things. Systems and changes to systems. Programs and changes to programs. Another general control is to be sure that your client takes advantage of all hardware and system software controls. You know, firewalls, virus protection, anti-hacking software. That's part of general controls. Access controls. You must restrict access to the hardware, to the master files, and to the programs and the documentation. Again, there must be controls to restrict access to the hardware, to the master files, and to the programs and the documentation. And because there is such a high concentration of duties within IT, it is essential that there be a proper separation of duties within IT. The functions that you'd want to separate are COPAL, C-O-P-A-L. Again, because there's such a high concentration of duties within IT, as we said, there the IT department is doing things that in the hands of a single person would be incompatible. So it's essential you have a proper separation of duties within IT. What you want to separate is COPAL. Let's go over it. The C would be the control group. The control group is a group of employees that are responsible for internal control within IT. That's the control group, a group of employees that will be responsible for internal control within IT. O is computer operators. P is computer programmers. 
A would be analysts, systems analysts. And then L is the librarian function. The librarian keeps the master files, the programs, and the documentation. Very important function. Those are the functions you want to keep separate. And then one more very important general control is to safeguard the assets. They have to be smoke detectors, fire detectors, moisture detectors, and a disaster recovery plan, meaning that you have a copy of important master files off-premises. Very important control. Important master files should have a copy off-premises. And you know why? Because the cost of reconstructing you know, a machine-readable file can be very, very expensive. So you want a copy of important master files off-premises. Now, let's talk about application control. Whether it's an inventory application, whether it's an accounts receivable application, whether it's a payroll application, you want controls built into the, that particular application. And it won't surprise you that application controls come down to controls over input, controls during the processing, and controls over output. That's how application controls break down. Controls over input, controls during processing, and controls over output. And it can be very simple controls, record counts, making sure that you know, the number of records that went into the system are fully accounted for on the, on the output. Record counts, control totals, you know, knowing you know, total gross pay, you know, total number of employees, control totals, all, you know, through, all through input, processing, output, hash totals. Hash totals would be a total just to use as a control. You know, you could add up all the employees' social security numbers. It's a hash total. It's, it has no other meaning except as a control. So if you know what all the employees' social security numbers add up to, you know what that, what that adds up to. Now if you were to somehow drop an employee and add an employee, you would catch that. You know, just knowing total employees wouldn't catch that. Record counts wouldn't catch that, but a hash total like total Social Security number would, would catch it. You want to use, you know, check digits, check numbers. Is this a, a valid employee number? Is this a valid part number? Also, you want to use limit and reasonableness checks. As we said, information technology by itself can't distinguish between reasonable and unreasonable input. So why not build into the system li limit and reasonableness checks so that, you know, if the highest paid employee is the president and the president, I don't know, gets $100,000 a week, why would, any why would the payroll system be able to write a check above that amount? You put in that absolute limit and you could do it by em employee number. If the employee number indicates a janitor and the highest paid janitor is, I don't know, $800 a week, you know, why should any janitor with that employee number, you know, starting with a certain prefix. Why should the payroll department be able to write a check beyond that amount? You build in, re because IT can't distinguish between reasonable and unreasonable data, you build it into the system. Now, before we leave the area of information technology, I also want to mention that some clients will use a service organization for something like payroll, you know, as part of their system as part of their internal control. They're using a service organization like ADP or Paychex. And the service organization may have their auditor, the service organization auditor, perform an attest examination. An attest examination reporting on the service organization's controls. And you have to be aware of this because if the exam gets into this, there are two types of reports that you could see from a service organization's auditor in a type 1 report. A, time, a type 1 report would be a report on a description of the service organization's system and the suitability of the design of controls. That's a type 1 report. A report on management's description of the service organization's system and the suitability of the design of controls. All a type 1 report is saying is whether management's description of the system is fairly presented. That's all a type 1 report is telling you, whether management's description of the system is fairly presented. As an auditor, you, you cannot use a type 1 report 
as a basis for reducing your assessed level of control risk. Let me say it again. As an auditor, you cannot use a type 1 report as a basis for reducing your assessed level of control risk. With a type 2 report, if the service organization's auditor gives you a type 2 report, that is a report on management's description of the service organization system and the suitability of the design and operating effectiveness of controls. Notice the difference in the title. In a Type 2 report, it's a report on management's description of the service organization's system and the suitability of the design and operating effectiveness of the controls. The, the Type 2 report is a report on whether the controls are suitably designed to achieve control objectives. You see, it's very different. A Type 2 report is a report on whether the controls are suitably designed to achieve control objectives. So if you're an auditor and a service organization's auditor gives you a Type 2 report and you're the auditor of the client, you as the auditor of the client can use a Type 2 report as a basis to reduce your assessed level of control risk. So as an auditor, if you're given a Type 2 report by the service organization's auditor, you can use a Type 2 report as a basis to reduce your assessed level of control risk. So you want to be aware of that difference between a Type 1 and a Type 2 report. Welcome back. In this class, we're going to discuss professional ethics. And in the area of ethics, the exam primarily tests the AICPA code of professional conduct. And the code applies to all members of the AICPA when they perform any professional service, not just auditing. And one thing to keep in mind, if you depart from the code, and I don't recommend it, but if you depart from the code, the burden of proof is on you to justify the departure. So it's not something I would recommend. But again, basically, the code governs the performance of all professional services. And I want to start with the articles. Article number one is on responsibility, and it basically establishes that when a CPA, when a member provides any service, not just auditing, the CPA has the responsibility to exercise sensitive, professional, and moral judgment. Article number two, public interest, establishes that members have the obligation to serve the public interest, not just the client's interest. Number three, integrity, establishes that when providing any service, a member has to demonstrate a high degree of integrity. What's integrity? Honesty and fair dealing. That's what integrity is, honesty and fair dealing. Article number four, objectivity and independence. What it's saying is when a member, when a CPA provides any service, they have to maintain their objectivity. What does objectivity mean? No conflicts of interest. And if a member is in public practice, they have to be independent of a client if they're going to provide any assurance on financial information. You know that. If a CPA is going to provide any assurance on financial information, the CPA has to be independent. Independent in fact, independent in appearance. I mean, you know our objective in an audit is what? Our objective in an audit is to provide reasonably positive assurance that the financial statements are free of material misstatement. Reasonably positive assurance that the financial statements are free of errors and fraud. Well, we do a review. What's our objective? To provide limited assurance. Limited assurance. We are not aware of any material modifications that should be made for these financial statements to be in accordance with U.S. GAAP. That's called limited assurance. But when we're providing assurance of any kind on financial information, we have to be independent. Independent in fact, independent in appearance. How about a compilation? Well, no. If you're doing a compilation, you're just compiling numbers that have been given to you by management into the form of financial statements and you're not providing any assurance whatsoever on that information so you don't have to be independent to do a compilation article number five is due care when a member provides any service not just auditing any service a member has to exercise due professional care meaning that a cpa always has to be acting as a reasonably prudent, knowledgeable CPA 
would act under, under similar circumstances. That's due professional care, that when you're providing any service, you're always acting as a reasonable, prudent, knowledgeable CPA would act under similar circumstances. Another way to put it, what does due professional care mean? No negligence. No negligence. Article number six, scope and nature of services just establishes that a member has to observe the code when they're defining the scope and the nature of any professional service. Those are your six articles. Now the rules clarify and amplify the articles. Let's start with rule number one, rule 101. You know what it's going to be on, independence. Rule number one, rule 101 is asking this question. When is independence impaired? What would cause independence to be impaired? Well, during the period of a professional engagement, the CPA cannot have any, they cannot have, they can't have any direct financial interest in the client or be committed to acquire any direct financial interest in the client or a material indirect financial interest in the client. If the CPA has any direct, notice any direct financial interest in the client, one share out of 500 million outstanding, it's too many. You can't be committed to acquire or have, or have already acquired a direct financial interest in the client. If you've done that, your independence is gone. Or you can't, the, the CPA cannot have a material indirect financial interest in the client. If they have a, a material indirect financial interest in the client, their independence is gone. Let me ask you this. Can a CPA own shares in a mutual fund and the mutual fund own shares of the client? Would that affect the independence? That's my question. Can a CPA own shares in a mutual fund and the mutual fund own shares of the client? Would that destroy independence? Well, it could. If the shares in that mutual fund are a material part of the CPA's net worth, then it's a material indirect financial interest in the client. Independence is gone. The general rule is this. If a CPA owns 5% or less, 5% or less in a diversified mutual fund that, hold, that owns shares of, of their client, that's not considered a material indirect financial interest. Again, if a CPA owns 5% or less of the shares in a diversified mutual fund that, that owns shares of their client, that's not considered a material indirect financial interest. If a CPA owns more than 5% of the shares in a diversified mutual fund that owns shares of their client, and that's a significant part of the CPA's net worth, then it is a material indirect financial interest and independence is gone. So remember that if a CPA owns more than 5% of the shares in a diversified, in a diversified mutual fund that owns shares of the client, and it's a material part of the net worth of the CPA, independence is gone. If they own, if the CPA owns any shares in a non-diversified, non-diversified mutual fund that's holding shares of the client, independence is gone. It's a, it's a strict rule because it has to be. Independence is the bedrock of the profession. Has to be a very strict rule. During the engagement, the CPA can't be the trustee or executor of an estate that is committed to acquire any direct financial interest or a material indirect financial interest in the client. Independence would be gone. During the period of the professional engagement, the CPA can't have had, can't, can't have a material business investment, jointly held 
business investment with the client, its officers, its principal shareholder. A principal shareholder would own 10% or more of the stock. Or independence is impaired. Again, during the period of engagement, the CPA can't have a material jointly held business investment with a client or its officers or its principal shareholders. Again, that's a material part of the CPA's net worth. Independence is gone. During the period of a professional engagement, the CPA can't have a loan to or from the client, its officers, directors, principal shareholders. Independence would be impaired. If a CPA spouse or spousal equivalent or dependent, whether or not they're related, again, if a CPA spouse or spousal equivalent or dependent, even if, you know, whether or not related, if the spouse or spousal equivalent or dependent violates Rule 101, then it's imputed to the CPA. It's as if the CPA violated Rule 101. Independence is gone. Again, it's a very strict requirement. It has to be because it's the bedrock of the profession, independence. If a CPA's parent, sibling, you know, brother or sister, non-dependent child has a key management position with the client, or a financial interest in the client that's material to the net worth. Independence is gone. You know, you know, maybe you won't give an adverse opinion. Maybe you just maybe you'd hesitate giving an adverse opinion to a client because it means your father's going to lose his job. All of a sudden, all of a sudden you have a rooting interest. All of a sudden, you might pull a punch. You know, what's the difference between a qualified and an adverse opinion, judgment. So maybe, I don't, maybe you'd hesitate to give an adverse opinion if, if it meant that your, your mother would lose a key management position. And of course, the CPA can't serve in any decision-making function for a client. You know, that's the equivalent of management or a policy-making position. The CPA can't be involved with any litigation or a threatened litigation against the client that is material. And, of course, it would be material. If you're down to litigation, it's material. Let's go to Rule 102, integrity and objectivity. Just clarifies that when a CPA provides any service, they maintain their objectivity. Objectivity means what? No conflicts of interest. And demonstrates a high degree of integrity. What's integrity? Honesty and fair dealing. Rule 201 clarifies that when providing any service, the member exercise due professional care. You know what that means. No negligence. You're always acting as a reasonable, prudent, knowledgeable CPA would act under similar circumstances. And by the way, part of due professional care is that all engagements have to be adequately planned and supervised. Staff work is reviewed by supervisors. Supervisors work is reviewed by managers. Managers work is reviewed by partners. There's a critical review of work done at, any, at, at, at all levels. That's a huge part of due professional care. Rule 301, confidential client information, basically says that the CPA cannot disclose confidential client information without the consent of the client. Who owns the work papers? I think you know this. The CPA owns the work papers. The CPA owns the work papers, but the CPA can't disclose confidential client information to any third party without the consent of the client. There are exceptions. The CPA could disclose confidential client information without the consent of the client in response to a subpoena to comply with law or regulations as part of a professional practice review. Rule 302, contingent fees. The CPA cannot charge a fee 
based on results. Well, a qualified opinion is going to cost you this. But if you want an unmodified opinion, that's really going to cost you. Of course not. Can't charge a fee based on results. Even a compilation. You can't, you can't charge a contingent fee for a compilation if there's any reasonable chance that the compilation will be used by third parties. And they're almost, that would almost always be the case, that it would be used by third parties. How about a tax return? No, you, you can't. You can't, you can't charge a contingent fee for an original tax return, an amended tax return, even a claim for a refund. Now, you can charge based on complexity. You can charge more for a complex return than an easy return. That's no problem. You cannot charge a contingent fee for an examination of prospective information. There's a prohibition against contingent fees. Rule 501, acts discreditable. Acts discreditable to the entire profession of accounting. Don't commit an act that's discreditable to the entire profession of accounting. The big one is retention of the client's records. And the other one, which is near and dear to all of our hearts, you cannot solicit or disclose CPA exam questions or answers. These are acts discreditable to the entire profession of accounting. And then finally, Rule 502, advertising and solicitation. A CPA is allowed to advertise as long as it's not false, misleading, or deceptive. Rule 505, I wanted to mention that too. Form of or organization and name basically establishes that you cannot put on your letterhead members AICPA unless all owners. All owners are members of the AICPA. Uh, are consulting services okay? If you perform consulting services, would that impair independence? Consulting services are okay. You're still independent because you're just considered an objective advisor just for the benefit of the client and the work is for internal use only. Now in the next class, there are 12 multiple choice questions. I want you to get done, get your answers to those 12 questions, and then come back and we'll go through them together. I'll see you then. Welcome back. I hope you did these questions. You have your answers to these questions. And now let's go through them together. Number one, on June 1st, year one, a CPA obtained a $100,000 personal loan from a financial institution client for whom the CPA provided compilation services. Now, you know when you do a compilation, you're not required to be independent because you're not providing assurance on financial information. You're just compiling numbers given to you by management into the form of financial statements. So far, no problem. The loan was fully secured, considered material to the CPA's net worth. CPA paid the loan in full December 31, year one, and then on April 3rd, year two, client asked the CPA to audit the financial statements for year two. Is the CPA considered independent with respect to the audit of the client, audit of the client's December 31 year two financial statements? A says yes, they are independent because the loan was fully secured. That's irrelevant. That's irrelevant. You can't have a loan to or from an audit client, whether it's fully secured or not. But notice this loan was paid December 31, year one. It was paid in full. So during the period of the audit engagement, there is no loan to or from the client. B says, yes, the CPA is independent because the CPA was not required to be independent at the time the loan was granted. That's true. Because at the time the loan was granted, it was compilation services where independence was not required. And again, when... The CPA is hired to do audit services. The loan has been paid in full. But bottom line is, you can't have a loan to or from an audit client. That would impair independence. But when this client became an audit client, the loan was paid in full. So no problem. Yes, they're still independent. The answer is B. Number two, the concept of materiality would be least important to an auditor when considering what? 
Well, A says the adequacy of, of a disclosure of a client's illegal act. Well, materiality would matter there, right? Whether it was a theft of $100 million in bearer bonds or a missing postage stamp, it matters, right? Materiality does matter with illegal acts. B says discovery of a weakness in a client's internal control structure. Well, here again, materiality would matter. Is it internal control over bearer bonds or internal control over postage stamps? Materiality would matter. So that's not the answer. They want to know when materiality would be least important. D says the decision whether to use positive or negative confirmations for accounts receivable. Now, I know you remember this issue. A negative confirmation, the customer only responds if they disagree with the account balance. With a positive confirmation, we're asking the customer to respond whether or not they agree. Now, does materiality matter? It does. Because we tend to use negative confirmations when there's a lot of accounts, small dollar values, strong internal control. We tend to use positive confirmations when we have a small number of accounts, large dollar values. Materiality matters. You know, weak, weak internal control. So, again, materiality would matter in answer D. Answer C, the effect of a direct financial interest in a client. Materiality doesn't matter. One share out of 50 billion outstanding is too many. Materiality is irrelevant. And the answer is C. Number three, a CPA is permitted to disclose confidential client information without the consent of the client. One says to another CPA firm, if the information concerns suspected tax return irregularities, of course not. You can't disclose confidential client information without the consent of the client. But an exception would be number two, to a state CPA society quality control review board. That would be an exception. Answer is B. Number four, which of the following fee arrangements generally would not be permitted under the ethical standards of the profession. A says a referral fee paid by a CPA to obtain a client. That's okay. B, a commission for compiling a client's internal use financial statements, internal use only. It's a compilation. Commission would be okay there. A contingent fee for representing a client in tax court, I think they want you to just see that contingent fee and all contingent fees are a problem and jump for D. But representing a client in a tax court, that's okay. In other words, you could charge a fee based on the results because it's the taxing authority that initiated the proceedings. But answer C, a contingent fee for preparing an original tax return, an amended tax return, no, it's not allowed, answer C. Again, complexity is okay. You can charge a different price based on the complexity of, of the return, but not a contingent fee. Now, now, if you really want a refund, I'll charge you this. No. Number five, under the ethical standards of the profession, which of the following positions would be considered a position of significant influence in an audit client? A, a marketing position. C, research and development. D, human resources, now you know it's B, policy making. That would be a position of significant influence. Number six, in which of the following situations would a CPA's independence be considered impaired? One says CPA maintains a checking account that's fully insured by a, a government deposit insurance agency, you know, FDIC at an audit client financial institution. No problem whatsoever. Independence would not be impaired. Number two, a CPA has a direct financial interest in, the, in an audit client. Well, you know that's a problem. Independence is impaired. Three, CPA owns a commercial building, leases it to an audit client, and it's a capital lease. Well, if it's a capital lease, then in substance, this is a loan, and you cannot have a loan to or from an audit client. Independence is impaired. So independence is impaired with answer B. Two and three. Number seven, a CPA who is not in public practice 
is obligated to follow which of the following rules of conduct. Well, if you're not in public practice, you're not worried about independence. You're not worried about contingent fees or commissions. But when you when you're in when, if you're a member, what what it, whether you are in public practice or not, you always exercise integrity and objectivity. Always. So you're still under those requirements. Answer B. Number eight, which of the following statements best describes the ethical standard of the profession pertaining to advertising and solicitation? I'm sure you went right to it. Answer C. A CPA can advertise in any manner as long as it's not false, misleading, or deceptive. Number nine, according to the ethical standards of the profession, which of the following acts is generally prohibited? Well, I, again, I bet you went right to it. Answer B, retaining a client's records after the client has demanded their return. That is an act discreditable to the entire profession of accounting. Number 10. Must a CPA in public practice be independent in fact and appearance when providing the following services? A compilation of personal financial statements? A compilation? You're just compiling. You're not providing any assurance whatsoever on that. No, independence is not required. Preparation of a tax return? No, you don't have to be independent to do a tax return. Compilation of a personal financial forecast? Again, it's a compilation. You're not providing any assurance on that whatsoever. The answer is D. No, straight across the board. No, no, no. Number 11. A violation of the, profes the profession's ethical standards most likely would have occurred when a CPA, A says, issues, a qu an, un uh, issues an unmodified opinion on the year two financial statements when fees for the year zero audit were unpaid. How about A? You're issuing an unmodified opinion on the year two financial statements when fees for the prior year were unpaid. Yeah, that violates the profession. That violates the profession. That, in fact, that violates your independence because now you have a rooting interest. Now you have a rooting interest. Maybe you won't give that adverse opinion because you'll never get paid. Company go out of business. Independence would be destroyed by that. The answer is A. And finally, number 12. Carr CPA is a staff auditor participating in the audit engagement of Fort. Which of the following circumstances impairs Carr's independence? A says during the period of the engagement, Fort gives Carr tickets to a football game worth $25. No problem. B says car owns stock in a corporation that the client's 401k plan also invests in. The fact that the client's 401k plan invests in some stock that you're also holding, doesn't that doesn't impair your independence in any way. It's pretty tenuous. C says car's friend, an employee of another local accounting firm, Prepares the tax return. That wouldn't affect your independence in any way. But answer D, of course, is a problem. Carr's sibling is an internal auditor employed by Ford. That's, you know, if, you're, if your parent, if your sibling has a, a key position with the client, maybe you won't give that adverse opinion because your friend will lose their job. All of a sudden, there's a rooting interest, or at least the appearance of a rooting interest. And you have to be independent in fact and also appearance. I hope you did well on that set. Keep studying. I'll see you in the next class.